call to order the December 8th, 2020 meeting of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Lavanino? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. Ms. Hartman? Here. Chair Hart? Here. At this time, please stand and join the board in pledging allegiance to the flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item of business is the approval of the minutes from the November 17th, 2020 meeting and the December 1st, 2020 special meeting. Is there any discussion on the motion or on the minutes? And is there a motion to approve them? Move approval. Thank you for the second. motion. And second. Um, is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Abstain. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart. Aye. Motion passes four with one abstention. CEO Miyasato, is there a CEO report today? There's no report this morning, Chair. Thank you. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements or changes to our agenda today? Chair Hart and members of the board, I just have two quick announcements this morning. My first announcement is to remind members of the public of how to participate if you're watching our meeting today. You could do so by phone by calling 805-568-2240, state your name, your phone number, and which item you would like to speak on, and we will call you at the appropriate time. And just as a friendly reminder to the public, please make every effort to be available and mute all streaming devices when it is your turn to speak. Again, that phone number is area code 805-568-2240, and that is streaming both in English and Spanish on the top of your screen. Additionally, the second announcement I have this morning is we posted an X agenda request yesterday amending departmental item number one. This is from the county executive office. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding a coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 update. And recommendation B was amended to read B, provide any direction as appropriate, including consideration of a letter to the governor requesting the state allow Santa Barbara, Ventura, and San Luis Obispo counties to exit the regional stay-at-home order as a Central Coast region. And Chair Hart, members of the board, if we can get a motion to approve the X agenda request, as this was a need to take immediate action, this was added to the agenda yesterday on an item that arose after the agenda was posted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Could I get a motion to approve the X agenda item? So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Mr. Adam? Aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. And Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is approval of the administrative agenda. Do any board members request to pull any items on the administrative agenda? Supervisor just, Williams? Just a request to read A3. A3, okay. And um, Madam Clerk, are any, did have any members of the public requested to pull any items on the administrative agenda? Chair Hart and members of the board, we had uh, three requests to speak on administrative item number 10. A10. Okay, so we'll have A3 and A10. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read A3 into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, administrative item number three is from sponsored by Supervisor Williams and Supervisor Hartman. It is to adopt a resolution of accommodation honoring State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson's retirement from the state legislature. Supervisor Williams. Well, because of uh, Hannah Beth's long career of service to our area, I asked to read this out loud. Uh, it's a resolution uh, authored by Supervisor Hartman and myself, and um, uh, it um, does not encapsulate all of the years of service, but it does encapsulate the soul of it. So. Uh, Senator Jackson has dedicated her life to advocating for women, children, and families, and the environment by starting her distinguished career as a prosecutor in the Santa Barbara County District Attorney's Office and subsequently becoming a managing attorney practicing family law in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. And whereas from 1998 to 2004, Senator Jackson represented part of Santa Barbara County and 
in the 35th district and authored more than 60 bills signed into law. And whereas from 2012 to 2020, Senator Jackson represented part of Santa Barbara County in the 19th State Senate District. And during her time in the legislature, Senator Jackson has been known as an advocate for privacy uh, and uh, protecting the environment, advancing legislation to reduce gun violence, supporting access to justice for all Californians, championing equality for women, advocating for commuter rail, improving access to early childhood education, and supporting veterans and veterans treatment courts, among other issues. And Senator Jackson is the author of the California Fair Pay Act, landmark legislation strengthening California's equal pay law, first in the nation legislation requiring more women on corporate boards, and extended job protected maternity and paternity leave for California families. And whereas Senator Jackson championed legislation to help protect the beloved Elwood Butterfly Grove in the city of Goleta, to cap old leaking oil wells off the coast of Summerlin Beach in the first district, to help homeowners affected by wildfire, to improve safety on Highway 154, and secured funding for water security and infrastructure improvements at Kachuma and to open a DMV office in the city of Santa Maria, just to name a few uh, local funding priorities. Whereas Senator Jackson has received Legislator of the Year awards from a wide range of organizations and is the recipient of the prestigious Califor California Women's Lawyers um, Faye Stender Award, given annually to an attorney who serves as a role model for women. An advocate for justice for women, children, and victims of crime for more than three decades, she helped establish the local organizations that became known as Domestic Violence Solutions and the Coalition Against Gun Violence. Whereas it is likely that Senator Jackson's lifelong work of advocating for women's equality and those most overlooked and underserved started because despite being the best player in the neighborhood, she was discriminated against, uh, not allowed to play Little League Baseball because she was a girl. I'm sure those folks are regretting their moves. Senator Jackson has served as a role model to girls and women throughout our county, state, nation, and around the world, and has supported and encouraged countless other women to run for higher office and serve in leadership and executive roles. And whereas this resolution only begins to scratch the surface of her legislative and philanthropic accomplishments, and just as a self-proclaimed recovering attorney could go on and on, keeping us on the edge of our seats, so could this list of accomplishments. So therefore, let it be resolved that the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors recognize State Senator Hannabeth Jackson for her distinguished career in service to the residents of the 19th Senate District upon her retirement from the state legislature. Thank you very much. Are there other comments from board members? Supervisor Hartman. Thank you. Uh, I am one of those women who she encouraged to run for elective office. Um, she's been a bold and tireless advocate for our county, and I would say she's among the most effective state legislators in the entire country. I think she's eager to spend some time with her granddaughter, uh, but I'm also eager to see what the next chapter of her uh, amazing life is, holds for us all. And I worked very closely with Senator Jackson on her help with the state legislature and state funding for our local commuter rail service and saw firsthand how effective and skilled a legislator that she is. Um, taking her, her situation in Sacramento, her position of power, unique position of power, and leveraging that to the benefit of our community was an extraordinary thing to behold. And she is a force to be reckoned with and is married to one of the, the nicest people in our community, Judge George Eskins. So um, that power couple has accomplished a lot in our community. And I see that uh, are there other comments from other board members? I see that Senator Jackson is in Zoom. So one, how wonderful that you are here, um, if, if not in person, virtually. So with that, Senator Jackson, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll let the, the judge know of your kind thoughts. I try to keep him in his place so he doesn't get too big ahead and expect <laughs> and I'm also gonna be home cooking meals. Um, not something I've ever done or, or aspired to, but certainly uh, I want to thank all of you. You know, um, 
it has been a, a true honor and indeed a privilege to be able to serve the people of our uh, county. And I would like to indicate that as the state senator, I represented the entire county of Santa Barbara, as well as the western portion of Ventura. And it's my hope that during my tenure, I um, deserve the trust and the confidence that the people of our community placed in me, having elected me, I think it's now six uh, five or six times to serve in the state legislature on your behalf. And of course, having worked with all of you and uh, uh, certainly having had the opportunity to uh, do the best I could for the great people of this community and uh, to be your representative in Sacramento has truly been uh, an honor uh, that I will carry with me. I hope that I have been able to serve the community well. Um, it, you know, we are in very difficult times. I see Dr. Ansorg on the call, and I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that we have worked on issues affecting us through this pandemic. Uh, it's my hope that we will uh, get through this um, and find ourselves uh, looking at uh, a very bright future with a robust economy for our community, that we are able to uh, and continue to commit to protecting our natural resources and the extraordinary beauty um, from Santa Maria uh, down through Carpinteria. This is really one of the extraordinary places on the planet. And uh, I know that uh, you and the people of this community will continue to fight hard to preserve and protect protect what God has given us, um, and also to provide a quality education for, uh, from infancy to postdoctorates. We have some of the most extraordinary uh, universities and schools of higher education, as well as uh, a commitment to working with our youngest children and making sure they have what they need to be successful, um, assuring quality, equality of opportunity uh, and dignity for all. One of the things that has been so important to me uh, that we treat everybody with uh, kindness and respect, whether we agree with them or disagree with them. We are all part of the same human family, and we will only go forward uh, if we do so together. So um, it's really been an honor and a privilege, and I thank you for this uh, for this nice honor. If you can see behind me, uh, I have tried to place a number of different uh, plaques and, and nice gestures of appreciation on my wall, there is no space left, but I will definitely do my best uh, to find a place to uh, uh, place your appreciation. Um, it has been an honor and a privilege, and I can only wish you all the best of luck going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Jackson, and we look forward to the next chapter in your long and successful public service career, whatever that may be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, are there any public comments on that item? No. Chair Hart and members of the board, we had no request to speak from the public on A3. All right, well then let's get a motion to make the resolution official. So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. That brings us to item A10. Madam Clerk, would you please read that item into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, administrative item number 10 is from the clerk recorder assessor, is to accept and file the certified statement of the results of the official canvas and official election summary for the general election held on November 3rd, 2020, and declare the results as specified in the certified statement as required by law. And we have three requests to speak on this item. And we're going to begin with Bobby McInnes to be followed by Rosalie Hardoin. Good morning, County Board of Supervisors. I'm Bobby McGinnis. I'm the chairwoman for the Santa Barbara County GOP. And I'm asking you today to delay the certification of the 2020 general election in Santa Barbara County because we um, are using the Dominion machines that have been under such tight scrutiny around the country in the, in the general election. Uh, 22 of these machines are in forensic investigation in Michigan as we speak. So please require the elections office to not destroy any of the ballots 
or change the settings on the Dominion or GLS equipment in case there would be a national investigation of these machines used throughout the United States. In California, we are one of 40 counties using this equipment. To restore local confidence in the results of the election and not to suppress our local citizens' rights, the County Board of Supervisors can delay the certification until these issues and claims have been vetted. So again, please delay the certification of the 2020 general election in Santa Barbara County. I think they're going to have the results of the forensic study in Michigan probably by the end of the week or early next week. So to delay it by a week or two would mean that we would then have um, clear sailing. So um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, again, I'm Bobby McGinnis. I'm chairwoman for the Santa Barbara GOP calling to to today on behalf of of uh, many of our um, candidates who didn't win and who would like to have a thorough investigation if required. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGinnis. And unfortunately, we were unable to get a hold of Rosalie, so we will be going to Grace Wallace, who is our final speaker. Hi, my name is Grace Wallace, and I am coming on behalf of the delay to certify the election. Uh, I myself ran in 2020 this recent election. There's a lot of work that goes into running, and I'm sure that we all would like to ensure that we have a fair and honest election. Uh, so I'm asking the you know, county supervisor to delay in certifying the elections due to having ongoing problems in the whole nation with the new. Um, Santa Barbara County is one of the 40 uh, counties using the new. So I am requesting that you delay the certification. I mean, after all, if it's all great and you want, it wouldn't hurt to, to wait another couple before certification. So that is my request so that we can restore um, confident in the public with our election system, which we know for many, many years in California, we've had problems in voter fraud. So this is our chance. This is your chance, Board of Supervisors of Santa Barbara County, to restore that confidence. So my request is that we delay certification of the vote, the elections of 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. And Chair Hart, members of the board, we did have a late request to speak on this item, and that is Ren Strong. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Chair and, and Council. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, this is Ren Strong. Um, it's been a while since I've been able to speak here, um, but I'm grateful that I'm doing this now. Um, regarding the item that you're speaking on, yeah, the, the voter fraud, um, what's going on, we need to uh, get this really cleared up. And yes, I definitely am um, in agreement to hold off on on pushing any of the uh, things through um, as a constituent of, of that county um, there in Santa Barbara. Um, and so, uh, yes, if we can, um, yeah, there's, as, as the folks that are listening need to know that there's, there's major corruption going on and you're not participating enough and you guys are all still playing along in this, this, this whole, uh, if you look it up, called the Great Reset, um, and uh, if you choose not to, then you know nobody else to blame but yourselves. So um, again, I've told you all I'm willing to step up and take my my oath to protect and serve the people and the earth and and really the environment and and be in any one of your positions as your guys' positions are going to are about up. So when the people find out what's really going on here, 
You guys are also to blame. So that's all I have to say at this point. Um, but I will be speaking um, on regarding the other um, other topics regarding uh, um, the COVID and all this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Mr. Gazzani, did you have something you'd like to clarify? Chair and Supervisors, um, I think it might help the board and the public to briefly distinguish between what action is agendized for the board today, which is a declaration, and what action has already occurred, which is the certification. So the action today that's agendized for the Board of Supervisors is under Elections Code 15400, Declaration of Person Elected, and the elections official has already taken action under uh, other sections of the Elections Code, including 15401, which is the certification process. And uh, the California Supreme Court has looked at that distinction in two cases, uh, almost exactly 100 years apart, 1866 and 1966, and has made clear that the action that the board is uh, agendized to consider today is a ministerial action, which is separate from the actual certification process. So this is not a judicial action by the board, it's a ministerial action. And uh, the terms are very arcane in the elections code, but I thought that distinction would help. Thank you, Mr. Kazani. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, Mr. Kazani, could you further explain what a ministerial action is? Y yes, and I think that, again, I need, I'm not uh, going out on a limb here. We've got the California Supreme Court telling us what is occurring. Um, and the way that the California Supreme Court described the issuance of a declaration of an election is to describe it as only a formality. Um, and generally in the area of a ministerial act, it's not applying facts to law, it's taking a required, uh, a required action. And therefore I would recommend that the board move forward with it today. Thank you, Mr. Gazzani. I understand we have um, our chief election officer, um, Joe Holland on via Zoom. Maybe Mr. Holland would like to speak to the issue. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, um, I'd like to point out that, that um, in Santa Barbara County, we've never had electronic voting machines. Everything is paper ballot based. We keep our paper ballots for 22 months per the elections code. And we uh, routinely audit 1% of the batches covering each contest um, for the election. So um, we didn't find any discrepancies whatsoever. And so I have complete confidence that our Dominion voting system is secure and, and reliable and accurate and I'd like to point out that of those 40 counties in California, um, that Dominion is also used in San Luis Obispo and Ventura. With regards to uh, keeping the machines, um, not wiping them down or anything, uh, we, don't, we have no plans to really make any changes to our system. Uh, until about a year from now to prepare for the June 2021 election. I mean, unless another election came up that we had to do. So we're not um, planning to change anything. Um, and we are working with a number of individuals that have requested information about the, um, the election. We have absolutely nothing to hide. So we are working with them in getting a PRA request information out to them as we speak. So um, I'm absolutely confident in the results of this election. It was the um, a safe, secure, and accurate election uh, conducted under extreme conditions with the pandemic. And I just want to say that I couldn't be more proud of our election staff who conducted an election like we never had to do before, and it, it came off very, very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Holland, and congratulations on you know the turnout of the election, the, the largest turnout 
of Santa Barbara County voters in our history, and as you said, a safe, secure, accurate, fair election. Um, and this is just simply a ministerial act to record that fact. Are there any questions from board members? Could we have a motion? Move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Now is the time for members of the public to speak uh, to the board on items that are not on today's agenda. Madam Clerk, are there any requests to speak from the public on items that are not on today's agenda? Chair Hart and members of the board, yes, we have two requests to speak in general public comment this morning. We are first going to go to Isabel Nava to be followed by Ren Strong. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board of Santa Barbara. My name is Isabel Nava. I am the voice of my grandson, Anthony Padilla. I called on November 10th, reaching out to you for help. Santa Barbara County needs psychiatric facilities and beds. I am reaching out for the second time. The community of Santa Barbara County are in need of your help. But with your silence, you have proven to me and to the community that you do not value the lives of anyone in the community with less fortunate. Why are you guys ignoring the problem that we have? I found out at the time that my grandson Anthony reached out for help, there was a dispute between the county mental health department and the psychiatric hospital in Las Encinas. Apparently, they had beds available to serve someone in need from Santa Barbara with mental crisis. And they were not being used at the time that my grandson was asking for help. I am asking to the Board of Supervisors to stop ignoring us. Somehow, I found out that Santa Barbara County found millions of dollars for the North County Jail. Meanwhile, we are having the highest prices of suicidal in Santa Barbara County. I wish that one of you had walked on my shoes or in the shoes of a, a parent that is taking care of a family member with chronic mental illness. On October 14, my grandson took his life. I will never know what he felt. My holidays will never be the same. Now, every year at the dinner table, there will be an empty chair. My heart has been shattered. I am not the same person. Meanwhile, who's going to be doing something for parents and the families that are in need, are in need of your help? Please don't ignore us. Even in the county jail, there's a lot of mental people that are just suffering. They put them on isolation. And I know this because I have people, friends, that have family members in jail. They don't, they're not treated properly. They put in isolation. They don't let them talk to their families. Do you think that is human? Would you like to have a member in your family be treated like that? Being ignored in jail? This is not right what you guys are doing. We selected the wrong people. Are you ever going to hear us? Ms. Nava, we definitely hear you and, I don't know and what sympathize is going on in your with your um, 
your concerns about your grandson, and you have our deepest condolences and um, and our attention. We are working hard to make improvements in the mental health system. Thank you very much for your comment. Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor Levinino? I, uh, you know, don't like normally responding to public comment, but I think it'd be a good time to let the public know that we just opened the Champion Center as well in Lompoc, um, which I believe is 35 or 36 new um, mental health beds. Um, it's not the complete answer to the problem, but it is a definite improvement along the way. Thank you, Supervisor Levinia, for adding that inf important information. Um, our next public speaker. Yes, Chair Hart, members of the board, our final speaker in general public comment is Ren Strong. Mr. Strong, are you planning to speak on the COVID item? If so, that is, that is the next item on the agenda. Was that? Uh, Chair Board, um, thank you for the, yeah, the the woman that just spoke. Um, your your comments sadly aren't actually true, authentic, and you you really play a good part. You really you really know how to to. So this public comment is about your medical hospitals, your prison system, your jail system your system all together, and it's failing. You guys know it is. This uh, corporate government, you, if, you, if people understood what's going on, they would know that you can't, you can't have a corporate and a government together. It makes you, that makes this null and voided. Every, every action that you make, every paper that you sign, every word that comes out of your mouth that you guys I, 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 um, or na 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 is is doesn't count. Anything you put down on paper is null and voided. So the public needs to know this. And yeah, it really saddens me. It angers me. And people need to hold themselves accountable, and they need to hold you accountable. That you all need to, as I've spoken thirty times in front of mayor council, county board of supervisor meetings, there in the eight hundred five. Um, uh, Santa Barbara Mayor Council meetings, San Luis Obispo County Board of Supervisor meetings, Santa, uh, San Luis Obispo Mayor Council meetings. So 30 times. And I think this is my 31st time. But again, you all need to be fired, served, fired, and arrested. And that is the action that the, the, the people, the, uh, the constituents, the human beings, they're, they have blood running through their vessels. But if they knew that they were considered just um, part of, of a, uh, a um, enslavement system by their birth certificates and social security cards, then they would actually um, uh, stand up and find their First Amendment voice and their backbone, and they would be participating and, and filling up that hall right there. So again, look up the Great Reset people or human beings. People is part of that. That's the language that that has been um, has uh, hijacked the the human being that we are. Um, so, yeah, I will be speaking again reg regarding the the corona, okay, and um, the vaccination and microchipping that wants to happen. So, when you guys look up and there's geoengineered skies, which I've spoken about. Look up FrankenSkiesTheMovie.com. Also look up the 5G Trojan horse about this, this millimeter microwave radiation technology. If you do not, you are, you are the only one to blame. Thank you, people. Mr. Strong. Your time is up. Thank you for your comments. Um, the next item on our agenda is, that was the end of public comment, correct? Um, the next item is departmental item number one. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read that item into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number one is from the county executive office. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding a coronavirus disease 2018 COVID-19 update. 
Dr. Dornoso, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, um, chair and members of the board. We will be briefing you this morning on the COVID-19 data as it occurs in Santa Barbara County, uh, hospital data, blueprint for a safer economy, regional stay-at-home order, Central Coast region requests, requested information, and the RISE business update. With me is Ms. Joy Kane, who leads our epidemiology team, and joining me virtually is our health officer, Dr. Henning Ansor. From November 23 to December 7th, we have a cumulative case count of 12,379, which is a 12% increase. Uh, the high, we have a high of 643 active cases, which is a 44% increase from the last peak that we experienced at 444 cases in July. And previous to July was our all-time peak at, at 950 cases back in May. Also from November 23rd to December 7th, we have an 87% increase in our active cases. We now have 643 active cases. Uh, we currently have 54 hospitalized cases, so that is a 157% increase during this period going from 21 to 54. And we have a total of 138 deaths. With regards to our new cases by areas, as you can see from um, this graph, we are continuing to see new cases in all areas of the county. The only significant decrease over the past two weeks was in IV going uh, from 37 cases to 18 cases. With the rest of the county, um, there is an increase. Uh, most notably is a 20% increase in Santa Maria and a 75% increase in Lompoc. As I mentioned earlier, we have 54 cases currently hospitalized. However, our ICU cases stand at 15 right now, which is an increase from 6 to 15. That's about 150%. Um, I invite you to visit our website for a uh, daily update on our community dashboard. Uh, the long-awaited hospital data. This is an update to our last quarterly report presented in October. The new information presented today is the hospitalization data. And I have to say that this was a Herculean effort I want to appreciate our hospital partners for providing the data. I believe that it is really good data that we couldn't find on a lot of other uh, neighboring counties uh, website. In particular, I'd like to um, thank Janice Payment, my medical coding program coordinator, Laura Louie, Electronic Health Records Program Manager, Darren Eisenbarth, our Deputy Director of Admin, and Ms. Kane here, our Senior Epi, for spearheading this effort by researching the diagnostic codes, by creating the smart sheet, by assisting the hospital teams to obtain the data, and then the data analysis. The joint efforts in the different programs in the public health department and the partnership with the hospitals really made this data presentation today possible. This figure compares the age groups of Santa Barbara County's population to the age groups of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. The data continues to show cases are more likely to be working-aged adults. A greater proportion of cases versus the population were working-age adults age 18 to 29 years, 
which is 32% of cases versus the 21% of the population. And, thir and in the 30 to 49 years, 34% of the cases versus 24% of the population. However, children accounted for fewer cases, 9%, than their relative population of 23%. Over half of the COVID-19 hospitalizations were over 30, 50 years old. Among those hospitalized, older age groups were disproportionately represented. This could be due to older age groups being more likely to have chronic health conditions. Most deaths occur among older adults, and this percent was disproportionately higher than the population. This slide shows the relative gender proportions of Santa Barbara County's population of COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. The gender of Santa Barbara County's population was approximately equal with 51% male and 49% female. During the reporting period, the gender of COVID-19 cases was similar to the population which is 49% male, female, 50% male, and 1% other, unknown or transgendered. Gender of hospitalized was slightly higher among females at 53%. However, the gender of deaths was slightly higher among males at 57%. COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted communities of color, not only in our community, but across the state and across the country, highlighting racial disparities. While Hispanics, Latinos accounted for 48% of Santa Barbara County's population, they represent 61% of COVID-19 cases, 71% of COVID-19 hospitalizations, and 56% of COVID-19 deaths. However, whites represented fewer cases, 12%, hospitalizations, 21%, and deaths, 34%, compared to their population of 43%. While whites make up one in three deaths, many of these deaths occurred at skilled nursing homes and other congregate care settings, which have been highly impacted by the pandemic. Length of stay per unique hospitalization. Length of stay among those for each hospitalization is presented. Note, there are individuals with more than one hospital stay. While the majority, 58.3% of hospitalizations, had a relatively short stay, meaning zero to five days, 15.8% had a length of stay greater than six, 16 days. Length of stay may indicate severity of disease and the need for supportive care. Of the 922 hospitalizations, diabetes was the most common comorbidity, accounting for 31% of hospitalizations, followed by obesity, accounting for 17.8% of hospitalization and serious heart condition accounting for 14.4% of hospitalization. Of the 922 hospitalizations, 45.4% of the patients had zero comorbidity, 33.2% had one comorbidity, 17.2% had two comorbidities comorbidities, and 11.7 had three or more comorbidities. What can we draw from the recent hospitalization data? So from March through October, there were 9,079 COVID cases reported, and there were 922 COVID-19 hospitalizations at our area hospitals in at Lompoc, at Marion, at Cottage. Half of all COVID-19 hospitalizations were over 50 years old. Hispanic, Latinos disproportionately represented COVID-19 cases 
as well as hospitalizations compared to their population size. The most common hospitalization length of stay was between zero to five days. However, 16% had a length of stay over 15 days. Among those hospitalized, diabetes and obesity were the most common type, types of comorbidities, and over half of the hospitalized patients had at least one comorbidity. 30 questions for Dr. Deronoso. You know, another way to restate that last point about half of the hospitalized patients had at least one comorbidity is nearly half don't have Correct. any pre-existing medical conditions. I think that's more uh, revelatory than the opposite. I think there is a common belief that the only people who are being hospitalized are people that, have, that are very sick before they get COVID-19. And what your data shows is that right. almost half the people are healthy who are correct. ending up hospitalized from COVID-19. That's absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. A blueprint for a safer economy. Our anticipated monitoring blue, st our, let me start over. Our anticipated blueprint status to be released this noon uh, will have a stand at 14.4 for adjusted case rate for tier assignment. And that is an adjustment upwards from the raw case of 14.1. Positivity rate is at 4.6. And the new health equity metric has started again, and it has us at 6.2. I want to pause and say that this is... Um, uh, this is probably the second time that we've been adjusted upwards instead of downwards. And this is because uh, the state median for tests for the next four weeks is at six, it's at 300 and 362.39. And we had 346 um, tests. Um, I looked at our capacity for testing during the same period and um, we still had 21% um, availability um, during this time, same time period. We need people to get tested. I think that this was uh, perhaps a blip because it was also around um, Thanksgiving. So perhaps that was not high on people's lists. Um, I noted that um, about 19 counties were adjusted downwards, so we were not the only one. So that shows perhaps um, other things um, on people's schedules. So this is our rainbow chart for uh, to trend our case rate. In three weeks, the case rate has increased by approximately 97%, going from 7.3 on November 18th to 14.4 today. This is our rainbow chart to trend our testing positivity. Testing positivity in the last three weeks has also increased, but by 44%. So we went on November 18th at 3.2 to 4.6 today. And again, the state has resumed the health equity metric calculation, and we stand at 6.2 um, today. Um, as you are aware, we are, um, there is a state health officer order for regional stay home. And uh, the order divides California, as you know, into regions. And Santa Barbara County is in the Southern California region. The order uh, goes into effect within 24 hours when the region has less than 15% ICU availability. And once a region has been activated, it will remain in effect for at least three weeks. The order will be lifted when the region's ICU bed capacity is equal or greater than 15%. So I also want to share with you, this is anticipated ICU availability to be released um, 
to be confirmed um, at noon today. And it has the Southern California Health Officer region at 10.1%. And uh, the Southern California region consists of Imperial, Inyo, Los Angeles, Mono, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. The regional stay-at-home order consists of 100% uh, percent masking and physical distancing in all businesses remain, that is remaining um, opened and absolutely no gatherings. All gatherings with members of other households are prohibited. Very few exceptions apply. What is opened with restrictions include retail and grocery, shopping centers, hotel and lodging, places of worship and political expressions, offices, outdoor recreation, restaurants for um, takeout and pickup and delivery, gyms, fitness studios outside, and entertainment production and pro sports. With these are all tied to restrictions and modifications. Schools, with regarding schools, schools that are currently operating under an elementary school waiver are able to continue to provide instruction to students on site. Schools that have reopened while their county was in a less restrictive tier are able to continue to provide instruction to students on school sites. All students that have not yet reopened for in-person instruction are able to continue to serve small cohorts of students. Non-urgent medical and dental care is open. Child care and pre-K is open. And critical infrastructure and essential workforce is open. What is closed includes indoor and outdoor playgrounds, indoor recreational facilities, museums, zoos, and aquariums, family entertainment centers, limited services, card rooms and satellite wagering, movie theaters, live audience sports, wines, bars, breweries and distilleries, hair salons, barber shops, and personal care services. So I, I share that with you um, to set the stage for the request that we uh, recently made. This is the Central Coast Region request. Um, it is an effort uh, that started uh, with my colleagues. So the health officers and public health directors in SLO and in Ventura joined Santa Barbara in crafting a, an exit strategy. And the exit strategy is appealing to CDPH to allow us as a Central Coast region to um, exit after three weeks if the ICU capacity in our three counties exceed 15% and is expected to stay on that course based on the four week ICU bed capacity projection by CDPH. And the premise is this, simply we have a history of collaboration and partnership between the three public health departments. We are unique, we are common, and um, we have a lot of, um, of strengths in the three counties in terms of doing joint prevention and treatment efforts to reduce case rates and testing positivity. Um, and we have ran our numbers and our, we consistently have a higher ICU capacity jointly uh, between the three counties. And we did send this letter to CDPH um, last night. So um, our regional comparison of adult ICU bed availability, the blue line captures the three counties and the orange line captures the Southern California Health Officer region in which we have been assigned. And uh, there is remarkable difference and capacity between the, um, the two uh, uh, lines. And uh, we, we are confident that this is a reasonable approach and we will be working uh, together across the three counties to uh, propose this and to discuss this feasibility with our state counterparts. And with this, I transition to um, Ms. Terry. Oh. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Derno. So good morning, Chair, members of the board. The next part of the presentation regards the X agenda item as the clerk noticed this morning was placed on the agenda as the issue arose following the posting of the agenda. Um, the request is a policy consideration for the board that you consider a request of the governor to have Santa Barbara, Ventura, San Luis Obispo counties be allowed to exit the regional stay at home order as a central coast region if in fact our ICU capacity following the th three weeks period identified by the governor exceeds 15%. Our rationale, very much like Dr. Dermanoso noted, is that the central coast region consistently models best practices to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus disease. We have a unique ability to protect our shared constituencies and maintain our critical ICU capacity. We believe that there is a high prevalence of disease in the larger Southern California region, which could very likely prevent the central, central coast from emerging from the regional stay at home order in a timely manner. Also, the Central Coast as a region is best positioned to address the unique needs of our community because of the history of collaboration that Dr. DeRonoso mentioned, not only in the health arena, but among our local governments, at, our, at the county government level, local government le level, um, among our businesses, as well as in academia. We believe that allowing this change will not have a significant impact on the ICU availability rates in the remaining counties within the Southern California region. However, it will have a significant impact on our communities. We also believe that this change would neither affect our continued commitment to assist other counties within the Southern California region. Certainly, if other counties were in continued need of assistance in hospital beds or otherwise, our, our county would stand ready to assist. And that this region it does currently exist. Uh, there, is a pre there is precedent in that law enforcement mutual aid region 1A is currently uh, reflective of the three central coast counties. Therefore, the request before you today is to again uh, consider the, sending the letter to the governor requesting that our three counties be considered as a central coast region to exit, uh, exit the stay at home order as appropriate. I'll go ahead and turn it back to Vaughn. Okay, great. So that um, the next part of our update is to provide information that um, your board uh, has asked for. And so the first question is how many COVID tests are done per day and why have we not disclosed that? Um, I want to point out that testing numbers are reported out on our daily status report. If you are to go to our website on the status page, go to the community test positivity rate graph on the bottom right of the page, click on the daily testing tab underneath to see the number of positive, negative, and other non-positive test values per day. And if you add those three values up, you'll get the total per day. The other question we have received is how many deaths have COVID listed as the only cause of death versus COVID listed with other comorbidities on the death certificate? So of all of our um, uh, death certificates, we have 24 deaths only listed COVID on the death certificate as the cause. We have 114 deaths listed COVID and comorbidities, and we do include this information on our daily uh, status report, uh, which each new death that we report out. 53 deaths had diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and or obesity listed along with COVID on the death certificate. 61 deaths had COVID and other causes of deaths listed on the death certificate and you can find this information on our local status report. And then I'd like to transition to Ms. Anderson for the RISE business update. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, it's been a few weeks since we've provided a RISE business update specifically. The public health director has provided the industry sector changes that have uh, occurred over this weekend due to the regional uh, stay home order. Uh, so we won't go into those again, but we did want to 
um, provide some information that uh, your board had asked for previously. Uh, just to know where our status is, as of Friday, we had about 4,400 uh, businesses uh, participating in our RISE uh, program. The main uh, top three business sectors uh, are continuing to be retail stores, restaurants, and office workspaces. Uh, and a majority of the folks who are um, uh, in our program are related to the cities, about uh, 3,974 of them, and our, the remainder 423 is in our unincorporated county area. Uh, one of the things we did want to uh, at least put out for the public uh, so that it's readily available are the state website links that we typically uh, uh, use as a resource. Uh, that includes um, the regional stay home order that's new to their website. And this is all on their covid19.ca.gov website. Uh, but it goes over and adds really daily any FAQs that are coming across both uh, local and uh, at the state level questions related to this regional stay home order. In addition, uh, the uh, essential workforce um, site is going to be important for some of the um, sectors who have uh, been either closed or modified uh, with restrictions uh, to um, have some exceptions that are related to if you are a essential workforce business. So this is also uh, on their website. Uh, and of course, their uh, blueprint for safer economy uh, site is um, readily uh, providing guidance uh, literally on a daily basis and the, a lot of the data points that the public health director goes over as well. Uh, the last um, link is their business and employer link. Uh, the governor talked uh, about this a bit last week at uh, the press conference when they were uh, talking about the regional stay home order. Uh, and this has a lot of the state financial assistance information and some of it quite new to assist the businesses that are, are really challenged by uh, now this regional stay home order. Uh, it goes into uh, the small business hiring tax credit, uh, interest-free deferral of sales and use tax, the California Rebuilding Fund small business loans, uh, small business disaster loan guarantee program and uh, loan guarantee program via iBank, uh, and small business debt relief. So I would encourage uh, businesses who may have uh, questions related to this to really go to their website. Uh, it's very in-depth. Those link down into um, specific information on each of these programs. Uh, and like I said, some of them are very new and intended to uh, assist uh, businesses uh, in the uh, coming months. We also have this cross-linked on our recoverysbc.org website uh, where we update the RISE guide that is a living document uh, as these changes are occurring. We do also have um, our, our standard resources and questions. The public is uh, encouraged to, if they have questions, um, businesses related to uh, either a RISE ambassador uh, need or uh, just general information about how uh, a, uh, the regional stay-at-home order impacts a specific business. That could be at our EHS admin at sbcphd.org. This is our EHS staff who have been phenomenal in responding all weekend uh, to hundreds of emails we're receiving in regard to questions on how they are impacted by the regional stay-at-home order. Uh, so we are available to answer questions as they come in. Uh, the next section, we're gonna touch briefly on some local uh, economic impacts. Uh, this was specifically requested by Supervisor Lavanino uh, a few uh, meetings ago, and here's what we've been able to compile thus far. The first three uh, slides are actually from our Workforce Development Board uh, that provides some unemployment and uh, workforce information. Uh, this first slide shows the Santa Barbara County unemployment rate trend. Uh, they've been tracking this for, for many years and re most recently quite uh, on a monthly basis providing this information. In February of 2020, the, the unemployment rate was 4.6% in County of Santa Barbara and the highest peak at April of 2020 at 13.9%. And then now down in October of 2020 at 6.3%. We do anticipate, if you recall, that we went to the red tier. Uh, September 29th stayed on that for seven weeks uh, until November 16th. So October uh, was in, a, in the red tier um, assignment uh, where uh, various uh, sectors were opening up a little bit further. 
Obviously, we anticipate that uh, with the regional stay-at-home order, that is going to uh, impact these numbers further. This next slide is a chart of the top 10 industry sectors excluding ag in the uh, county showing numbers of jobs lost during the peak of the pandemic, February, which is February through April 2020, and then the number of jobs recovered from April to October of 2020. Uh, note that we have construction and mining logging seem to have recovered, uh, and down in uh, uh, the lower quadrants, we have education, other services, trade, information, manufacturing, and financial activities. Uh, so, of course, um, as we know, uh, hit heavily hard is our leisure and, leisure and hospitality industry sector where we've seen only a 60% recovery. Uh, this chart is a comparison of a pre-COVID month by year um, of the most plentiful job advertisements. Um, by industry, and as we see, uh, the finance and insurance, manufacturing, and educational services were severely impacted uh, due to the closures. Uh, one of the specific questions um, asked by Supervisor Lavanino is uh, was specific to rental and mortgage data. Um, this is actually rental information is very difficult to come by. We have some folks working on it right now, so we will be back with some more information. But this is what we were able to get from our clerk recorder, uh, some interesting information. They are actually seeing lower um, notice of default, probably most um, related to uh, the um, uh, benefits and, and alternatives uh, in place currently for um, and restrictions that are in place. But uh, they've had um, the average since COVID is 9.4. The three year average before COVID was 28.6 and the 40-year average that they provided was 81. Uh, so, and these are just notices of, of default. Um, so there's obviously a process if there's an actual trust uh, deed recorded, uh, which takes us to this next slide. We thought this was interesting. The clerk recorder actually provides this on a monthly tracking basis as well. And this is our uh, real property document transfer tax uh, that shows that um, we are seeing quite a bit of either sale activity uh, uh, refinancing and cleanup of deeds is what we're hearing uh, from the clerk recorder uh, just during the last few months. So uh, this is a significant increase. Uh, typically what we see after this is um, t uh, indicative of, of higher um, secured property and supplement secured property, property supplemental tax revenue. Uh, again, we are looking for some more information. We have um, uh, requests out to various uh, organizations that um, uh, hopefully will have some more rental information uh, that we can provide uh, and provide that at the next meeting. Uh, but this is what we have specifically uh, on mortgage data. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, although we do have, a, I think, one more uh, announcement from uh, ACO um, uh, Terry Nisich. Thanks, Nancy. I just also wanted to make the board aware this morning that we did receive notification from the California Office of Emergency Services, or Cal OES, that they will be sending a wireless emergency alert, which, as you are aware, is a very loud, audible tone over cell phones at noon today regarding the stay-at-home order. This will be sent to the Southern California region, as we discussed, as well as the San Joaquin regions today. Other regions will receive it once they, too, drop below that 15% capacity as they enter the stay-at-home orders. Many jurisdictions um, per, uh, did express concerns to OES about util utilizing the WIA for this purpose. Um, the message is not coming from OEM or our sheriff, as is typically done in Santa Barbara County. This is coming directly from the state of California. The message will be set in English and Spanish and will run for about an hour, um, meaning if you come in and out of the area, you may still get the tone on your phone, um, the way they geocode, how they do mark the areas where, that, where the um, alert is being sent. Um, the state will not be running a call center to receive any questions. We have our 211 hotline being informed of this, and we will open uh, our EOC uh, call center if, in fact, we do receive a volume, large volume of calls or concerns. Um, the message is expected to state 
A new public health stay-at-home order in your area is in effect. COVID-19 is spreading rapidly. Stay home except for essential activity. Wear a mask, keep your distance, and, was, and visit the appropriate website, um, covid19ca.gov. Again, this is being set by the California Office of Emergency Services. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Dr. Dorinoso, uh, Ms. Kane. Uh, Dr. Ansorg, who's on the line, uh, Ms. Anderson, and Ms. Mosnisich for that really excellent comprehensive update. And thank you, Dr. Dorinoso and Dr. Ansorg for your leadership in creating this exit strategy. Um, I know my colleagues on the board are very interested in this, and we have a number of speakers um, here today who'd like to comment as well. In fact, I think we're up to about 45 or 50 speakers, I think, at this point. So we're gonna have to, unfortunately, limit people's comments. Um, to one minute when we get to that stage. So just give folks a little bit of heads up that we're gonna have to um, shorten the available time for your comments. But um, as I'm sure you'll hear from board members' comments, there is a lot of support for this idea. So um, sooner we can send the letter to the governor, the better for everybody concerned. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, I just had a couple of questions to frame a public comment. The first is uh, the region that we've been assigned under the Cal OES system. Can, can you explain, is that arbitrary? Did that just come out of nowhere? Where, how are we assigned to this particular region? Supervisors, let me just chime in. Dr. Dorinosa can talk about the health officers and how they're organized. But in the region, Cal OES has designated there's, I think it's region six, region one, and region, we're in region 1A with um, our central coast counties. And so they've used that, I think, as an organizing principle. These are existing regions within their system, and the health officers are organized by those regions. And then my second question, I think, is for Mr. Gazzoni. Uh, what would happen if the county defied this order? Uh, what is our relationship as a county to the state? What, what uh, ability does the state have to tell the county what to do? What do we risk? if we don't follow through. Chair and supervisors, we've uh, talked before about the relationship of the county and the state, and it actually goes down several different paths. The health officer, um, or, or the health, the public health department itself, by statute, must follow the directions of the state public health officer. Um, I would say that there's a shared responsibility for public health among the state the Board of Supervisors and the County Public Health Department um, for entities that have um, in some of the counties, so this is not an academic thought, some of the counties that have indicated they would not follow were then told what funding consequences would fall from that um, under whether it's CARES Act or different state funding programs. And um, at some level, probably the risk falls um, as much as on the residents of the county uh, as anyone else because one of the functions of the local health officer order is to translate um, into local terms the impact of the state public health officers regional stay at home order. So I, I think that anything that causes confusion for the residents is, is really one of the risks that comes from that. We'd been reviewing um, over the weekend and last night the local health, local public health officer order that will go out later today that is designed to provide more granularity on how this impacts people. So I think the, the risks, to summarize, there are funding risks. It's actually a crime to violate the state public health officer order. And I think it causes the risk of confusion for our residents and businesses. And Supervisor, through the chair, just to put a fine point on that, I have to sign a certification to the state that we are following the health officer orders. And if we don't, as Mr. Gazzoni said, the state could uh, reduce or um, take away some of the ongoing state funding they provide to us. So it is significant. Supervisor Williams. Well, I just had a, a nuts and bolts question about the <clears throat> uh, travel uh, for essential services only. So if someone comes from out of state, uh, my understanding is they're required to quarantine for 14 days is that a notification that's issued at the airports, or is that a notification that at hotels only? Uh, how does that how does that get disseminated? That's a great question, um, Supervisor Williams, through the chair. 
uh, I know that the public health department is not notified that we have incoming visitors. So I believe that that uh, falls on the um, public education and the publicity that Sacramento has been issuing after the governor um, issued the um, travel guidelines. Are there other questions for staff? Mr. Ghazani, you had a comment? I've, I've got one. Oh, okay. Sorry. Supervisor Levin, I know. Then Mr. Ghazani. Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I just wanted to make sure that I heard something I just wanted to double check on. So we're, we're, we're talking about sending a letter to the governor, but I, I thought I heard Dr. Reynoso talk about also sending a letter to um, California Department of Public Health. And I just wanted to know if those were the same letter, two different letters, or how that works. It is two different letters. So I sent ours. Ours is uh, from the perspective of public health directors and health officers. And it was signed by the, um, the public health officials in the three counties. And it was sent to Dr. Erica Pan last night. OK, that's great. And then what I, I would encourage us, if it's not already in the letter, because um, I, I glanced at it yesterday, but to make sure that in that letter it does say that you know our public health officer supports um, this position so it chair Hart, it is have that in the letter it yes. is referenced in the letter thank you supervisor Lavanino. mr gazzani chair and supervisors i'd just like to add to my uh, answer to supervisor hartman's uh, question um just flipping through the the different authorities that that we carry around and that is that there's very strong statutory authority saying that the California Department of Public Health uh, may advise local health authorities, such as our local health department, and when in its judgment the public health is menace, menaced, it shall control and regulate their action. And that's one of several similarly worded statutes that make clear this chain that goes from California Department of Public Health to the local public health department. And, uh, you know, some counties have also experienced that when they are not inside the CDPH framework, there is the potential for direct state enforcement on the ground. Any other questions for staff? We'll go now to public comment, and we're going to unfortunately have to limit folks to one minute because there are a very, very large number of speakers who want to want to be heard. And um, as you all, I hope, heard during the presentation that the board is uh, discussing sending a letter to the governor to urge a uh, different grouping of counties, the Central Coast region being a separate uh, sub-region of the state that would enable us to get out of the shutdown stay-at-home order sooner than if we were to stay in the uh, the larger Southern California region. So I hope that's helpful to the public commenters. Yes, Chair Hart, members of the board, as indicated, we have 45 requests to speak on this item. We're going to begin with Robert Bonilla to be followed by Roseanne Crawford. And I would also like to take this um, a moment to let members of the public know the chair has now indicated that the public comment period is closed for any further requests. And now we'll go to Robert. Yeah. Alrighty, go ahead. Good morning, Chair Hart, Robert Vanilla here. I live in Santa Maria, California. And putting this into the, and not standing up, I don't know if you guys have stood up yet for Santa Barbara County, and putting us into the LA Regent and not putting up some resistance here is kind of uh, disappointing because I think we're under our threshold for our area for intensive care and for corona um, victims. So what what is the Board of Supervisors' plans to do anything for the people on the Central Coast to get us out of this so that people can go to back to natural lives and so that they don't lose their business? 
because that'd be the worst thing. You know, we got rid of oil already once. You took in uh, cannabis, and if you think that's going to sustain this county, I think uh, you need to take another look at it. We will now go, we, unfortunately, we were unable to get a hold of Roseanne, so we will now go to Peggy Wilson to be followed by Glenn Wilson. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I like some of the things you're doing, the counties trying to, um, the three counties trying to exit out of the others. Thank you, Dr. Reynoso, for answering my question. So of 138 deaths, only there's 24 that died specifically with COVID. That's 21% or 0.005% of our population of 446,500, okay? That's not enough to shut down this uh, state, uh, this county. And furthermore, if Governor Newsom really thought uh, this was really serious, he wouldn't have been out at the uh, laundry with having a $15,000 bar tab on the taxpayer's $400 plate appetizers with his cronies shoulder to shoulder, no math, okay? His kids are in school. This is an abomination. So I'm asking the, the board there to have courage and all everybody that hears my voice we need to push back out my we will now go to glenn wilson to be followed by lisa sloan Hi, this is Glenn Wilson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Glenn Wilson. I'm uh, a scientist by training and profession, over 40 years' experience. I've worked with viruses before and have gotten through the FDA approved FDA kits for the first rapid diagnostic test for viruses in the 80s. So I'm very familiar with this area. And I want to just point out an article I want to make sure you guys spend some time on, which is looking closer look at the U.S. death rates. It was an article published on, um, by Genevieve Brandon, and she's with John Hopkins. This, the conclusions of her um, article are basically, they looked at 1.7 million deaths through February to into September, and basically concluded that there's been no change in the overall death rate in the United States in elders or other age group, looking at past history. They, taking into account the spike in COVID during this time frame, they looked at individual other potential co- Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We will now go to Lisa Sloan. Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor Adam. I, I'm, I'm feeling uh, like we're really shorting public comment here. This is an issue that we've had a lot of public comment on uh, in the emails, and and I know that people were pretty exercised about it. And I think uh, we're 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 whacking them pretty early. And uh, I don't know if you're if you're disinclined to extend the period. Uh, maybe we should tell everybody who's listening they better they better tighten it up a little bit because I don't think people understand what a minute is. Supervisor Williams. Well, I just wanted to kind of defend our chair. He's been far more generous with the, the, the three minutes in more situations than I ever was as chair and that other chairs have been. Uh, you know, I, I know it's hard to curtail public comment, but, uh, you know, we do need to, um, if people want us to, to issue this letter, we, you know, and continue this, I guess one of the letters was already sent, but one is not yet sent, then, then we do need to do the people's business. Supervisor. And, and Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor Adam. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I understand what Supervisor Williams is talking about. And uh, it's, it's, it would be more acceptable to me uh, if 
we had a practice of not uh, uh, allowing longer periods of public comment, but that's kind of been the practice of your chairmanship, and uh, I think at this point it, it's it's kind of out of out of practice and, and character to to cut it this short. Thank you, Supervisor Adams. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, two points. The first is we have a very long agenda today with other matters that are also going to generate a lot of public comment. And uh, the second is that many of the comments are urging us to do something we're already uh, intending. We haven't voted yet, but my strong sense is that uh, we'll follow our, our uh, public health officer and, and send a letter. So uh, I, I wouldn't want to extend it too long because the longer we go at the end of the agenda, we, we get tired and we don't pay as much attention then. Okay, we can extend it to two minutes. So hopefully folks understand that the board is poised to send a letter to the governor to ask us to um, have an exit strategy soon, sooner from the shutdown order and that the sooner we can get this letter to the governor, the, the faster they can consider this request. And um, if you are speaking to urge our um, Agreement with that approach, you know, that this certainly can be communicated in a minute. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please continue with public comment? And folks have two minutes. We will now go to Lisa Sloan to be followed by Roseanne Crawford. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman Hart and members of the board, I'm Lisa Sloan from Belita. As a resident of Santa Barbara County, I ask for your help. Ostensibly, the continued lockdowns were intended to prevent the spread of COVID-19. However, doctors do not all agree that lockdowns are the best way to address the spread of coronavirus. On October 4th, 2020, a group of 47 American doctors and now over 45,000 doctors have signed the Great Barrington Declaration, which states in part, as infectious disease epidemiologists and public health scientists, we have grave concerns about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies. Keeping these measures in place until a vaccine is available will cause irreparable damage with the underprivileged disproportionately harmed, end quote. As Dr. Del Reynoso reported, 45 deaths in the county from COVID-19 with no comorbidity translates to a less than 0.2% death rate. This does not constitute a public health emergency, nor is it the only cause of illness or death in Santa Barbara County. A meaningful metric would be to compare total deaths in 2020 versus previous years. The First Amendment of the Constitution protects our God-given rights to freedom of speech, religion, and to peaceably assemble from laws written to enforce them. Besides, there is no provision in the Constitution that nullifies our freedoms identified in the Bill of Rights during a state of emergency, public health, or otherwise. We must stop the lockdowns and open up the churches, businesses, and schools. As supervisors, you represent the people, and you must protect our constitutional rights. We will now go to Roseanne Crawford to be followed by John Sween. Thank you. This is Roseanne Crawford. I want to start by saying thank you. Uh, our local health department is doing an excellent job in keeping us informed and making critical decisions to protect our community. Local businesses are barely hanging on with the required adjustments they have complied with, and many will not be in business by January. 
Every day, this draconian policy gets us further behind economically, not to mention the mental health and delayed learning ramifications. Both the city and county need tax revenues with bed tax down. So it's a win for businesses, city and counties, as well as our residents, if we can continue to work together as we have been. It is not right that we are batched in with these high density areas whose rates are significantly higher than ours. It's vital that we as a community push for establishing ourselves as Central Coast, as a regional designation against our governor's overreaching orders. Thank you for your time and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. We will now go to John Sween to be followed by Alice Post. Yes, this is John Sween. I've been a resident of Santa Barbara since 1963, fourth generation. And I think that the lockdown on these restaurants is absolutely absurd. They've adjusted to do everything outside. They've spent money to do that. They've bought heaters. They've done everything possible. And this COVID thing is if you're totally, absolutely scared to death of it, stay home. If your health is compromised, stay home. And the rest of us should be able to just function and stay out here and have a life. And I don't believe any governor, whether it's Newsom or whoever, should run everybody's life. I don't think they know anything. Who came up with six feet? They don't know about six feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Maybe it's 20 feet. So I just want the supervisors to run our county and not let the governor run everything and lump us into all of Southern California. My brother lives in the desert in Inyo County. This included. There's nobody over there, hardly. So I think we need to use some common sense and let the world work. And it is it is what it is. We've never shut the country down or anything for any other disease, flu, whatever. Everybody gets flu shots. They still get the flu. I'm 75. I've never had a flu shot. I will never get one. And I will not do the vaccine. I think it's just all hype and it's a lot of control. So... That's all I have to say, and I hope you guys, the supervisors, think a little bit and use some common sense and, and run our county and not let somebody from high up run the, the whole situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. We will now go to Alice Post to be followed by Rosalie Hardwine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello, this is Alice Post. I live in Santa Barbara. I want to commend the uh, Board of Supervisors for the work that was presented in the meeting to write the letter to the state to request that the three tri-county area be separated from the Southern California greater area. I really appreciate the um, quick and professional effort that went into that, and it's exactly what you should be doing. I urge that you all vote in favor of that. I want to pivot to a different point, that the governor is out of control, and I'm, as a citizen, I'm very upset with Governor Newsom. His approach to the virus, in my opinion, is completely flawed, and I basically agree with the Great Barrington 45,000 doctors who have a different approach. And I think the harm that is being done by this wrong, flawed approach may be causing far greater damage to health then the coronavirus is causing to health. 
my heart breaks for that woman who talked about her grandson who committed suicide in October. This is happening. Get the schools open. Stop this world of hurt. I feel that there's a scale of balance. The code is on one side. Yes, it's very bad. But where are the metrics that you're weighing to show what's happening because of the shutdowns? Thank you, Ms. Post. We will now go to Rosalie Hardoin to be followed by William Spielda. Chair Hart and members of the board, if I can also please note for the members of the public who are participating in this hearing, if you could please not call the clerk of the board right now, we are calling you for public comment and we do have quite a few still to get through, so we will call you, so please do not call us. Thank you. Two minutes to speak and you can begin your comments. Thank you. Hello. My name is Rosalie Hardoin. I wanted to voice my concern as a Santa Barbara resident regarding the extreme measures our governor is forcing on California. I realize that COVID-19 is a virus that we need to take precautions with, with physical distancing and wearing masks, but I see the hypocrisy of how Governor Newsom is forcing shutdowns on small businesses across California, whereas he is allowing large companies such as Walmart, Costco, Target, Home Depot, Bed Bath & Beyond, CBS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, and all supermarkets to all stay open while following the COVID-19 guidelines. Small businesses should be allowed to follow the same guidelines and use common sense practices regarding COVID-19. If large companies can stay open and follow the guidelines, then small businesses should be allowed to do the same. I'm standing up for the people of California, their businesses, and their livelihoods. Not everyone can work from home. They have families they need to provide for. I humbly ask that you, Board of Supervisors, stand up for our local businesses who need to work and provide for their families while taking every precaution to keep their customers safe in following the guidelines with using physical distancing and wearing masks. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate all your support. We will now go to William Spialda to be followed by Andy Caldwell. Oh, I just want to state that I don't think we've changed our goalposts here on what determines an area affected by the COVID. I think Santa Barbara County should take its own guidelines, not not in the southern tier. And in our area, we have a very small percentage of people in ICU with COVID. Another thing I'd like to see is that when you graph the uh, occurrences of the COVID deaths, I'd like to see along with it graphs of deaths by other causes, like heart attacks and diabetes, et cetera. You might find that COVID is a cure for those other diseases. That's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will now go to Andy Caldwell to be followed by Aaron Kempe. Chair, Chair Hart, members of the board, Andy Caldwell representing Colab. We're very grateful that you're sending the letter. We actually wish it was a little bit stronger. Um, I think there's several things you need to consider. First of all, the, the region you put us in was over half of the state's population was in one region. Secondly, back in March, the reason we had larger or capacity in hospitals is we had uh, banished all elective surgeries. 
And so one of the reasons the hospitals, I know not ICUs, but in the hospitals there's not much room was because we had not banned those for some time. Another issue that I wish you'd bring up in your letter is the governor is ignoring the surge capacity at Cal Poly and the surge capacity you have the potential to create at Sears. What's the purpose of having this if you get shut down? One of the reasons we had that is so that we would not have to be in shutdown. Another issue is why, why are we not being judged as a single county entity? I don't think San Luis wants to be lumped in with us per se, and I don't know why we would want to be lumped in with Ventura. Ventura is larger than both San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties combined. I understand why we'd rather be the tri-county than lumped in with Los Angeles, but the question remains is why, why did he move that goalpost? Why are we not being judged as a single county? Um, you know, the bottom line here is this governor has changed the rules a dozen or more times, but COVID has not changed. If masks work, they work. Um, if six-foot distancing works, it works. We believe the restaurants need to be stay open and go back indoors, along with hair salons and barber shops and the like. And we wish that you would be more, even more strident than you are. But I am grateful that this is one of the first times, especially you, Chair Hart, um, even last week when they wanted to do the churches, you considered that division, even though the. Unfortunately, we are unable to get a hold of Aaron Kempe, so we will now go to Mark Houston to be followed by Kristen Slingamen. Uh, hello, board. Thank you very much. I'm, this is Mark Ethan, and, and my wife and I, Margaret, have been in the restaurant business here in Santa Barbara for uh, about 35 years. Uh, we're, right now, we're just devastated by what's happening to us. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing with the letter. That's originally why I called, so I'm, uh, I'm very excited you're getting that off. Um, I know you're aware of our, the situation we have. We bought heaters. We built parklets. We're all that stuff will have to be no doubt thrown away when we're allowed to go back inside next year, hopefully. Um, my question for you now, I'm glad you're going forward, is what, how to follow up on that? Because we, I, we can't sustain this much longer. We're at the end of our rope. I've already laid off 80% of our staff. We're just down to a dozen or so part-timers at two restaurants. It's just unsustainable. But doing to-go business isn't enough. It's barely enough just to pay their wages. It's not enough to cover overhead, so we I desperately need your help. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, Mr. Hart, I appreciate your comments about uh, locals, um, staying local and buying local. We really appreciate that. Many people have supported us and have stepped up. Um, we put in a, a thing to kill viruses in our building. It's safer than outside. Uh, if you want to ask me about it, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm sure some of you know who we are. You could uh, ask me about that. I can but it's definitely safer inside than it is outside, especially on State Street. Uh, I don't know. You know everything else. I'm just asking for your continued help, and I appreciate you for doing that. Please continue fighting, even if the governor uh, comes back in a negative way. If you can find alternatives, you need to do something for us. Um, okay, that good, because we have to sit. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. We will now go to Christian Slingham to be followed by Mitchell Shervin. Good morning, Supervisor Hart and honorable members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Kristen Slingman. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara. For 38 years, I've lived here. I first want to thank you for your service during a time that has been arguably one of the most difficult in all of our lifetimes. I ask now that you open your hearts to hear what I have to say. We know much more about the virus than we did during the first lockdown and who it affects 
and have worked hard to maintain low COVID rates as a community. However, Governor Newsom has been seeing fit to change the goalpost time and time again. I don't need to insult your intelligence by arguing the facts regarding COVID or ICU numbers. I simply want to remind you of your mission as stated on your website, which is to provide quality public services to the people of Santa Barbara County in response to their need for a healthy, safe, and prosperous environment and to establish and maintain a workforce which reflects the diversity of our community. By not, t not taking a stand against this lockdown order, you would in effect fail your mission to our community. Yes, we should be vigilant about COVID-19, but in order to love our neighbors, we need to love all of our neighbors and we can't do that if we lock down. Please, I urge you to protect the vulnerable and champion our small businesses. The price of a second lockdown is much higher than the COVID case numbers. And if you think it's only gonna be three weeks, think again. The goal post keeps getting moved. You must take a stand and draw the line somewhere, and that needs to be here and now. There is no time for harmful allegiances with a governor who doesn't even follow his own rules. We are such a unique community, and we are ultimately facing losing it permanently. I ask that you take a stand for us as you have with the letter so far. I appreciate your invaluable time and service, and I thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. We will now go to Mitchell Shervin to be followed by Philip Galanders. Good morning, Chairman Hart and members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Mitchell Shervin, and I'm the founder and operator of Bouchon Restaurant in downtown Santa Barbara. I wrote the board last week prior to the current stay-at-home order, strongly suggesting we resist the temptation to ban outdoor dining in Santa Barbara County. This was not an economic argument, which I've purposefully left out of my comments, because I've come to realize no one is interested in cost-benefit analysis when even one COVID case is one COVID case too many. That said, for anyone who wants an excellent first-hand account of the economic devastation closer orders have had on restaurants like mine, I recommend my friend Brooke Williamson's op-ed piece in the LA Times on Sunday, December 6th. In my letter last week, I contended that closing outdoor dining is the less safe move for Santa Barbara, as it only serves to drive social gatherings even further underground, where we can actually document the highest risk of community spread resides unlike outdoor dining, where to my knowledge, there are no documentable outbreaks. The restaurant industry locally has proven over the past six months it can safely operate and would continue to do so with distancing, masks, and sanitizing. At Bouchon, we have served over 15,000 guests since reopening in June, and, and to my knowledge, not one of my 25 member staff has tested positive. I've asked that you communicate to Governor Newsom that Santa Barbara believes outdoor dining is a safer alternative, knowing that outdoor gatherings won't happen as much at home and instead will only explode indoors during the cold holiday months. The governor's own comments that the state is trying to be more specific, more surgical, and more prescriptive in terms of looking at where the data leads us indicated to me he would have welcomed input from the county on this issue. Therefore, I implore the Board of Supervisors to not send a letter to governor requesting a waiver, but instead send one that indicates the county governments of Ventura, San Luis Obispo, and Santa Barbara have elected to decouple the Central Coast from the Southern California region. The Tri-County governments respectfully accept the 15% capacity limit in our collective ICUs, and if we meet that threshold in our Central... Thank you, Mr. Servin. <clears throat> we will now go to Philip Galanders to be followed by Suzanne Petrie. This is Philip Gallanders from Lompoc, California. And I was calling to request that the supervisors refuse to follow the edict from Governor Newsom because it is absurd on the face of it that Central California be lumped in with Southern California. If Southern California and Los Angeles are over the top with COVID cases, we are not. Of the total beds in Santa Barbara County, we're using 15 only. That's 18% of our total. Ventura is using 37, 
of 137, so that's 27% of their total. San Luis Obispo has only four ICU beds in use, which is 7.5% of their total. And to use an absurd algorithm to cram healthy place or healthy, much more healthy places in with a miasma of Los Angeles County is just simply wrong. It allows businesses to go, enforces businesses out. It causes people a great deal of financial, moral, psychological difficulty. It is just a terribly wrong thing for Santa Barbara to allow itself to be forced into the same cookie cutter mold. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now go to Suzanne Petrie to be followed by Amy Smith. Hello, Honorable Supervisors. My name is Suzanne. I'm a mother of two. I'm an educator and tennis coach, and I'm just calling briefly to express my support for uh, having our Central Coast not be part of the uh, Gavin Newsom and lumping in with the Southern California uh, counties. Uh, we have our own uh, situation up here that is distinctly different from SoCal. I think it's a great detriment to our local businesses who have suffered so much and that most people at this time are very responsible in my sphere of uh, just walking around. And I'd like to, to consider the needs of our uh, citizenry so, uh, and reject the, uh, the lockups, which I feel are not working and are hurting our immune system in general. And I'm all for health. I've also been in the medical field. And I thank you very much for your time and for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petri. We will now go to Amy Smith to be followed by Mary Spallino. Hello. Hello. My name is Amy Smith, and I am trained as a in engineering um, and have a PhD in engineering and very interested in data, was fortunate to work uh, for a time in the quality control department in the solar cell factory in Camarillo. And I'm very interested in quality of data. And with that in mind, um, I'm very concerned about problems with the PCR test, polymerase chain reaction test, um, that the co-inventor, Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Kerry Mullis, uh, said was not to be used as a diagnostic test, but a research tool. And yet now it is being used as a diagnostic test and um, was based on a paper that was published in a very accelerated peer review process with conflicts of interest. Uh, does not seem to uh, have detection specific to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we are supposed to be associating with COVID illness. The test uh, is estimated to have up to a 90% or even higher false positive rate. So I'm very concerned to find out what tests are being used in our data sets in Santa Barbara County and in general, but we can do something about our county. So what tests are we using? Uh, what percentage and what would be the estimates of error in our case count numbers? And that also goes into cause of death. So if COVID is present or is it based on this um, faulty test? Is it based on a different test? So we need to have that information. We also need to understand what the seasonal um, hospitalization variation is over prior years so we can compare the seasonal increase in in hospitalization that's taking place right now and how that matches with normal seasonal increase due to all kinds of viruses, flus, and other things that people are more susceptible to in the winter months. Please get your vitamin D, everyone. And we will now go to Mary Spallino to be followed by Rhonda Hughes-Gen.
Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to protect the citizens that you represent from the death pot in Sacramento. My name is Mary Spolino, and I'm once again addressing the board and pleading with you to help our county stand up to the egomaniacal, self-absorbed, hypocritical governor of our state. You know, the French laundry dinner-eating tool with the exorbitant restaurant bill for 15 people? That guy. He has no understanding of the struggles of the common man, and this is where you come in. Newsom has once again chosen to close restaurants arbitrarily. Why do I use the word arbitrarily? I use it because there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that COVID-19 is being spread at restaurants. We all know where it's being spread, and that is by college students and certain families that get together for holidays without knowing where their extended family has been, while we at our restaurant have been open when allowed, and not once has there been a spike in cases due to people going to safe restaurants. Cases only seem to spike with the aforementioned activity. Meanwhile, isn't it interesting that all the big corporate stores remain open, making their huge profits, while small business gets crushed again? In these stores, we touch fruits and veggies, we touch carts, we touch payment keypads, but it's restaurants causing the spread? Isn't this type of thinking ludicrous? Do you realize what we have to do to keep our doors open during this pandemic? I'll tell you, we were told, close your doors, you're a danger to the public. Okay, open to 25%. Okay, open to 50%. Wait, close inside and open outside only. Wait, it's winter. In order to serve people outside, we must figure out a way to keep them warm. Okay, money needs to be spent on tents and heater. Okay, now close your doors again. Meanwhile, losing money and jobs at every turn. We will now go to Rhonda Huesgen to be followed by Kay Bowman. Thank you for um, having me speak and for providing this venue. And I thank you for your letter to the governor to exit the mandate for the county supervisors, I'd ask you respectfully, though, to make it a, a bit stronger. The governor has mandated too many onerous rules, that making it tyranny. First, we were asked to flatten the curve to avoid the overwhelming hospitals, and that was done. However, healthcare workers were laid off, so our hospitals were going empty. The goals keep continuing to move, as other people have said as well. I don't believe um, in the Constitution there's a place where it's that it is suspended. The Constitution is suspended during a pandemic. So we, we still have the right to, to do con, con, uh, continue our businesses. The common sense, as well as the Great Barrington Declaration, where three doctors from Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford, epidemiologists signed in October 2020, and they have 40,000 other signatures from doctors as well, where they do, they say that another approach works. Older adults and the vulnerable folks actually do need protection, but let's, let's go on with uh, the needs of the economic that people need too. That is a health concern as well. Small businesses cannot survive. Every business is essential to the person's ability to feed their family. I don't believe the governor seems to trust the people. And I'm, we would like you to be able to speak for us as well so that, we can, so that we can go on with our lives as well because those, the, the sociability, people need to see other people. It, it's inhumane to not see people's faces. Anyway, I trust that you would respectfully make your position stronger for the, to the governor. Thank you. We will now go to Kay Bowman to be followed by Shelley Winkles. Good morning, my name is Kay Bowman. I used to have a successful catering business, but I haven't been allowed to work for nine months. 
Consequently, I've had plenty of time to research. Since I only have three, two minutes, I won't go over the science of why this lockdown is unnecessary or talk about the constitutional reasons why it is illegal, but I will give you some numbers. California has a population of 39 million people. In the past 11 months, approximately 20,000 people have died from COVID. That's 0.5%. Santa Barbara County had 138 deaths, making it 0.3%. 0.03% of our population. That's an average of 12 deaths per month. Many of those included people who had underlying conditions. We have 99 ICU beds in Santa Barbara. Currently, 14 are being used for COVID. Keep in mind the survival rate is over 99%. Do you really believe that these statistics warrant shutting down our businesses? Is this virus something you are so afraid of that you are willing to destroy the lives of so many of our citizens? Businesses will be financially unable to survive. People will get sick from stress. Suicide and homelessness will increase. If you believe that we need to shut down, then I propose that all of you go without your salaries for nine months so you can understand the challenges many of us are facing. I have been a resident of this county for 40 years. It is extremely disheartening to see what is becoming of our beautiful community. My prayers go out to all who have spent dwindling funds to create outdoor spaces so they can remain open, only to be shut down again. If we are forced to close, the destruction of Santa Barbara will be on your hands. You are elected to protect the citizens of this county, not destroy them. I implore you to save us from the unconstitutional tyranny of Governor Newsom. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Unfortunately, we're unable to get a hold of Shelly Winkle, so we will now go to Barbara Ireland to be followed by Beverly Taylor. Yes, uh, Board of Supervisors, it, my name is Barbara Ireland, and I'm just really hoping that you'll consider removing Santa Barbara out of the county, separate from L.A., and you'll help us to um, to open up the restaurants and open up everything here in town so the people won't be losing so much after they've spent so much in trying to get their restaurants outdoors and just the way that, that uh, they were supposed to have them. And I just feel so badly about everyone losing so much, and especially this time at Christmas time. Uh, we really need to get out there. So thank you for listening, and I really hope you'll consider this. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Ireland. We will now go to Beverly Taylor to be followed by Michael English. Good morning, Chair Hart, Supervisors, and CEO Miyasato. My name is Beverly Taylor, and I'm here to urge you to oppose Governor Newsom's most recent stay-at-home order. While I appreciate the efforts being taken by the Tri-County's Public Health Department directors and the draft letter before this board requesting that Governor reconsider separating our Tri-Counties from the Southern California region in three weeks, I have to say we can't afford to be shut down for three more weeks. The residents of this county who are considered non-essential workers can't wait three weeks. They're telling you that they won't survive a three-week shutdown. This metric as a decision-making tool to determine the livelihood and well-being of the citizens of Santa Barbara County is without merit and irresponsible. It is costing businessmen and women their livelihood and employees their jobs. 
It's forcing our young people to remain in their homes, robbing them of a much needed classroom learning environment. I am advocating for you to not implement these mandates. I know it's bold and courageous stance to take, I admit. But if it's any consolation, you have thousands of Santa Barbara County residents who are with you, who will support you, and who are willing to stand beside you. Lastly, the data and the facts are on your side. Governor Newsom, by all indications, is not looking out for the interests of the families, businesses, students, the elderly, the worshipers, the residents of Santa Barbara County. It is up to you to oppose this mandate and let the residents of Santa Barbara County get back to work and school. I thank you for your time, and I appreciate the work that you are all doing. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We will now go to Michael English to be followed by Grace Wallace. All right, well, thank you for hearing from me. Um, I had sent a message the other day uh, regarding the shutdown that uh, Governor Newsom was ordering for the region of Southern California. And uh, I was concerned because as I looked at the, uh, the numbers from the Santa Barbara County Community Data Dashboard, it looked to me like uh, we are not in the same condition that the rest of Southern California is, particularly Los Angeles. We have 55% uh, of the ICU beds being used. Uh, only 15% of those are for COVID patients. And 60% of all hospital beds being used, and 14% 14 of, 14 of those for COVID patients. Uh, respirators are, are very available. 11% of them are being used, and only 4.6% of those are being used for COVID. And uh, given that Newsom's uh, uh, trigger is supposed to be at 85% use, uh, it seems to me really uncalled for to uh, to make a fur uh, this escalate or uh, enhanced shutdown for Santa Barbara. Uh, so I just encourage you to to consider that. If you look at those numbers, they, those numbers are elevated, but it might not be because of COVID. Um, COVID numbers themselves are quite low, but it could be side effects, and the side effects are are well known. I mean, people get depressed, they they drink more, they take a that worse care of themselves. Um, shutting down more is only going to make those aspects worse. So um, I just encourage you to, to consider that um, those numbers uh, in in relationship to uh, accepting this the shutdown order. And uh, I'd, I'd say you know uh, please don't shut down more. Uh, if anything, open up more. We we need we need to be able to get back to normal life and uh, and the the shutdown stuff is just killing us. So uh, thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Mr. English. We will now go to Grace Wallace to be followed by Kathleen Moses. I am writing on behalf of our local businesses who have suffered greatly in loss of income and some have lost their businesses. I ask, is this the American way? Is this freedom? Does it support the American dream? There's something sincerely wrong when big box business can open and you can feed 200 movie participants right next door to a restaurant employing 10 people 20 feet away and close it down. It appears that our government and governor are against our local businesses for which now you play a role in your decision today. COVID has been here since March 16th. By now, uh, we have learned all different ways to safely to take safety measures. We have a more than 99% survival ratio depending on your vulnerability. It is the choice of the people, according to our First Amendment, to choose to go to a restaurant or to a gym. The pursuit of happiness founded in our declaration spells, out, spells this out 
uh, for our business owners. They are free to pursue happiness by offering services to the public. Uh, um, I'm sorry, off, offering, offering services to the public um, and being in their business, generating income. The holiday is the is their chance to make up the loss for the year. I urge you to today to follow suit with Jim Desmond, San Diego County Supervisor who is not enforcing the shutdown measures. So I am, er, I, I'm sorry, so your decisions of, uh, is critical to the support of the well-being of our community. Open up our area. Do not continue to take, take our rights away. And I am encouraging you to take courage and write a letter asking to be exempt We will now go to Kathleen Moses to be followed by Lammy Johnstone. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kathleen Moses. Um, I have been a resident of Northern Santa Barbara County for 26 years. Um, I am calling to address my concerns about the latest, the latest lockdown order by Governor Newsom. We know that this, this uh, virus has a 99.7% survivability rate. Um, when we first began this, it was about flattening the curve, and now it seems to be about the existence of cases at all. And one of the problems that I have is when are we going to stop living in perpetual quarantine? Um, Governor Newsom has already been told twice, at least in a couple of court cases, that he has overstepped his power, his, his bounds, and um, we just have businesses closing our Children are suffering from depression. They're not playing their sports. They're not engaged in their social clubs, 4-H, or um, their church groups. It, you know, people are losing everything that they've worked for. And I am asking respectfully that the Board of Supervisors stands up to Gavin Newsom and tells him that enough is enough. And um, I just really hope that you guys take this into consideration because I don't think many of our businesses can survive another lockdown and it's just killing our communities. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we will now go to Lammy Johnstone to be followed by Esther Kim. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Good morning, good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Lammy Johnstone. I live in Stallbank. And uh, if things continue the way the governor wishes them to continue, the city of Stallbank could potentially go belly up. Right now, 
uh, as you may or may not know, we've closed down uh, Copenhagen, which is the main street here in Solvang, in order for uh, to abide by the uh, only having meals outside. Now, apparently, we can't even do that. I spoke with or spoke to, excuse me, our city council uh, here at Solvang last night. They also agreed, and you should have a letter from them, saying that we, the city of Solvang, is uh, certainly 100% uh, agrees with uh, the triumphant, in other words, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and uh, Slow. But if that does not pass, we, the city of Solvang, will just go ahead and do it on our own. Our lifeblood is Christmas. That's when the city of Solvang makes most of its money. And closing down at this particular time is horribly, horribly unfair. I also spoke with the NCO of Cottage last night. I said, what are our numbers? in terms of uh, the ICU, said the numbers are very low, and uh, they were so low that yesterday morning, I believe, they brought in two COVID patients from, and I'm going to say Idlewild, but don't hold my... <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Johnstone. We will now go to Esther Kim to be followed by Martin Castong. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much for having me on. And first, I want to say thank you so much, supervisors, for your efforts to keep Santa Barbara County alive. A lot of people have already said things that I wanted to say, so I'm just going to kind of piggyback off their comments. First, I want to second the owner of Bouchon. Please don't just ask for a waiver, but state that we are forming our own region. I think we have to stand up and take a much stronger stance against Governor Newsom, who has been putting out manda these mandates, which have no basis in the Constitution, they're totally unconstitutional. I also want to piggyback off of another woman's comments about the PCR testing being incorrect. Um, too many false positives. And there is actually a man who was the former, um, the former chief scientific officer of Pfizer, and he actually has an article, Pandemic is Over is the name of the article. You can find this on healthimpactnews.com in which he says that the second wave is being based, is faked off of false positive COVID tests. So what's going on right now is not necessarily as bad as they're trying to make it out to be as we can see in our numbers in the ICU and in our hospitals. So please do use your common sense. The people of Santa Barbara will definitely stand up behind you. There are many, many, many of us who look to you to protect us. Our community, our cute little tourist town will become a ghost town. There will be nothing for us to return to when all of this is over if you don't stand up to this dictator of a govern governor. I will be taking signatures for his recall. I'm doing the petition to recall him. I'll be there at Santa Barbara's Farmer's Market on Saturday. So please swing by and sign the petition. And again, thank you so much for standing up for us. Thank you, Ms. Kent. <clears throat> we will now go to Martin Caston to be followed by Debbie Caston. I would like to ask the Santa Barbara County Supervisors to strongly condemn Newsom's order. Our county needs to petition the governor to be taken, for our county to be taken out of the Southern California District as a business owner in Santa Maria for the last 37 years. The restrictions being put on our catering business is making our future and many of the nonprofits we support and cater 
in jeopardy. Thank you very much. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Kessler. Alrighty, we will now go to Debbie Caston to be followed by Che Han. I should remove Santa Barbara and San Luis counties from being included in the Southern California ICU numbers. Our ICUs are nowhere near as busy. This is devastating to all businesses in Santa Barbara and Slow County, and it's time to remove us from being lumped into Southern California. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now go to Che Han to be followed by Nancy Grant. Hello, and thank you for hearing me today. I'm speaking today to ask you to cancel the lockdown orders. If we were not linked, lumped in together with Los Angeles, we would not be facing this today. According to the Santa Barbara County Public Health Statistics, in 2017, heart disease took 735 people, all cancers, 634, diabetes, 156, Alzheimer's, 146. COVID deaths as of today are statistically insignificant at 15. If COVID were a thing in 2017, it would probably be listed under miscellaneous. In 19 or 2018, Santa Barbara Public Health told us that flu and pneumonia deaths accounted for 68 deaths for the year. This year, COVID is 15 deaths. We're locking down for what? I suggest that each of you consider the possibility of losing all or most of your income for nine months. The cost in mental and physical health has been overwhelming for so many of our citizens. This city has such a well-known reputation for helping the most unfortunate among us. It's in your power to restore the livelihood to our tax-paying businesses to help restore our way of life. If you vote to continue this unnecessary lockdown, the destruction of this healthy, prosperous, and generous city will be in your hands. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Unfortunately, we were unable to get a hold of Nancy, so we will now go to Linda Bonet to be followed by Jim Nell. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Linda Bonet. My family has been in California since 49, 1849. I come from a proud California family. However, now our governor acts like a dictator. He's a hypocritical elitist. He sends his kids to private open schools and closes public schools. His vineyard is open, but has closed down my son's restaurant that just laid him off yesterday. Defy the dictator and follow other California counties and save our children and small businesses. Don't give the small business owners another reason to abandon Santa Barbara and California. They are moving to states that don't have dictators for governors. These states are thriving with common sense policies. When businesses go under, the politicians do as well. There's no taxes to pay for their, them and their ridiculous lockdown decrees, not laws, but decrees. Please recall and defy the dictator and open Santa Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bonet. And unfortunately, we are unable to get a hold of Jim, so we will now go to James Johnson to be followed by Caroline Abate. Okay. All right, am I on, ready to go? We can hear you. Okay, yes, this is James Johnson. I'm a small business owner here in Santa Barbara. And uh, I just wanted to um, call in and, and voice, uh, you know, I think we can look 
at things a little bit differently. Instead of trying to determine what we can't do, I think we should look at things of what we should do. And, and, um, and, and it's pretty clear if we're based on science what we need to be doing. And there's three things I'd like to address. And that would be physical health, mental health, and spiritual health. Right now, our kids, there's people that are actually guarding playgrounds and removing swing sets. And right now is a time where our children, who by science have been proven to be, um, this isn't as a dangerous virus for them, they should be out on the swing sets. There should be people, instead of guarding them and turning people in, there should be people that are cleaning the swing sets or cleaning the playgrounds. Okay. Um, I'm excited about this. I want to see, I have three children. I love, you know, we have a stay at home order. I would like to change that to a stay outside order for my kids. They've had too much time on the computers, too much screen time. And I believe it would be much better for their emotional, uh, mental and physical health to be outside. And that uh, goes along also for our small businesses. This is a time to safely operate using science, using all the things that we're doing. With, and people are doing a great job around town doing that. So we, now's not time to close them down. It's a time to keep them open and let small businesses do smart things to open their doors. You know, I also want to address mental health. Being out. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We will now go to Caroline Abate to be followed by Jim Nell. Okay, thank, thank you. Hello, my name is Caroline Abate, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about opposing the COVID-19 lockdown orders. The national death rate has been steadily dropping from about 5.92% to a low of 1.92% as calculated from the CDC website data. Antibody, antibody studies show that the death rate should be even 10 times lower and be, that's because of asymptomatic cases that have developed immunity. So the death rate would then go from 1.92% to 0.192%, which is in the range of the seasonal flu. As well, a vaccine is being distributed, which will protect the most vulnerable and drive the death rate even lower. Data for the number of total deaths in the United States in 2019 compared to total deaths in 2020 shows that the number of deaths is about the same. In a true pandemic, you would see a huge increase in the number of total deaths in 2020 as compared to 2019. So it seems like we are simply exchanging one cause of death for another, which indicates that while this virus is contagious, it is not lethal enough to justify innocent citizen lockdowns. The complexity of this situation illustrates the need for an educated population. As a school teacher, I am horrified at the irreversible and permanent educational harm being done to kids who are learning in a very suboptimal environment. In fact, we cannot even fully know the long-term educational damage being done. The childhood and young adult learning years are a precious window of time, and you cannot teach or learn extra quickly to make up for lost time. We need... Thank you, Ms. Abate. We will now go to Jim Nell to be followed by Terry Strickland. Good morning. Um, my name is Jim Cannell. Um, 
I don't envy the situation that you find yourself in, but I think listening to <clears throat> after all of the comments I've heard for the last hour, I think you can see that there is a growing unrest with respect to the city, the state, and the county with respect to the politics of shutting our county down. To continue with our as-is program of the shutdown, even with moving Santa Barbara County into tri-counties separate from the Southern California isn't going to solve the problem. The emergency is now. The need is now. The direction you are moving forward under the governor's shutdown is punitive and ill-conceived, especially over the holiday season. The timing of this order is meant to destroy our economy by depriving our merchants who rely on the holiday season sales to survive. If you're interested in the health of our economy, you should also do a risk-benefit analysis for public health. You just can't talk about the risk of spreading a disease. You have to talk about the benefit of keeping restaurants and merchants open. Your decision to continue this lockdown will have devastating will be a devastating blow to our city and county and will be remembered for years to come. During the past 10 months, all merchants have expended a tremendous amount of to adapt and comply and protect the public from COVID-19 pandemic crisis. FEMA Corporation represents over 250 merchants in about 400,000 square feet. Currently, 20% of our merchants are paying full rent. That means that 80% of our merchants are on some level of rent relief. 50% of those on, rev, on rent relief will not. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cannell. We will now go to Terry Strickland to be followed by Carrie Jordan. Hi, this is Terry Strickland. Uh, appreciate your efforts on the letter, but I have to agree with some of the other callers. The letter needs to be stronger. We all know that the governor has cherry-picked which businesses can be open or shut down, and we know this is this is bogus. None, none of it makes sense. We will all agree on that. Uh, asking for this regional debacle to end in three weeks is not enough. Some might say, so it's only three weeks. These three weeks, which was probably going to be longer than that, we all know that, are keeping small businesses shut down during the busiest time of the year for many of them. Many of them are, are never coming back. This is unaccept unacceptable, and I've said this many times before. Also, I, I noticed I got my property tax bill, you know, reminder that it's due in two days. You know, business owners who can't operate their business which is basically a taking, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy. Wouldn't it be funny if all the businesses didn't, they just appealed their property tax and didn't pay it? Um, the letter, you know, I have to agree with the owner of Bouchon Restaurant. It has to be stronger. Santa Barbara County needs to take back our county. You need to take back our county and open it up for your 450,000 citizens. And open the darn schools. Our children and grandchildren are, are the biggest losers in all of this. Um, and, you know, Newsom breaking his own rules is not just hypocritical. He doesn't believe in them either. Let's face the facts. And I just have to say, limiting the time of speakers because you don't, because you think you know what we're going to say, speaks volumes of your opinion of the people that pay your wages the wages you've gotten every week for the last nine months. And many uh, people who are employed in this county have not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strickland. We will now go to Carrie Jordan to be followed by Ren Strong. Hi, this is Carrie Jordan. I'm from Orchid. Um, 
I agree with most of what everybody has, has commented on today. Um, at most, I think, stand up to the governor, open our county. He doesn't believe in, you know, he doesn't practice what he preaches, so why should we? Um, and also agree with the previous speaker about opening the schools. We are damaging our children, and we need to get them back in school and playing sports. And, um, you know, this is, this is going to be some, some damage that we're not going to be able to fix with these young people. So I thank you uh, for letting me comment, um, but I think your letter to the governor needs to say we're not following your order. Uh, again, thank you, and I appreciate all that you guys uh, do. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. <clears throat> we will now go to Ren Strong to be followed by Bonnie Raisin. Okay, so this is to the residents more than who's you see up there. This is Ren Strong, also known as Rennie Dean Strong, like Penny but Rennie, and I'm on YouTube. This is an um, constitutional illegal act that they are doing. This is also called the Great Reset, and if you look it up by Klaus Schwab, okay, this is not a pandemic. This You can call this a flu. It is a strong flu. Um, but it is a pandemic agenda, 21, depopulation program. This is about the, the um, this is about geoengineering our bodies. This is about the robots, the cyborgs, and humans. If you cannot relate to this, I, don't, I can't help you. I can't help you if that's the case. You need to also know that there is a biological effect that is going on with being in front of these, these screens where our children are watching. They're burning out their eyes in this blue light. This 5G technology is a factor in our biology. So these, these fake palm trees or these big things, they have a factor, a factor in our biology. If you want more information, you can find this out by, by checking out other types. I would say do research, but you will really research the first things that come up in Google. So don't do that. Look up, um, how about, um, let's see here. Uh, how about uh, Dr. Bruce Limpton of Lipton Tea? How about Zach Bush? Please replay this. Don't just jump off the, off the ship here that I'm saying. Go back and replay some of these people, what they're saying. I don't want to piggyback, but thank you for who spoke up about this today, who showed up. I've spoken 31 times. Um, it is not a crime to open your businesses. You stay open. But we need to change where we get our food, our Franken food, the GMO glyphosate roundup. That's what we should be testing on. Don't Thank you, Mr. Strong. We will now go to Bonnie Raisin to be followed by Cindy Go. Hello. All righty, go ahead, Bonnie. Okay, I just want to echo the sentiments. It's Bonnie Raisin. I appreciate the opportunity to echo the sentiments and comments of the majority of the speakers who feel that closing down our businesses and other public facilities, including private gyms, would be a severe detriment to the emotional as well as the physical well-being of the majority of our citizens. The statistics in Santa Barbara County do not bear out any kind of severe um, curtailment 
of our normal activities. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm hoping that you make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reason. We will now go to Cindy Go to be followed by Greg Hamill, who is our final speaker. Thank you. I'm, this is Cindy Goff, and I was born and raised in Santa Barbara with my family in the North County, and I just wanted to share my thoughts this morning. Um, I'm connected to many people in the North and the South County, and everyone I'm talking to is watching how you're going to decide on these lockdowns. Are you complying with the violations of the California Constitution? Are you complying with the suppressing of our families and our financial emotional collapse? Or are you going to support the people who voted you in to represent us? And it's our hope that you will be leaders in California and that you will set a standard for healthy communities that can be open and comply with the health uh, issues that we can do, like masks and, and distancing, but opening up our communities. And I'm asking you to please please look at what's going on here and open up our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Goff. And we will now go to Greg Hamill, who is our final speaker. Hi, this is Greg Hamill, and uh, I wanted to speak to this uh, COVID virus, that it is a virus, typical of a virus that we've seen throughout our community in the past, no worse, okay? I'm referring, there's data from the Santa Barbara Public Health Department quarterly report. The most recent report shows that children under the age of 17, there's 105,000 of them in our county, zero have died of COVID. 21 have been hospitalized. People, citizens under the age of 30, which there are 200,000, one person in our county has died under the age of 30. Uh, I can go on, I can go up to under the age of 70, only 38 people have died. This is typical of a seasonal flu. Uh, and this data is in the quarterly report of the county. And I implore the, the letter that we uh, send to Newsom to include this exact data, because Santa Barbara is not LA. This data shows and proves that we are not, we are, do not need a lockdown, that our kids should be in school. Um, and this, the idea that this data has not been publicized is ridiculous. We should have been told this death rate is so low and it is in that county health uh, data. It's so low for people under the age of 70 that it is just a regular virus. And we need to show the real data and not go by the number of cases positive because that can be changed by just increasing the testing. I mean, it's simple statistics and we've lost that. Please put that in your report to do some. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamill, and thank you for everyone who commented. And I apologize for having to shrink the time available, but we're trying to get this letter to the governor as soon as possible so that he can consider the request. Supervisor Adam. Thank you. I'm going to. Uh, read an adaptation of portions of a paper by uh, Solly McLeod in 2007 on the milligram, I'm sorry, milligram experiment. I have made the link to the full paper available on my webpage that is on the Board of Supervisors website. In 1963, Stanley Milgram was interested in researching how far people would go in obeying an instruction if it involved harming another human being. 
Milgram was interested in how easily ordinary people could be influenced into committing atrocities. Volunteers were recruited for a lab experiment in investigating learning. An experimenter dressed in a, in a gray lab coat was played by an actor. At the beginning of the experiment, volunteers were introduced to a third participant who was actually an associate of the experimenter and would act as the learner. Two rooms were used, one for the learner with an electric chair and the other for the volunteer teacher with a fake electric shock generator and the experimenter in the lab coat. The learner was strapped to a chair with the electrodes. After he had studied a list of word pairs, the volunteer teacher tests him by naming a word and asking the learner to recall its partner pair from a list of four possible choices. The teacher is told by the experimenter to administer an electric shock every time the learner makes a mistake, increasing the level of shock each time. There were 30 switches on the shock generator marked from 15 volts, a slight shock, to 450, a dangerously severe shock. The learner gave mainly wrong answers on purpose, and for each of these, the teacher gave him an electric shock. When the teacher refused to administer the shock, the experimenter was given a series of orders, prods, to ensure they continued. There were four prods, and if one was not obeyed, then the experimenter read out the next prod, and so on. The first prod was, please continue. The second was, the experiment requires to continue, you to continue. The third was, it's absolutely essential that you continue. And the fourth was, you have no other choice but to continue. The results were, 65% of volunteer participants continued to the highest level of 450 volts. All, all the participants continued to 300 volts. Milgram carried out 18 variations of his study, altering the situation to see how this affected obedience. The conclusion was that ordinary people are likely to follow orders given by an authority figure even to the extent of killing an innocent human being. Obedience to authority is ingrained in us all. People tend to obey orders from other people if they recognize their authority as morally right and or legally based. This response to legitimate authority is learned in a variety of situations, for example, in the family, school, and workplace. Milgram summed up the article the Perils of Obedience in 1974 by writing, quote, The legal and philosophic aspects of obedience are of an enormous import, but they say very little about how most people behave in concrete situations. I set up a simple example at Yale University to test how much pain an ordinary city, citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to by an experimental scientist. Stark authority was pitted against the volunteers' strongest moral imperatives against hurting others. And with the volunteers' ears ringing with the screams of the victims, authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Colleagues, we are the subject of this experiment now. We can hear the screams of our citizens. Will we be the 65% of subjects who continue to administer pain because we are told by authority figures that we have no other choice but to continue? Or will we be the 35% who refuse? I understand that there are some risks associated with taking more dramatic action, but I have been Objecting to this management strategy from the very beginning, I think we should refuse to comply with these mandates. I think under the circumstances where our death statistics are really no different than the flu, it has become patently unreasonable to support and enforce those unreasonable draconian lockdown measures. At some point, somebody has to say, 
enough is enough, and it should be us now. Currently, Florida schools and businesses are open, and there's no statewide mask mandate. According to Florida's online dashboard, they have 80% of their hospital beds open. We should follow suit. We shouldn't be lumped in with any other county. We have a region. It's called a county. Some of our speakers said we should defy this mandate, and I agree. I don't know what the power of the County Board of Supervisors is to command public health not to enforce the, the state mandates, but the optics, I think, would be beneficial. Let the governor make an overt threat to us in writing. Let the governor try to punish us. I'm interested to hear what my colleagues have to say. Thank you, Supervisor Adam. Are there other comments from board members? Mr. Chair. Supervisor Lavadino. Yeah, I, and I appreciate um, your, um, your guidance as, uh, as chair to be able to, you know, open it up a little bit more so that people had the chance to have their voice heard. I, I, uh, I thought you made the right decision and go into one minute and then, uh, and I thought you made the right decision to change it up and go to two minutes. So, uh, appreciate that. Um, for me, it's just some of the names that, that I heard during public comment are the, the names that, um, are establishments that everybody here in Santa Maria knows and has been going to for 20, 30, 40 years. And it's heartbreaking to hear the stories of business owners, um, especially our ro restaurant owners. Um, the hurdles everybody has had to jump over, uh, the ever-changing goalposts. And I think what's most damaging to all of this is the hypocrisy of some elected officials here in California and across the country who have preached one thing and then done exactly the opposite. Um, I think the residents of this county have done an outstanding job. They've listened to the public health officer. I remember back in the spring, we were talking about flattening the curve. Everybody stayed home. Then we ventured out. We followed the directives through the summer and the fall. And they're simply asking us to follow what our own numbers tell us, that we have the capacity to continue working through the purple tier restrictions. Um, I do support the letter. Uh, I would like to see the one, the one change that, that I have an issue with is the fact that we're waiting. We're basically asking to, uh, come out of, um, the three week period as a unit where, um, and I know our public health officer has told us, well, the decision's already been made that we went in as a whole as this unit and we need, you know, the only change that we can make is that we exit as a different unit. Um, I don't know why that's cast in stone. I mean, you know, the numbers are the numbers. I think we have our, uh, I think we're on the right side of this, that our letters should be expressing to the governor that we do not belong in the Southern California region, that we belong either, as Supervisor Adams said, in our own region, um, or that we, you know, have our neighboring counties, which gives us the population and the ICU uh, capacity that in case we did run into some issues that we've got, um, we've got the ability to deal with that. So uh, one question I did have uh, was whether or not that we have contacted our hospitals and to see if that they would join with us on this letter or how do they perceive this um, moving forward. So those are my comments. Thank you, Supervisor Lavanino. Supervisor uh, Hartman. Uh, yes, uh, I agree. I'm, I'm agreed with the one minute, and I'm very, very glad that you extended it to two minutes, Chair Hart, uh, because we heard a cry of desperation and pain and anguish in our community. I am particularly uh, struck by one, uh, one sentence in our letter. It's highly problematic to have us join the larger region when our communities have diligently complied with state and local health officer orders since the beginning of the pandemic. You know, other rural areas experience, didn't have much and then they had a big surge, but our, we've had um, compliance and support by our population and it's as if we're being punished 
um, for for having behaved well, and so I I very much support that sentiment being described. I um, my my question is really this: um, I I'm the slides that we showed on page eighteen were a list of state financial assistance information, but sometimes that is really hard especially for small businesses, especially in desperate straits, to try to navigate. I, I know we have our Workforce Development Board. In times of emergencies, we've had local assistance centers. So my question is, what more can we as a county do to help small businesses? I had a, an email from Risa Georgie saying she's heard from people who have just one or two employees and they're, they can't get loans, they need grants. Uh, we believe that we'll see something from the federal government soon in a relief package. The governor has stepped up with, with a number of new programs, but how do we help people uh, navigate what is very, very complicated? And so I would like to see us do more in that regard. Supervisor Williams. Well, I, I feel like there is a, a tendency in this day and age, and I, I think maybe it's partially because of how stressful the pandemic has been for um, all of us and the public. Uh, I feel like sometimes there is a, uh, a tendency for folks who are concerned about the real um, uh, well, I'll start with, I feel like some folks undervalue the real health impact of, of COVID because they are focused on the health impact of you know, unemployment and closed schools and closed businesses. And on the other side, I feel like some people undervalue the, the health, health impact of massive unemployment and, and uh, kids um, without parental supervision and uh, screen time and without exercise. Um, and of course in poverty, because they're so focused on what's a very real public health impact of COVID. And, and I think that it's our job to um, balance and maximize the public health value of all those factors. And so I, I, I just plead with the public that maintain your empathy, maintain um, towards, towards all folks who are suffering through this on, on whether it's because they've lost a, lot, a loved one or because they've lost a job um, or their kids aren't in school. Um, but I think that's our job, is to maximize all those. And I think um, for me, that means we remain vigilant on COVID with mask wearing and tackling growth in certain demographics or sectors. But it also means that we uh, come out from the shutdown order uh, as soon as we, you know, we as a real region pass the metrics. And I believe that a region that is constituted of, constituted of Ventura, Santa Barbara, and Slow Counties makes a whole lot more sense than a region that includes counties. By the way, some of those counties have very high utilization rates of ICU beds on a normal basis, not e even without COVID as a factor. And so um, it, to me, it does not make, it, it, does not make it um, a safer to group us in artificially with folks who might, might have an 80% utilization of ICU beds during this time of year, even if they didn't have COVID. Um, so I, I think that public health is on the right course to ask for this region. I, I urge the public that, you know, um, we have to balance all these concerns and let's try to get through these troubled times together. Um, keep on wearing masks, keep on uh, social distancing, um, keep on being wise about our individual actions um, and, um, but also do our best uh, to enable our kids to be at school, 
our, our businesses to survive um, and people to be able to work. Thank you, Supervisor Williams. Um, to me, the public comment was compelling and um, heart rendering and wrenching and uh, the pain and suffering that people are going through and the trauma to their lives is real and significant. And it gives me great urgency, great sense of urgency that we move forward as fast as possible to get this letter to the governor and to make the best possible case we can that our circumstances um, deserve a different approach. And um, I think that staff has done a great job of making that case. It's up to all of us to um, use all of our contacts to lobby the governor and be as aggressive as we possibly can. But the first step we need to take is to get this letter approved so we can send it. And so with that, is would somebody like to make a motion? I'd like to move staff recommendation of sending the letter. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? There is. Supervisor Lavanino. Well, I'd kind of like to know what our strategy is going to be. I mean, I know it's 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 good to send a letter. Um, that's the first step. But I mean, are we how aggressively are we pursuing this? Um, you know, I, I think there are things that we could actually do. I know Supervisor Williams has many contacts still at the state capitol. Um, you know, we've got lobbyists. Uh, I'm sure we're going to be contacting them. But isn't there a way that we could? Um, you know, there's a lot of community support out there, and I think maybe if the governor hearing from five members of the Board of Supervisors is nice, uh, but maybe if he heard from, you know, 50,000 of our residents as well, um, it might carry a little more weight. So I'm just kind of curious if there's a way that we can kind of focus this energy, um, but I, I, you know, yeah, I'd just I, like to I, know I mean, what the I strategy is. I don't disagree that the public should contact the governor. I would recommend it being a little more diplomatic, um, you know, uh, but, but I, I think that um, uh, we have a system where uh, the people have an avenue to be heard and we should use those avenues. I will tell you that um, this was a discussion topic, uh, uh, you know, briefly in uh, our, our deliberations yesterday, we just let our lobbyists know um, that uh, this letter um, was being prepared. Um, we took no formal action um, to be compliant with the Brown Act, but we did let our, our lobbyists know that this letter was being um, drafted and issued. Uh, and uh, I will that, that I can tell you as your CSAC rep, I've been in contact with various other supervisors. Uh, the Board of Supervisors in Ventura just passed this uh, essentially the same letter as ours um, um, just a few minutes ago by a 5-0 vote. Um, so I think, number one, it, it makes sense to track with Ventura and slow, um, uh, you know, uh, and number two, it, it makes sense uh, to uh, continue to speak to um, through, uh, you know, collective action between supervisors. I can tell you that even um, the more populous counties in Southern California, at least the reps on um, our CSAC chain from those counties um, seem to feel like this grouping is really foolish uh, and don't see any advantage of being grouped with us even though we have better ICU capacity because frankly we're so small in terms of our total ICU capacity compared to them that it really almost makes no sense that we're lumped together. Well, I appreciate that, and I'd, I'd like to see, um, whether it's through our CEO's office or maybe Supervisor Williams, that uh, somebody coordinates with Ventura County and SLO so that we are seen as one unified voice that can make this appeal together. CEO Miyasato. Chair Hart and Supervisors, absolutely. As, as uh, Supervisor Williams said, Ventura County passed. Um, this just moments ago at their board, we will, and we know the chambers are coordinated, our um, South Coast Combined Chamber and the Santa Maria Chamber. And I was just talking to Ms. Nisage if there's a way, I've done this in another county where we can provide an email address and a website for, of ours and people can submit to us and we will forward on to the governor. That might be another way to do it. And we can share that same messaging with our partners in Slow and Ventura. Yeah, I think the key is. I think that's to, awesome. Thank you, yeah. Supervisor Lavanino. And in your question about 
Whether the hospitals have been asked to support our letter to the governor, I think we will for sure do that if that hasn't already happened. I know there's been a very close collaboration with, with um, all of our partners to this point. And the key to be effective in, in making this request to the governor is to maintain our unanimity between the three counties and the three, you know, the approach. If we're going to have different splintered asks, we're going to decrease the effectiveness of what we are trying to do collectively. And there's a great temptation to tweak and, um, and customize you know, what we might be asking, but there is strength in numbers and a unified message. So um, are there other questions or comments? Well, Supervisor Super Hartman had a question yeah. about what we can do to help local businesses you know we can we could pass the letter and then we can continue our discussion um or we can you know whatever the board prefers Super well I, I since uh you brought up the, the the question about splintering i will I'll, I'll tell you this that i will support the letter uh now that i know that ventura county san luis and and, and we are moving forward and i'm comfortable that with um ceo miyasato um, kind of being the spearhead point of this and also providing the, the public an avenue to be able to also let the governor know how we feel. I'm comfortable signing off on the letter, but I will say that in in that three week period, if we get to a point where, I mean, if we don't hear back from the governor or um, he denies our request and leaves us in the SoCal region, um, you know, obviously we're going to have to come back, regroup and come back with another strategy that um, is going to be decidedly different than the one we're taking today. Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor Adam. That is a really good question. How long are we going to wait uh, on on an answer? I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how long it's going to take. I, I, you know, I, there, are, there are many well, things. Well, if we wait three weeks, well, if we wait three weeks, then uh, it, it won't do any good. So I think we have to push uh, some kind of a of a put a deadline in that thing of uh you know time is of the essence three or four days and we have, I a, could, we have I another board meeting next week scheduled agree and if need be we'll have a special meeting um, and chair hart and supervisors um our public health officers through all three counties all the counties have conversations with dr pan who is the state's public health officer she will have received this letter and we will and they've um and just to let you know our public health officer um, and Dr. Dovernos had lobbied the state before when they found that we were going to be put in this region and very vocally opposed it. So just to let you know that they did that previously and they will continue to do that and we can ask for an update next week. And before you vote on the letter, I just want to say there is a line in there. We will update the information. We gave the ICA rates as of December 4th. We will update it as of today and the ICA routes, we actually have 32% capacity available. So that will be updated in the letter. Thank you for that clarification. All right, we do, we do have a motion, right? We had a motion to approve the letter. I I'm, I'm made the motion to okay. approve the letter, and I guess I would uh, uh, also uh, receive and file the report. Okay, and then um, I guess let's just finish up with Supervisor Hartman's uh, question about, okay, as long as we're not being done with this, this item. So uh, would anybody like to add anything before we vote on the letter? All right, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam. Aye. Mr. Lavanino. Aye. Mr. Williams. Aye. Ms. Hartman. Aye. Chair Hart. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And then to Supervisor Hartman's question about is there anything we can do in addition to what we have been doing to um, help businesses navigate the complex process of assistance, public assistance programs? And. If I may, this may be something that has to come back next week, but we could ask that uh, we explore that. So, uh, Supervisor Hartman, through the chair, thank you so much. That's exactly what I was thinking we can do. I can regroup with um, Workforce Development Board uh, and bring that information that's local, because there's some organizations, um, I know um, Santa Barbara Foundation, uh, Weave, and those local folks, see what they have available. There was a lot at the beginning. Uh, of course, a lot of that has already been expended, so we'll regroup and see what's available locally and present that. I know it's in different places, but um, we'll pull that together. And again, what, what the governor just announced as far as what's available by the state, and then putting something in place so that 
if we do get a federal relief package, we're ready to pounce. Very good. Thank you, Supervisor Hartman. And um, if that is the last comment or question on this item, um, do we have anything else in the recommended actions? No, I don't think so. Okay, so that concludes item D1. Let's um, get through D2. I know we have people um, waiting on the phone for quite some time to talk about our legislative advocacy, and then we'll take a break after that. So, um, Madam Clerk, would you please read item D2 into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number two is from the county executive office. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding an update on legislative advocacy and the adoption of the 2021 legislative platform. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, this is my item. So this is um, an annual presentation uh, that's made to your board about this time uh, that presents our platform, our legislative platform that, uh, that we use to advocate for the county um, throughout the year. Uh, so we actually have um, an update both from our federal and state advocates and we will jump right into that and start with uh, our federal, federal accomplishments and updates from Don Gilchrist from Thomas Walters and Associates. Welcome, Mr. Gilchrist. It's nice to see you virtually and hear you. Thank you very much. And uh, just want to say hello to everybody, Chair Hart and members of the board. Don Gilchrist with Thomas Walters and Associates. And I appreciate the chance to talk with you about your federal advocacy program. Uh, throughout the year, we have lobbied your federal platform with Congress and the administration. And of course, this effort really took on a greater sense of urgency with the COVID-19 pandemic which has severely disrupted things, both at the county operations, but also in the federal legislative process. There has been a significant federal response through executive orders and legislation. Uh, we've seen uh, assistance go out through FEMA's disaster programs and virtually every other federal program and agency that there is. At the same time, we're continuing to carry the message to Washington, DC, that there is an urgent need for additional assistance and that this must be accomplished before the end of the year. Uh, there have been four main pandemic relief packages that were enacted, most notably the CARES Act back in March, which included a significant amount of assistance for public health. There was a lot of assistance that went out to businesses and individuals who were suffering from the economic downturn. And there was a the coronavirus relief fund, which provided direct payments to states and local governments for fiscal relief. Our local delegation in the House and Senate has been extremely diligent in pursuing this assistance. And I really want to underline that the responsiveness of folks that we've been working with has been tremendous. And now we are in the final weeks of a lame duck Congress, hoping that we can enact a fifth pandemic relief a legislative package which will include direct payments to the County of San Diego. We seem to be inching forward in this effort. Uh, bipartisan support is coalescing around a $900 billion package that was proposed by rank and file members of the House and Senate, including our own representative, Congressman Salud Carbajal. Uh, this package is really being described as an interim step to get us through the next couple of months. We expect to see details of what is in the $900 billion to be released in the next day or two. But we have some really good conceptual uh, general information. We know that there will be additional unemployment, expanded unemployment benefits of $300 a week. There will be another round of SBA loans through the Paycheck Protection Program. There is going to be included proposals to help restaurants, to help education, to help the different transportation modes. And importantly for us, there is a $160 billion pot of money set aside for state and local assistance. Now, again, we don't know the details of how this would be allocated if it were enacted. But this is still a very significant step on an issue that's of importance to us. Uh, none, uh, this is far from a done deal. There's still opposition to this package and Senate 
Majority Leader McConnell is uh, continuing to say he would prefer a smaller package and is working behind the scenes to negotiate something like that. But there is uh, optimism that this can be pulled together here in the lame duck Congress. And we still have ways to go, but we're continuing to work on that. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to touch on what we could expect next year in 2021. Many of our issues are going to carry over. Uh, first and foremost would be pandemic relief, regardless of what happens in the lame duck session, we're gonna be back asking for more assistance in January. I think this will take on uh, a greater economic recovery uh, cast, and there'll be a lot of proposals that will be uh, kicking around regarding uh, federal efforts to stimulate the economy. We're gonna to continue to see uh, an emphasis on mitigating climate change, especially in the House of Representatives, promoting green energy, uh, promoting resilience for our infrastructure uh, will be a big theme. And I think in both the House and the Senate and in the Biden administration, we're going to see a desire to have a significant infrastructure package. Transportation programs will be at the core of that, but this will probably, as we saw in the House of Representatives this year, be uh, enlarged in order to include uh, infrastructure from uh, broadband to hospitals to uh, whatever, and, and a desire to see economic stimulus, but also to see the economy transform through updating our national infrastructure. So we, we will have uh, quite a bit to do next year. I look forward to continuing to work with you and on your behalf uh, in Washington, DC to implement this uh, platform that you'll adopt. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Thank you, Mr. Gilchrist, for the timely update. All those things are top of mind, as you can see from our discussion earlier today. Are there questions for Mr. Gilchrist? No, I, I have the pleasure of serving on the Legislative Program Committee, so I get to ask him a question every other month. So I'm out of my allotment. <laughs> Thank you for that. Supervisor Hartman. Thank you. I serve on the Legislative Committee as well, and I always have questions. Uh, with COVID, we realize that we don't have uh, manufacturing capacity to meet needs for emergencies like PPE or um, respirators. Is that considered part of the infrastructure bill, or where would that be considered in the upcoming legislative session? I think that would be most likely to be uh, handled by a pandemic relief package. Um, there, the federal government can appropriate funding for these things. And a lot of the pandemic relief has, um, has been in the form of supplemental emergency pro appropriations, sometimes for programs that currently exist, uh, such as through HUD and Department of Transportation, but also with programs that had to be created uh, out of thin air healthcare provider relief, coronavirus relief fund, and things like that. So I think initially there will be a, a focus on additional supplemental appropriations. Uh, addressing the, uh, the other side of it of, of uh, providing assistance to actually construct the manufacturing would probably come later if, if Congress were to address that at all. Thank you, Mr. Gilchrist. Are there other questions for Don? Well, thank you. Then I guess we'll go next thank you. to Mr. Berg. Mr. Berg, are you there on Zoom? Hey, I am just ch being challenged by my, excuse me, by my mouse pad. So, I should have um, just assumed that that's the Zoom transition <laughs> problem we all struggle with. So thank you for being patient. Thank you. Hey, uh, well, greetings from Sacramento, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, continuing my technological challenges, my desktop computer uh, picture has frozen. I'm glad it froze on a smiling Cliff Berg versus the scowling or unhappy Cliff Berg. Um, so you have my smiling face frozen, um, and I apologize. Um, you know, briefly uh, to recap uh, the year, uh, the 
2019-2020 two-year legislative session um, concluded August 31st when the legislature adjourned Sinai Dai. Um, the new legislative session actually started yesterday, uh, December 7th, when new members of the legislature were sworn in. Um, the just concluded uh, legislative session started in January when the legislature began the second year of a two-year session. I know January seems long ago and far away, um, and it's with certainly a different, uh, different world in January when the legislature came back and the governor proposed a state budget. The budget he proposed in January forecasts a $10 billion state surplus uh, with modest program expansions in educa education, child care, affordable housing, and homeless programs, to mention just a few. Uh, by February of this year, thousands of bills were introduced and hearings set for March on both budget and legislation. Mid-March, uh, the world changed dramatically in California and particularly in Sacramento as well in Santa as in Santa Barbara. The governor ordered his shelter at home order. The legislature passed four emergency bills in one night, giving the governor authority to spend on an emergency basis up to $10 billion and pandemic response and left Sacramento and did not return to nearly mid-May and also set a pattern for this year's legislative session. And both the Senate and Assembly could not agree on a return date. Um, when they came back to Sacramento, physically the state capitol was limited in terms of both public access and legislative access to the building uh, due to public safety and pandemic concerns. And given the last two months when policy committees normally meet, the legislature was forced by the pandemic to dramatically curtail committee hearings. There were only two, one committee hearing room in each house that were physically large enough to hold a legislative committee hearing. So uh, adopting uh, procedures on the fly, they added both the Senate and the assembly chamber as a place to hear bills and conduct committee business. But uh, each committee, basically was limited to one committee hearing and all the bills introduced. Leadership in both houses told the members to drop most of their bills that were non-pandemic related and uh, curtailed, committee, pol committee chairs curtailed the number of bills that could be heard. Um, the legislature took a brief summer recess, again, returned on different dates, couldn't agree on a return date. The houses were hit by members being diagnosed with uh, positive tests for COVID and had to delay their return, wound up in August dealing with this very limited number of bills, remaining budget issues, um, and broke for the rest of the year on the constitutional date of August 31st after dealing with a number of COVID-related get and amend bills at the end of the session. If you look at the list of accomplishments that um, you see at the state level, obviously you, you once again, in January, many of these issues did not exist. The biggest issues in terms of uh, impacting the county. Uh, we had to work uh, throughout uh, the spring on convincing the governor and the, the administration to pass on to counties under 500,000 CARES Act relief. Um, the original federal CARES Act uh, relief package provided relief to counties over 500,000 but really left it to the state to determine what to do in terms of additional distribution of funds to counties under 500,000 and the administration for a number of months refused to make any kind of commitment to counties under 500,000. Our legislators ramped up their efforts and uh, through a number of oversight hearings lobbying the administration the governor finally provided um, CARES Act funding relief for counties under 500,000 in the May revise of which you can see apparently Santa Barbara County get, will get roughly um, 6.5 million. Um, another another um, major issue for uh, the county was distribution of realignment funds, um, realignment uh, losses in, in tax revenues as a result of the the COVID emergency uh, was not included in the governor's May revise and we had to work um, to get that included as part of the final budget deal during the summer. Um, we were able to get a total of roughly $1 billion for 
for local government realignment relief. Uh, in that deal, part of that was subject to a trigger tied to an another federal relief package, which did not happen on October 15th. Um, so the total amount provided was $750 million uh, for counties generally. Another issue that we worked on for the county was what we call 340B funding, which was in essence a result of a governor's executive order two years ago to change the way the pharmaceuticals are funded in the state for healthcare programs. Santa Barbara County is uniquely situated in using that money for its clinics and programs, especially programs provided by our public health clinics in the county. Uh, we actually started working on this, uh, I think in the fall of 2000, in 19, when we did a series of meetings with the administration, both the governor's office, the health and welfare agency, and the State Department of Health to make a pitch to provide a backfill uh, for 340B potential losses to the county. Uh, we succeeded in convincing the governor to include that backfill in the January budget proposal. It came out in the May revise after um, the projected $40 billion state deficit uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, we redoubled our efforts in the legislature and got it restored in the legislative uh, overview of the governor's budget and were able to convince the governor and the legislature to include it in the final legislative deal um, that was enacted by the uh, June 15th constitutional deadline. Uh, we continue to work, however, with the administration on ensuring that the distribution formula adopted uh, is fair to the county. Um, the language in the budget did not contain an actual distribution formula, and that has been a subject of an ongoing effort of a work group appointed by the administration, of which Santa Barbara County has been the only governmental entity that has been part of that work group, and we're continuing to wait for final word on what the distribution formula might be. B, the initial proposal would have resulted in approximately $500,000 in backfill to the county, whereas our potential loss is $4.2 million. We are, were pleased to learn, however, that the uh, governor has delayed implementation of his executive order by three months minimum at this point, which gives us a little bit more time to continue to work on it. Um, you can see some of the other highlights, uh, interesting um, number of bills or diverse number of bills and different issues from um, penalties for oil spill discharges for intentional violations to defeating attempts to overregulate regulate um, camps and uh, related uh, recreational facilities that would have resulted in substantial costs to the county public health department to defeating and last last days of the legislative session attempts to strip local government of their ability to uh, negotiate opioid settlements with opioid manufacturers, an attempt by the attorney general to take over those negotiations and control the potential sett settlement funds. Looking forward to next year, there continue to be obviously from your discussion earlier today, a substantial number of COVID related issues that uh, are both new as a result of the current shelter at home order and will continue to emerge um, as well as economic recovery. We are facing probably another round of both negotiations. So we're passing through CARES Act funding, assuming the federal government does approve a package when and if, as well as continuing to deal with potential revenue losses through another round of real realignment negotiations in the upcoming year. Um, yesterday was the first day for bill introduction in the new legislative session, we already saw a number of bills introduced on evictions, on broadband, on infrastructure. Um, we continue to see the state immersed in discussions over delivery of unemployment insurance to Californians in a timely manner without fraud. Um, so we expect to see a substantial number of issues that we worked on in the past year continue into next year and look forward to working with you on that. So thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Are there questions for Cliff? No, just, uh, I think Cliff was listening during our deliberation. So I think Mr. Lavanino's intent to make sure our lobbyist is up to breast, uh, is abreast on some of the concerns in the community. Um, I think that was useful. 
Yeah, well, very, very much so. We had a good discussion in the Ledge Committee yesterday, as I think Supervisor Williams mentioned, and look forward to working with your team on, on you know, being as effective as we can in, in getting this issue brought to the attention of the governor. Thank you, Mr. Berg, and appreciate you being um, on the line for that previous discussion. That really helps shorten the the communication um, and get get us going. I, I know I signed the letter and uh, folks are sending it or have probably already sent it um, to the governor and you'll be getting copies soon. Thank are there, you. Are there other questions or um, comments? I just wanna say how much I appreciate the excellent work of both Mr. Gilchrist and Mr. Berg. They're uh, critically important allies in our work with our federal and state government partners. We're really fortunate to have incredibly hardworking, um, conscientious, and effective um, state and federal representatives. Congressman Carbajal certainly knows the county really well and is a great advocate for us in Washington. And um, Senator Jackson, we recognized earlier today for her incredible work. We're really fortunate to have had her representation. And um, Assembly Members Lamone and Cunningham will continue to serve us. And now we have um, su uh, Supervisor Steve Bennett, who will be our representative in the State Assembly um, as uh, Assembly Member Lamone moves on to this, the California State Senate. So we're, we have a great legislative team. We have some great advocates. And um, this is a really comprehensive thoughtful legislative platform. Is there a motion to adopt it? So moved. Motion's been made. Second. And seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes, I would, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislative platform puts down our positions as a county for issues we know about, things we're working on. As new issues come back, it comes to the board and then we give additional direction. So this, and just so the public understands, this provides the basis for us to write letters and our chair to sign the letters and, and to get it a uh, lobbying effort on the part of our advocates. So, um, but it doesn't mean that we're, it's, it's bound, uh, we're bound by this, we can add to it as we go forward, but it just requires coming back to the board. Thank you, Supervisor Hartman for that clarification. Any other comments? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Abstain. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes four to one with one abstention. Okay, we're going to recess for lunch and then reconvene. Um, what is the board's preference? What time long would we like to break? Short, because we got a lot of business. All right, let's come back at a um, little after 1, 1.05. I guess make it a half an hour break, and we'll come back at 1.05.
We are now reconvening the Board of Supervisors meeting of December 8th, 2020. And the next item on our agenda is departmental item number three. Madam Clerk, could you please read that item into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number three is from Planning and Development. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding proposed amendments to the County Land Use and Development Code, Code LUDC, and Montecito LUDC for telecommunications facilities a pertinent to natural gas distribution facilities. Ms. Plowman, welcome. Mr. Clemen, thanks for being here both. And Ms. Uh, Whitney, too. Oh, no, Hi. Evil Sizer. Um, uh, so, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair, it's, it's Selena. You can't tell who's Evil Sizer, anymore. yes. <laughs> it's um, Evil Sizer Whitney. I got married, but I haven't changed my name yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll update that for next uh, one. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so this item is uh, amendments that SoCal Gas has sponsored to our ordinances to allow them to use their uh, install their canned antennas with a simpler permit process. This allows them to do remote meter reading. Um, so this has gone to the Planning Commission and now is before the board. And um, Selena Abelsizer and Dan Clement are here. We also have, um, is it Alan or Dave? Alan? We also have Alan Bell, our supervising planner, who's available by Zoom uh, to answer any questions. Um, Ms. Evelsager, would you like to start? Uh, sure, thank you, Chair and board members. The county actually hired Wood Environmental um, and Infrastructure um, firm to help us with, and SoCal Gas with this project. So Matt Bogart will be presenting um, on Zoom. So I'll turn it over to Matt. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Hart, members of the board. My name is Matthew Buggert. As Lena said, I'm a planning consultant with Wood Environment and Infrastructure. I've been working with the county and SoCal Gas on this project for the past two years. We're here today presenting on proposed amendments to the county and Montecito land use and development codes for telecommunication facilities that support the county's natural gas distribution facilities. Yes. and can advance the slide. In early 2016, I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? We can now, but I think we lost you for a bit. Maybe you could start back could the you beginning. Start over. Okay, I'm going to turn off my video just. There you go. That that's always works, doesn't it? The turn yes. off, turn on to... strategy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just turn off my video for this presentation just for my internet connection. But anyways. Um, is this better now? I apologize. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Buggert. I'm a planning consultant with Wood Environment and Infrastructure. Been working with the county and SoCal Gas on this project for the past two years. We are here to, today presenting on proposed amendments to the county and Montecito land use and development codes for telecommunications facilities that support the county's natural gas distribution facilities. Next slide. We may have lost you again because I'm not hearing anything. Matt, are you able to hear us? I, I can hear you guys, yes. 
now we can hear you when you answer that question, but prior to that, we weren't getting any audio. I am going to try calling into Zoom. I sincerely apologize. That's all right. No worries. And Chair Hart, members of the board, I would just like to let um, Mr. Buggert know that that phone number should be on your original Zoom invitation as well. I may have been joined as an attendee. We hear you now, and so I think you're in. But we'll, okay. we'll also make that change on Zoom, too. So when that's done, you are in. <clears throat> yes, Chair Hart and members of the board, um, I am now asking the caller to unmute. So I believe that is Matt. Mr. Bugger, if you can hear me, can you unmute your phone? Mr. Chair, can, can I move approval? <laughs> Second. <laughs> well, that's, that's showing a trend. I, um, I apologize. He's, I think we're that close to being to your, to your motion, but. Uh, or while he's. But if there's issues, we could go to public comment first. Okay, that's another idea too. Do we Mr. have Chair, folks? Mr. Chair? Yes. Our staff, uh, Selena Avelsizer, could do the presentation for Matt if given the we're having te technical difficulties. If okay. However, we want to solve the problem. I'm open to many solutions. Does somebody pick one? And <clears throat> Mr. Bugger, if you restart your computer, that also might help. I'm not sure if you've done that today. I see Mr. Mahoney is also here on Zoom. If he wants to give a 40,000 foot presentation, he can do that as well. Mr. Mahoney, welcome. Why don't you just sort of set the stage for us while we're... I... <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, uh, I hope everyone can hear me now. We can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, uh, SoCal Gas does have a presentation. I don't know if you want to uh, cue that up now, Mr. Chairman, or I could just fill in here while uh, Matthew is uh, getting his presentation loaded, certainly willing to do that as well. So uh, Southern California Gas Company, we have our advanced meter program. This is where we read the your gas meter and my gas meter wirelessly through uh, uh, like a, a telecommunications cell phone technology, if you will. The individual meters have already been uh, fitted for this. The old base plate on a meter where the dials are. Oh, there we go. Here's my presentation. Uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so why are we doing this? Uh, safety is a top priority at the gas company and the advanced meter program allows this to happen. We can detect abnormal uses in, in gas uh, in a much faster way than we could before. Prior to this, you had to wait for a 30 day billing cycle, but with this kind of uh, fast technology, we can see abnormal gas usage in days rather than the weeks. So if there's leaks or somebody la leaves a home and leaves a pool heater on, we can detect this uh, unusual abnormal gas usage. So also uh, lo locally here, of course, with uh, wild fires and mudslides, all this helps monitor the pipeline pressure and the activity of the pipeline through this wireless communications that we have. So it will help identify and safety benefits. Likewise, in the environmental area, 
you will no longer have meter readers coming to your home or your business reading the meters. So we're taking off a thousand trucks and reducing the amount of miles that are driven. And that uh, totals up to be about 6.3 million miles that won't be driven every year uh, by the meter readers. Now, um, I think it's interesting and important to note that the meter readers have been reincorporated, if you will, into the gas company in another variety of positions. So uh, we worked with our employees and the unions and we, we actually lost no people. If people wanted to, meter readers wanted to have a job in the gas company, they were able to find another one. Now, the advanced meter program has been going on with the gas company for a number of years. Uh, Santa Barbara County is the last county to uh, be uh, without the advanced meters. Uh, coincidentally, in the uh, all of the incorporated cities in the counties, you know, starting out at Carpinteria in the south and going all the way up to Santa Maria, all the incorporated cities uh, today do have advanced meter capability and are enjoying the benefits of this. And we're looking forward to having our our county. Uh, customers and our, our friends and families in the county also have this. Ne next slide, please. So a little bit of background. We've been working at this uh, for the last several years. Uh, thank you to county staff and Wood to uh, have this process moving forward. We've been to the Architectural Board of Reviews. We've been to the Montecito Planning Commission, the whole County Planning Commission, and now at the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we've also talked to the Montecito Association and other groups like that. So uh, uh, very excited today and appreciate uh, Supervisor Adams willing to pass the motion right away. I'm looking forward to when we finally get to hear those words in the vote. Next slide, please. I'm changing my mind, Tim. The, the longer you talk, the more I'm closer to changing my mind. <laughs> All right, hang on there. Hold that thought. Uh, so I talked about how it works. Okay, so you got the gas meter there. That sends a signal out four times a day. It's a nanosecond. Boom. It goes off in the blink of an eye to the data collection units, which are the pole mounted items that we're talking about today. Then that, that uh, information is encrypted. It's important fact. Encrypted information goes to SoCal Gas, and then we can use it for the billing the customers can access the online accounts, you get alerts, the mobile app, and we can detect any abnormal usage. So that's a real benefit there, kind of laid out in four panels. And next slide. Okay, so uh, outreach efforts. I know this is going to be important to people. We do contact a lot of folks uh, on the way to putting in the units. Uh, we have an extensive outreach program that we talk to the neighbors and the concerned folks. As I mentioned, we went to the bars and the Montecito Association. We're working with the Montecito Water District for co-locations. And then we will uh, contact all the customers within a 300 foot radius. This is door to door activity. Um, you know, with COVID, it, it's gonna be a, a little bit different, but we're gonna manage this. And then we work with the property owners, the customers to ensure that where the pole and the DS data collection unit is mounted is acceptable to everyone. And like I say, we've done this uh, in, in all the incorporated cities in the county and, and really have been very successful working with our customers. The next slide. So here's kind of a, uh, a map uh, of the county broken into the supervisorial districts. Now these are not exact pinpoint locations, but they are good approximations of where things will be. Obviously the dots uh, re represent the data collection units and they are clustered around where the population centers are because they do read the meters. And next slide. So what do they look like? <clears throat> Here's a co-location on an existing street light in Goleta. You've got the existing street lamp and the street light there overhead. Uh, that DCU is a small box uh, that is attached to the uh, pole there. And then on top of that, we have the antennas to uh, receive and send the encrypted uh, meter reading to get the gas usage. You can really uh, barely see it. We do our best to incorporate these in areas where there's a background of trees. And so they kind of blend in with the neighborhood. We can use a concrete pole, a wooden pole and a steel pole. Uh, next slide. 
So here, here's another one uh, in, in Goleta. This is a freestanding pole, about 25 feet tall. Uh, as you can see, there are no overhead wires going to the DCU pole. And there's nothing, there's no conduit running down the pole either. So it's a very sleek design, fits in. You've got the uh, box there. This one has a solar panel that was missing on the other one because we co-located it on a street pole, street light, and we could use the uh, electricity for that pole. So this one has a small solar panel on top and the antennas there are the same. You know, I believe that's our last slide, but let's, let's see, can you, well, oh yeah, there you go, thank you. Thank you. Answering. With me today is uh, Gary Wilcox, uh, Dave Mercer, and Al Vasquez to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mahoney. You did an excellent job with the PowerPoint. Um, do we need to cycle back to the staff presentation, or is that? Mr. Chair, members of the board, it is working, and we could do the staff presentation. I think it's important too, because there's, uh, I think, an issue that you need to be made aware of about a recommendation that came from the Montecito Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. Mr. Buggard? Mr. Buggert there? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Wonderful. For this presentation, we can start on slide two, I suppose. In early 2016, SoCal Gas presented to the county on this project, which resulted in direction from the Board of Supervisors to create amendments that would exempt these specific natural gas telecommunications facilities from the telecommunications provisions in both the county and Montecito land use and development codes. The amendment applies solely to telecommunications facilities associated with natural gas that are intended for the utility safety and operations. The ordinance would not apply to any other telecommunications facilities or projects. This project comes originally from a CPUC order to install technology that would improve gas meter reading and leak detection. This order came on the heels of gas related safety issues from unanticipated leaks, along with air quality concerns in California as SoCal Gas and other public gas companies have had human meter readers in vehicles physically drive to record customer meters, resulting in associated vehicle emissions and vehicle miles traveled. From this state order, SoCal Gas, the provider for most of Santa Barbara County, developed the Advanced Metering Infrastructure Program or AMI program. In order to provide service to individual customer meters, the applicant in intends to install approximately 66 devices countywide any outside of the inland areas, such as those that would be located within the coastal zone, would be addressed under separate CDPs. Mr. Berger, we saw this slide, so you can keep going. Understood. We can keep going. That one too. Um, there you go. And, the facility. and we can go to slide six, please. Assembly of the ordinance included a series of reviews, starting with an examination of prior CDPs and associated development standards for those facilities placed elsewhere in the county. County staff and the consultant also reviewed the county and Montecito's existing telecommunications ordinances, surveyed the implementation of these projects in other jurisdictions and solicited input from the county's development review staff, including zoning counter staff, the public works department and the energy division. 
We also provided draft language to all four boards of architectural review and the Montecito Association in late 2019. Advance the slide. The resulting ordinance implements a process for the applicant to obtain a zoning clearance contingent on a series of development standards which limit the scale and amount of disturbance associated with these required facilities. In combination, these development standards substantially limit the potential amount of impacts or disturbance that would occur with the installation and operation of these facilities. These facilities are small, prioritized to be co-located with existing facilities, would not have lighting or additional signage other than that required by law, and would involve minimal or no physical disturbance. The applicant would be required to comply with all development standards of the ordinance to obtain approval of a zoning clearance. SoCal Gas will need to apply for an LUP if a specific facility fails to meet the proposed ordinance's stringent development standards. Advance slide, please. The ordinance was reviewed for compliance with existing local regulations, including the county's community plan and both inland LUDCs, and was found to be substantially consistent. Next slide, please. The ordinance was found to be exempt under CEQA as the facilities would tie into the existing natural gas infrastructure and would consist of a limited number of new small structures. Advanced slide, please. In October, the proposed amendments to the county LUDC were heard by the County Planning Commission. The county LUDC amendment was recommended for approval with a unanimous vote with no modifications to the ordinance. Advanced slide, please. In October, the proposed amendments to the Montecito LUDC were heard by the Montecito Planning Commission. The Montecito LUDC amendment was recommended for approval with a unanimous vote with one recommended modification to the ordinance. The commission's recommended modification is as follows. Uh, natural gas telecommunications facilities on new poles shall not be located in a manner that blocks or encroaches upon public walkways, including but not limited to public trails, and shall be located at least 100 feet from the trails or walkways. Advance slide, please. Uh, staff's input and recommendation from the Montecito Planning Commission's recommended modification is as follows. The term public walkways is not necessarily defined in the county's LUDCs. The proposed 100 foot buffer from walkways prevents facilities from being cited in most public rights of way, which are typically suitable for such utility related facilities. Finally, staff recommends that the board maintain consistency between both LUDCs and avoid differing standards between the two jurisdictional areas. Next slide, please. Today, following your review, we are excited to be here uh, to recommend that the board make the finding required, the required findings for approval, which can be found in attachment 1A and 1B to the board letter that the board determined the proposed amendments are exempt from CEQA as found in attachment two. And finally, adopt the ordinances amending both the county and Montecito LUDCs found in attachments 3A and 3B. Advanced slide, please. Thank you for your time. Apologies for the internet. Uh, uh, however, this concludes staff's presentation and we welcome any questions or feedback you may have prior to SoCal Gas's follow-up presentation, which just happened. Thank you, Mr. Bogert. Are there additional comments from staff? Sounds like the, the issue with the Montecito Planning Commission still needs to be raised. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, I think the, there, the County Planning Commission did not support the change, but there is this question out there about whether or not there would be some uh, some limited restriction, um, and I don't know if Mr. Clemen or Ms. Evelsizer want to provide further comment about that, but there were concerns expressed by Southern California Gas about uh, such a restriction preventing them from being able to install the equipment that this very ordinance would allow for. So. I think it's the question is really whether or not there's some kind of 
um, modification to that or whether or not the board dis will decide to reject that requested amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Williams. Yeah, I mean, my suggestion is to, uh, I, I can understand how the, you know, taking the entire public right away uh, uh, where a sidewalk could be. I guess the question is walkways wasn't um, maybe defined as exactly as it should have been. Um, and, uh, but I do wanna meet the intent of uh, my, my, my Montecito Planning Commission, if at all possible. Um, and so my suggestion is uh, to just limit it to trails. Uh, and if there is any reference document that planning has to public trails, just specifically uh, reference that map, um, but otherwise using the, the term public trails. And so then it's, it's clear that they can ins install this um, on the street, which is what usually happens. And, uh, but trail heads, at, which is the particular concern and, and public trails would be uh, protected. Uh, so, I mean, I guess my, that would be my suggestion. I think it's pretty easy to wordsmith uh, the seven. You just strike um, uh, everything except the word public trails that block, after blocks, you just strike everything up to public trails and then you strike or walkways um, in the amendment, and then you, hopefully that um, does the trick. That would be my suggestion. Um, and uh, I would be uh, interested to know SoCal Gas's res response to that. Um, I have I had discussions with them about it, um, uh, uh, and hope that that will provide us all a way forward. Um, is there somebody from the gas company that'd like to respond to that suggestion? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Tim Mahoney again, and I'll ask uh, Dave Mercer and others to comment on this. Uh, that That's uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that takes up, uh, if you put a 100 foot buffer along a trail, you know, there's, I, I'm sure there's dozens of trails throughout the entire county on this, and that would take away such a limited, it would take away so much space, 100 feet on each side of a trail, that's like, you know, 200 feet uh, taken out of possible public right-of-way where we want to put these uh, data collection units. A uh, second point to be made is that, you know, it, we're trying to work with groups like the Montecito Water District, and they have their sites located higher up in the um, hills above Montecito, because theirs is a gravity flow, and those already disturbed water sites are perfect for the placement of a data collection unit because they, they facilitate the line of sight that we, that we need. The higher up the pole is, the better. If you're down in a canyon, the data collection unit has a hard time getting a signal. But many of those facilities up there are located close to a trail. So you're, you're really um, kind of limiting uh, what takes place. Uh, when this discussion came up at the Montecito, uh, pl uh, planning commission and I, I certainly respect the the commission and and uh, supervisor williams you're right that you know they're they're trying to look out for your community and, and and i certainly respect that i i don't agree with with the language just because it, it's too restrictive but i understand where they're coming from the um what this ordinance does is it crafts a process by which if we follow these development standards and we do the outreach we're not going to be impeding on really anybody's views or any, we're not, we, we would never impede on, on a trail to begin with. So, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to want to uh, um, uh, say that that's a workable item for us. I'm, I'm sure somebody else on my team might have a, a word or two otherwise too. Well, Tim, I, I mean, a, a suggestion, there's two other ways we could handle it is number one, we could do a, a lesser buffer of, of 50 feet, 
But my, if you're in, in agreement that I'm not as worried about ju just confining it to the Montecito LUDC, um, if that's not a concern outside of the L LUDC boundaries. Um, are there any other questions of staff for the applicant? Let's, I know we have some public comment too, so we want to do that. I don't see a supervisor Hartman. Did you have a question? Yes, uh, one for the gas company. I was just curious about uh, what changes to the meters themselves at individual homes this would require. And then I, I would like our planning department to address the issue. It says it doesn't apply this ordinance change to any other commercial or non-commercial telecommunications. Uh, what more might be in the pipeline is my question. So those are the two. Mr. Chair uh, and me members of the board, I think I'm going to have Mr. Clement respond to the question about what's in the pipeline. Uh, Supervisor Hartman, uh, through the chair. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, so one thing we're trying to clarify uh, is the type of uh, facilities, the very limited number and types of facilities that would be authorized by this ordinance. We want to make explicitly clear, for example, that this isn't authorizing, for example, like 5G telecommunication facilities or things like that. So um, this would actually, in terms of what's coming down the pike, in terms of the next form of tel technology for these specific facilities, actually that question is best presented to SoCal Gas because they know what they're working on. But once again, the, the point was just to make it clear that only these limited few number of facilities for SoCal gas would be authorized by this ordinance. Do we already have them for electricity reading meters? Yeah, it's my understanding, yes. Uh, Mrs. Evilsizer might have, Mrs. Evilsizer Whitney might have uh, more information for you. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Supervisor Hartman through the chair, yes, Southern California, for, with regard to the Southern Ca County area, SCE installed smart meters several years ago because they already have the above ground poles. Um, and PG&E, as far as I understand, has installed smart meters as well. The reason that SoCal Gas has not is because all of their facilities are underground and the meters need to be above ground, above ground to work effectively. So as far as we know, there's nothing else that would come. We, we, aren't ex we, we need, what, 66 new poles or something. I, I just, are we going to need these for others? Maybe telecommunication, that's a separate issue, but we don't anticipate more like this. OK. Uh, Supervisor Hartman through the chair, yes. As part of this ordinance amendment process, about a year or so ago, we asked Wood um, to contact the other utility providers that operate in the county to see if they were planning on installing smart meters and at that time none of them were or they already had. So this ordinance only applies to natural gas um, telecommunications. Thank you Ms. Evelsizer Whitney. Are there any other questions for staff at this time? We're, if not, we'll go to public comment. Chair Hart. Could you please introduce the public commenters? Chair Hart and members of the board, yes, we have two requests to speak on this item today. Our first speaker is Ann Odell Thomas to be followed by Ronald Buckley. My apologies, we lost Ann Odell Thomas. I will call her back briefly. So we will begin with Ronald Beckley. Thank you, County Supervisors. I'm Ron Buckley. I've lived in the city of Santa Barbara since 1971. In reference to the gas company slides, I have a few comments and some recommendations. Slide number two shows the environmental benefits of you're going to take a thousand trucks off the load, they're going to take tons of carbon out of the air, and they're going to have fewer miles driven. Two questions on that. Are the gas company trucks gas powered? And are you telling me that the gas powered trucks would produce that much carbon emissions? And the second question in that area is you, you say you're going to move the jobs over within the company. How about the motor pool that's going to be with service of 1,000 trucks? 
Are they going to be laid off? Is it going to go away? So I'm concerned about people being laid off here, and even within the even within the meter people. The gas company communication module, four times a day, I understand that, and the collection module, can you tell me what frequencies, what bandwidth, and what power these things are doing? I'm concerned about another electromagnetic fog in the whole county. We already got it from the cell phone towers, we got it from Edison, and now you folks want to put it in also. And is the equipment you're using tested by anybody? Is it ULCSA, like a toaster in my house? Is it safe? Has it been earthquake proof? Is it fireproof? And finally, um, the map you showed is absolutely useless. You've been working on this for two years. You're going to have 66 sites, and you can't tell us where you're going to put these things? Yeah, come on. So I understand you can't answer my questions in public comment, but if you supervisors don't know the answers to my questions and understand the implications of these answers to the citizens of the county, I recommend you table this matter for further consideration. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. And now we will go to Ann Odell Thomas. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, members of the board. Um, oh, here. Um, I am troubled by the. Okay, I'm going to do this. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yes, we Thank can. you. Okay, I'm troubled by the lack of information on the following questions regarding the SoCal Gas Data Collection Unit. I request that you delay your vote on this item until you get specific answers. Where will they be located? SoCal Gas included a vague map, but no specific addresses for this project. We need to be informed. How close to residences will they be located? What will be the notification and also the appeal process for neighboring residents? What is the exact microwave radiation measurement generated by them? SoCal Gas only included a vague amount of 400 times less than a Bluetooth headset. This is not a specific nor reliable measurement. What frequency will they use? What fire risks do they cause? Could they amplify the impact of a wildfire and make it harder for firefighters to put out a fire? CEQA should also be considered, considered due to the direct impact on the environment. I am also very troubled by the densification of microwave radiation emitting equipment in residential neighborhoods. Much of this is a result of the December 2019 ordinance amendments which remove restrictions on locating small cell towers equipment in residential neighborhoods. More companies can now use this framework to their benefit at the expense of protecting county residents. This needs to be addressed urgently by the Board of Supervisors, and the county telecom ordinance needs to be updated to include protection for local residents. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Odile Thomas. And this brings it back to the Board. Supervisor Williams. Well, I, I would ask uh, SoCal Gas to, to answer particularly the strength of the signal question. Just, uh, I think the questions by the two public speakers were reasonable and, and, and should be answered. Yes, absolutely. This is Al Vasquez uh, with SoCal Gas. Um, with Chair Hart and uh, Board of uh, Supervisors. Uh, so the, the question was on the power levels of the data collector units. Uh, the power levels are, from a watts perspe perspective, is 0.93 watts, which is less than one watt. Uh, and the, uh, the frequencies that they operate in is at 460 megahertz. Uh, and the, uh, the bandwidth of those frequencies is only 11 kilohertz, so it's a very narrow band, uh, not, not wide band like the 5G uh, or the LTE towers. Uh, the power densities that they operate in is at 0 0.005 milliwatts per centimeter squared, which is 0.16% uh, of the allowable that the FCC allows. So it's very low powered uh, data collector units. 99% of those data collector units are in listening mode and listening for the meters to transmit to the data collector unit. 
and the data collector units only trans, uh, transmit once a day to the meters for time synchronization. That's all. And then the other follow-up questions that were asked was, you know, how many times a day are the data collection units broadcasting? And is the equipment um, UL or CSA tested and certified? Yes, so the, the data collection units, like I said, they transmit once a day uh, to the meters, and then they transmit every 15 minutes or about five seconds to, to the cellular tower providers uh, to backhaul the data to our uh, SoCal gas offices. Uh, the uh, the units are FCC certified. They're not UL or CSA uh, certified. They are, they are only FCC certified. And is there any fire risk at all from these devices? Uh, no, there is no fire risk. There is no uh, 120 volts or power lines connected to the DCU. They're battery operated at 12 volts, so it's very low power. And then is, is there a detailed map that shows the exact addresses, or is that something that's evolving as you refine your proposal? Yes, that is something that's evolving, yes, depending on the proposal, yes. Okay, thank you very much. You're Are there welcome. other questions for staff or comments from staff? Ms. Plowman? Mr. Chair, members of the board, I think if the board is going to be uh, entertaining a change to the code, that we should seek to keep our codes consistent. So if we change MLUDC, then the LUDC ought to be similar. Change should be made in both. Okay, the matters to the board. Supervisor Adam is not there anymore. He wanted me to vote for him, so uh, maybe we'll wait till he comes back. Okay. Actually, I think you can go ahead and make a motion up there, and uh, we may not need his vote anyway. Okay. Okay, I will make the motion um, that we pass it, the, though with a modified version of the Montecito Planning Commission's recommendation. Um, and I, if it's the if it's the board's will, I, I'll do it countywide. If it's board's will, I would do it just with Montecito. Um, uh, the, again, my suggestion is that we strike the language and simply say public trails and a 50-foot uh, buffer from the public trails. Um, you know, look, these, these are, are going to be set up on public streets, which was the entire logic of SoCal Gas being opposed to this amendment, um, that uh, this amended language would leave public streets out of it. So I saw in, the, saw in the Montecito Journal that there's a huge network of public trails in Montecito that are now that have now been created by community organizations. Does this does that fact change this in this definition? Mr. Chair, members of the board, we would recommend you make it public trails, not trails held by private foundations, but public trails that are you know we have. Cold Springs, Hot Springs, uh, Romero, San Ysidro, the trails that are in our, in our front country, um, and then as we go through the rest of the county, publicly held trails. Mr. Gazzani. Chair and Supervisors, and, and if this was something that the board conceptually wanted to direct, you know, my recommendation after consulting with uh, Director Plowman was that the board trail this item so that planning could work up um, a slide to make very clear what language you're approving today. Okay. Would other board, Supervisor Hartman? Uh, yes. Um, Montecito isn't the only area working on right of way trails. We are doing this very much in the Santa Ynez Valley where we don't have sidewalks and people are, are trying to create right of way trails. Would these, um, I mean, if we pass this, would that mean we're likely to get these poles in the right of way where the trail is as an encroachment? Uh, just to I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Supervisor Hartman. If the trails, you know, I know that in San Inez there are sort of equestrian trails right along the right of way. So if they became public trails and there had to be a setback 
from that public trail, it could prevent that pole from being in the in the right of way, essentially. Right. So that would be a cons that would be a constraint. Yeah, but the other constraint is poles in the right of way make it very difficult to ride your horse or your bike or walk. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, changing my view a bit on this. Are there other comments from board members? Was that a second? <laughs> So, I have a hard time, uh, Mr. Chair, Steve. Supervisor Lavanina. It's hard for me to weigh in on this since I have two of them in my district. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I understand that there were some concerns about uh, in, in the Montecito area, but the Planning Commission as a whole, um, didn't they, what, what was their final recommendation? Didn't they... Mr. Chair, Supervisor Levin, you know, um, they recommended, I believe, 5 0 to not make any changes to the code and forward it the way SoCal Gas had requested it. And I, I think be, before you act, there, you should get some feedback from Southern California Gas about this concept of poles in the right of way and trail conflicts, because I'm concerned that maybe we're going, we're, um, Discussing an area where we don't know what the ramifications of that will be. Mr. Gazzoni. Chair and supervisors, and I, and I think part of that conversation, it might help to hear from planning um, if some if there is a potential trail, or excuse me, pole too close to a trail, not that it can't occur, but that the permit regime uh, changes, and maybe that would help the board to understand that, what the type of permit that is required based on the proximity of the pole to the trail. So, Chair Hart um, and members of the board, one item I wanted to mention is that the ordinance as proposed, um, it's item in both the Montecito LUDC amendment and the county LUDC amendment, it's, it's subsection I, location, the number seven, so bullet seven. Um, so, for example, in the county LUDC amendment, it's on page five. It, the wording already um, as proposed would not allow for polls to block or impede public access, including but not limited to public trails. So the ordinance as proposed would already disallow um, a poll being installed that would impede a public trail. So I just wanted to point that out. So I'm, I'm confused. What would staff the interpret impede be? I block guess block is probably an English word. Um, I mean, I'm confused. So the Planning Commission said to go ahead with the proposal that the gas company has before us. Everything is fine. And now we're having a debate about changing something because why? You got a second on that. I don't understand where the impetus for this, this proposal is coming from. It, Montecito Planning Commission had a different recommendation. Well, that's, the, the that's staff's that. telling us they did not, that they approved this unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chair, the County Planning Commission approved it unanimously. I the see. Montecito okay. Planning Commission had a request okay. for a change. Now I understand. But the County Planning Commission did not support that request. Got it. Okay. Mr. Chair. Supervisor Adam. I, I thought the whole idea behind this was to, to that, that we really didn't have any discretion over this. And we're just we're just making uh, our our ordinance conform to federal law. Is that not correct? I think we had a conditional use permit requirement previously, and this is creating a more streamlined process for the gas company to facilitate this wave rollout of new technology. Is that correct, Ms. Evil Sizer Whitney? Chair Hart, that is correct, and also SoCal Gas is required to install these facilities by the CPUC. So we that's why we've been working with them as well. So there's a lot of interlocking connected situations. Mr. Gazzani. Uh, Chair, and, and with a, a very short uh, comment as to Supervisor Adams' observation, this is an area where the CP, uh, California Public Utilities Commission, um, has primacy and we have tension with that and that's why some of the changes that are in here do have some limitations on them. So the, the board's not a free actor in this area and staff's recommendation actually reflects that. Thank you, Mr. Kazani. Okay, so, so Mr. Chair, is there a motion on the floor? 
I think there's been a motion, but no second. Okay. Well, what was the motion? Supervisor Williams. Uh, to go with the, uh, the uh, recommendation, but with the, ch the change of just keeping it to public trails and a 50-foot buffer. Supervisor Hart. Right, I'll, I'll second the motion. I, I think that we're, we're starting to split too many hairs, but uh, in the interest of time, and, and we have a long budget here, and we don't have a lot of discretion, uh, I, I think we should just move forward. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Gazzoni's going to say we should be tabling this item for Trailing. action. I, I, would, I, would just rec I would just recommend uh, maybe a conceptual vote to see if you have the majority vote then trail the item, allow staff to show what the change would actually be so that there's great clarity as to the language that's being approved today since it is a police power exercise. Okay, great. Supervisor okay. Hartman? Then or Mr. Mr. Adam, Supervisor Adam? Well, I'm, I'm gonna withdraw my second then because I'm that, that defeats the purpose of my uh, seconding the motion. So what I would like to do is offer another motion to uh, uh, employ staff, uh, adopt staff recommendations. Okay, motion to Supervisor Hartman, point of order. That's up to you, Chair Hart, but I'm not sure you, you have to first ask if there is a second before you can go to the next motion, I believe. I did. All right, I'll give a, I'll give a second just so we can keep moving. Supervisor Lavin, you know, which motion are you seconding? <laughs> I'll, uh, staff recommendation. All right, let's go back. Supervisor Adam, did you, or Hartman, did you have a point to Supervisor Williams' original comment? Is that why your light is on? Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Um, in many rural areas in our county, we have right-of-ways, we don't have sidewalks, and there are many encroachments. They aren't yet designated as public trails or even in community plans. There's pieces and people are trying to weave it together retroactively. And my concern is that we're going to have these poles as obstacles in areas where we want to have at least a place for people to walk safely. So it may be taking trucks off the road, but it's forcing everybody into cars because you can't walk or bike safely. So I don't know if there's a development standard, if there's something you can do to, to get it back enough from the road to not foreclose those opportunities. Well, it's hard to do planning for things that haven't been planned for, so that's a real challenge. Uh, Mr. Clement? Mr. Chair, yeah. I have a question. First, I'm Mr. Sorry. Clement has a comment, then Supervisor Lavanino. I, I really feel, uh, thank you, Chair Hart, I really feel it'd be important to put up on the screen the existing recommended language um, that uh, we believe actually achieves what you, are, you just stated, uh, Supervisor Hartman. Um, however, we, we must be careful because we can only acknowledge uh, actually dedicated trails, actually dedicated right-of-way. If there's no plan or any sort of indication that a particular area is going to be uh, acquired for public right-of-way for the purposes of a trail or something like that, we really cannot protect or uh, accommodate those areas. But that's why that recreational master plan is so important because it's going to show the connectivity between those items, but we don't have that plan in effect yet today to help and us guide that. what happens when it goes in effect? I mean, this will... Which has priority? Well, that's yet to be seen because we don't know what's actually going to be in the plan. But one of the goals of the plan is to show the connectivity between all those disparate uh, linkages that aren't connecting up right now for all the trails out there. So the hope is that we adopt a comprehensive trail plan which shows those linkages. If or when that plan is adopted, then this standard would prevent the uh, construction of these types of facilities within those areas which would impede the development of that plan. So it, it's interesting because we're kind of coming back to the original staff recommendation. I think it captures the essence of what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, so Supervisor Williams has made a motion. Is there a second to his motion? Okay, so there is no second for the motion. Supervisor Adam, did you, or Supervisor Lavanino, did one of you have an, another motion? Mm -hmm. No, Supervisor Adam made a motion for staff recommendation, and there was a second. Okay, so the, the and how big are these poles? Are these these some poles I've never seen before that you can't maneuver around, or are these standard telephone poles? 
I mean, we're starting to act like these things are like the redwoods where you cut the hole and drive the car through them or something. All right, let's, let's just stay focused here temporarily. And uh, so we have a motion from Supervisor Adam, and I do not recall who seconded that motion. Was that you, Supervisor Lavanino? Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Is there, are there comments or discussion to the motion that is on the floor? All right, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? No. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes four to one. Thank you for everyone's patience and appreciate all the comments. Um, that concludes item number D3. That brings us to item D4. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Madam Clerk, could you read this item into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number four is from the County Executive Office. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding fiscal year 2021 through 2022 budget development policies. Mr. Frappwell, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good afternoon. So our item before you today is to discuss the proposed budget development policies for the fiscal year 21-22 budget. Really in today's report and the report that you have in front of you, there's three uh, primary sections when we will discuss the budget development policies themselves. Um, we will discuss the Northern Branch Jail funding plan and provide your board with an update, as well as have a conversation about the fiscal issues and board priorities. You recall this is our chart that we show each time we have a budget uh, discussion with your board. These are the five public touch, a minimum five public touch points in the annual budget development process. Last month, we brought before your board the five-year forecast and the significant fiscal issues report. And today we're in front of you to discuss the budget development policies. The fiscal issues report and the forecast really do set, as I mentioned uh, last month, the context for the development of the upcoming budget, county's budget. And today we're here to serve, uh, to look at the policy which will serve as a guiding principles for its development. Specifically related to uh, development policies, I've asked uh, Paul Clementi to join us today. Paul is our uh, principal Fiscal and Research Analyst. So with that. Mr. Clementi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. So the 21-22 policies, um, substantially similar to the policies from last year, the 2021 policies, I will be highlighting uh, four new components we're adding this year. These components would uh, help with existing departments in identifying funding that would offset costs of services, uh, develop a couple funding plans for air support maintenance and um, potential enterprise resource planning system, uh, as well as promoting greater accountability um, and transparency with regard to realignment revenues. Policy 3D, uh, this is an existing policy that requires departments to uh, seek full cost recovery for the services they provide and we'd be modifying, we're recommending modification of this policy to add some language that would direct the CEO to identify funding when the board takes action to reduce or eliminate a proposed charge for service fee while still requiring provision of the service. The rationale for this one is, is from time to time the board for public policy purposes does reduce or eliminate a fee below a recommended uh, cost recovery level. In these cases, the general fund is often used to subsidize these services to keep the department whole. This is 
um, existing practice. We already do this, um, but the inclusion of this policy would memorialize that practice in a policy. So it explicitly links uh, when the board takes such an action with the CEO identifying other funding, often GFC, um, to make departments whole. This would be a, a countywide impact, and, and the fiscal impact would vary based on, on the fee, which would be presented to your board at the time that a department comes with fees. They would um, explain what impact of, of what the fiscal impact would be to reduce or eliminate such a fee. Policy 4D would direct the CEO to work with fire and sheriff to develop a maintenance funding plan for the air support unit. Currently, fire and sheriff split ASU maintenance costs 50-50. They try to project what the upcoming year's costs will be and budget accordingly. But aircraft maintenance schedules um, can spike. They can change from year to year, just like um, with a vehicle, you'll take it in for your annual oil change and things like that. But when you hit certain mileage milestones, there are more expensive maintenance you have to do. It works the same with aircraft. They look at flight hours and at certain milestones in the flight hours of an aircraft. There will be more expensive maintenance that need to be done. And that's not annually, but it could be every three, four years, depending on usage. So that can um, sort of swing the costs annually for maintenance up and down. And it makes it more difficult for the departments to budget that. So developing a multi-year funding plan would help smooth the costs over multiple years while also building reserves to pay for scheduled maintenance and um, unanticipated costs which occur fairly regularly as well without impacting a department's annual operating budget. The departments affected would be fire and sheriff. Uh, fiscal impact would be potential increases to sheriff GFC if the plan ends up uh, recommending an average, an average cost that would exceed what they currently have in their maintenance budget. Similarly, uh, potential impact on fire district revenues if they would need to contribute more to a funding plan as well. Policy 4E would set aside a minimum ongoing amount of $1.5 million for an eventual enterprise resource planning system. As your board is aware, the county is currently conducting a business applications needs assessment, the outcome of which may be um, recommendations that that we seek new system solutions, including potentially an ERP. The costs uh, would include purchase of the, of the ERP, implementation of that system, and then an annual licensing fee. So beginning to set aside revenues now would help offset eventual costs down the line. This would be a, a countywide impact, and the fiscal impact would be a minimum of $1.5 million annually. And finally, Policy 5C would direct CEO to work closer with uh, departments that receive realignment revenues on their budget projections and um, on their year-end accruals, as well as, where feasible, setting aside 1991 realignment surpluses in general county programs uh, fund balances rather than individual departments as they're currently held. Uh, the rationale is that, is that budget projections and year-end accruals need more centralization uh, than they're currently, they're currently left up to, mostly to departments to, to do those projections and, and year-end accruals. So our, our department CEO's office would, would work closer with departments as they're developing those. Uh, and the 1991 realignment fund balances, moving those to general county programs rather than individual departments would increase transparency as to the availability of funds. Um, any year-end fund balances would be available to fund future year eligible expenses for those revenues. And the maintenance of a prudent fund balance would help buffer unanticipated downturns. Uh, these are particularly economically sensitive revenues are mostly derived from sales tax, um, VLF. It's very similar to what we did with Prop 172 dollars a couple years back, um, shifting those out of individual departments and into general county programs, and then we use those as needed. Um, in times when there's downturns, we can use those to help supplement departments. Uh, so this would have an impact on realignment departments um, around the county, and there'd be no actual fiscal impact. We're not changing any of the revenue sources. This is just more of how it's being managed and accounted for. Moving on to the Northern Branch Jail funding plan. 
recommendation is a modification to the original funding plans fiscal year 21-22 set aside. Uh, as a reminder, the original funding plan was adopted in fiscal year 2011-12, gradually setting aside growing amounts of general fund contribution to eventually fund the operations of the Northern Branch Jail. The original plan assumed uh, the first full fiscal year of operations was going to be fiscal year 18-19, at an annual operating cost of 17.3 million. The Northern Branch Jail is now expected to be operational later this fiscal year uh, with the first annual uh, fiscal year operating costs of 21.4 million in fiscal year 21-22. The original plan anticipated a set aside of 17.1 million in 21-22. Uh, the recommended modification is to set aside 17.4 million instead. This is the additional $300,000 uh, which, which we believe would serve to bolster the fund balance that's available so it doesn't get drawn down below zero before the um, GFC set aside matches parity with the operating costs in the years ahead. CEO's office would monitor and report on the funding plan each year during these development policies in December and the anticipated costs each year. Uh, further, recommend, further modifications may be recommended in future years. However, if significant cost savings are, are realized elsewhere in the custody system uh, and that and the GFC already in the sheriff's office can be used to offset uh, costs of the Northern Branch Jail modifications to the funding plan in the future may be unnecessary. And Mr. Chair, finally to wrap up, in the, in the fiscal issue report we brought last month, we identified for your board a number of fiscal issues that are uh, pending, that are out there. We, we, it's important that we monitor what's on the horizon, uh, specific as it relates to the 21-22 budget development. Um, the first, the first four uh, items on this slide: the deferred maintenance facility improvements and ERP planning system, and the enhanced cybersecurity measures were identified in that report. Here's our intent to, uh, as we develop the budget, uh, accommodate those fiscal issues that are on the right-hand side as a recommended action. And then finally, the last three on this slide for your board's consideration today are items that were identified in your special meeting last week. Uh, specifically related to the criminal justice system and equity within within that. So um, that's here on our slide uh, today for your consideration of the uh, seven fiscal issues that we will um, attempt to address in developing the fiscal year 21-22 budget. With that, we'd be happy to answer any questions or recommended actions included in the board letter today is the adoption of the fiscal year 21-22 budget development policies, the approved proposed modifications in the Arnold Branch Jail funding plan, and to provide us with any um, preliminary direction that your board would feel appropriate and, uh, at this time, and then finally to make the SEPA determination. So with that, Mr. Chair, board members, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Fravwell and Mr. Clementi. Um, matter is to the board for discussion. Or, or actually, are there any questions for staff? Mr. Chair. Supervisor Adam. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about 4D, and is that is that funding augmenting the 17% the fire tax shift? Supervisor Adam to the chair. So the, the proposal here and the policy neither increases or decreases the cost to maintain those airships. What it attempts to do is to stabilize and smooth the impact and the cost. We know that the cost on those airships fluctuate greatly from one year to the next, depending on the number of hours flown on each of those airframes. And so what we're trying to do in this is develop a, a kind of a smoothing uh, plan for those costs. So it does not uh, increase above the 17%. So the, the general fund's contribution or support, uh, it maintains it maintains that 17%, neither increases or decreases. This is a thought exercise for budgeting purposes, not a not a funding. Supervisor, I think that's correct. I mean, I I think our attempt here is for prudent management that we develop a, a funding plan. Right. I I just had a constituent that was asking. Thank you. Thanks. Supervisor Hartman? Or Ms. Um, Miyasato, did you have something else? Okay. 
um, Chair Hart through the board, but it does say that there could be a t potential increase in the sheriff's GFC if plan exceeds current maintenance budget. So I just want people to be aware of that. And that's because currently there's a certain amount budgeted for the air support operations and that that may change as this plan identifies future needs and the smoothing of that cost. Yeah. Okay. Long, long term, correct. Long term, it does not increase the cost, but it may in any given year as we smooth out these costs. So yep. overall, it doesn't increase, but it will, it can have some adjustments in that first year. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Hartman? Yes, I'm just trying to understand uh, the significance of these. Uh, and really, we are setting, in a sense, policy for how you build the budget if we approve these. And so that kind of gets built into what you present to us. Um, and, and so um, it's very important, I think, because what this means we have less discretionary money, but it also means we're being very responsible and trying to plan for maintenance uh, of all kinds and, and uh, other deferred needs. So I'm, I'm very supportive of these kinds of policies. What did happen to the fire tax shift? That's always been one of our, we, we've now met it, so it's gone away. Supervisor Harbin, the chair. So your board did set a commitment to grow the contribution and um, uh, essentially take 25% of the growth in the total assessed valuation and result in property tax each year and provide that to the district until such time as they reach that 17%. So that was uh, achieved last fiscal year, and so now we have kind of stabilized that. So that's a positive. That means that um, both the fire district and the general fund continue to receive the full growth in their respective um, amounts of uh, proper tax coming from the growth in AV. And then my, my last point is really um, about the jail. And I'm so grateful to see that you've actually incorporated the, the ideas that from last week already into these budget principles. What, what I don't see here yet, though, is we have to increase spending on the jail. And we don't really have a sense of how we might reduce the population or what do we need to do at the main jail. So we're just assuming that we're going to add more money without a basis for understanding where we might have some cost savings. So I would be very interested in getting a plan from the sheriff about what to expect, rather than just automatically saying we're going to put more and more and more money into the new jail. Supervisor Harbin, the chair. I, I, excellent point. I mean, I think the challenge that I think everybody heard last week is to look at opportunities of redirecting existing funding within the custody system to achieve um, the outcomes that your board identified last week. Um, expansion of diversion, expansion of making sure that we're addressing any um, significant improvements in the system as a whole. The uh, minor adjustment that we're recommending today in the funding plan uh, essentially takes that set aside from the general fund. Um, that these are funds going into the funding plan, so just a big step backwards. So the board adopted a plan 10 years ago that's, that had an escalated increase in the set aside. And then from that set aside, money then is appropriate each year to the sheriff's department to pay for the operating cost. So we know there's an equilibrium point where the amount of GFC going into the plan each year will at some point reach equilibrium with the cost. So the, the minor adjustment we're suggesting of going from 17.1 to 17.4 still doesn't reach the total operating cost of the Northern Branch Jail. So we're not there yet. I think what we're able to do and what we hope to do between now and uh, budget workshop is to work with the sheriff and our outside consultant to identify opportunities for um, reducing the overall custody cost, thereby reducing the need potentially to grow this uh, contribution in future years, or at least minimize it. So we're not, we haven't reached, right now we think that the Northern Branch Jail annually would cost $21.4 million. We haven't reached that in our general contribution. We have a ways to go. Um, we think what will happen as part of this is if we can reduce the overall cost of the custody system, 
that we won't have to continue to increase our contribution into the plan. That's our hope. Those, that's what I think the challenge that we heard last week and that we're happy to work with the sheriff and our outside consultants to identify options. Well, I, I just, I, th I think this is what people are calling for, how we reallocate these monies in a more um, restorative justice diversion, uh, trying to address human needs rather than just a, a punitive system. And whatever we can do to say we strongly endorse that and would like to see that when it comes back at the budget uh, workshops, um, I'd like to do that. Thank you, Supervisor Hartman. Supervisor Williams? Well, my, my suggestion, if that's, if we support um, uh, Jeff and the CEO's uh, effort at uh, moving forward in, for some methods of, of cost savings to help us pay for these other cost overruns, then we should put it into a motion. And so you know, my suggestion is that uh, in addition to the staff rec recommended um, items that we direct staff to consult with the sheriff and report on alternative scenarios for funding levels of the Northern Branch Jail, um, taking into consider consideration potential reductions in the countywide jail population. Okay. Are there other comments? Is there any uh, public comment on this item? Chair Hart, members of the board, we have no request to speak on this item. Well, I agree with Supervisor Hartman and Supervisor Williams. I think it's really important that we um, work with the sheriff to figure out ways that we can reduce the cost, cost in the custody um, system. And this is the, the opportunity to do that before we have um, opened the Northern Branch Jail so we can understand how the two jails are gonna operate together. Um, the original funding plan for the Northern Branch Jail um, additional cost was based on a more than 1,000 um, inmate population. And you know we're not ideally going to go back to that uh, level of incarceration by doing other diversion programs and um, using our facilities in a different way. So there's real potential here and, and this is um, the, the budget policy and Supervisor Williams' motion, I think, really affirm that direction. Super, um, CEO Miyasato. Chair Hartman, board member. So I just want to make clear for your, um, in addition to the motion of Supervisor Williams, you are not approved item B, which was to make the $300,000 increase in the funding plan. You, that'd be pending the discussion that we come back with at the budget workshop or the budget hearing. Thank you for that clarification. Um, is there a second for Supervisor second. Williams? Yeah, I, let me phrase this exactly so everybody's clear. Uh, I, that I move that we uh, uh, adopt uh, A, C, and D, um, not B, uh, and in, in substitution, direct staff to consult with the sheriff and report on alternative scenarios for funding levels of the Northern Branch Jail, taking into consideration potential reductions in the countywide jail population. Second. And I think that means custody operations, not just the Northern Branch Jail. That's, That's right. Yeah. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for that item. Which brings us now to departmental item number five, community services. Madam Clerk, could you please read that item into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number five is from community services. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding Central Coast Community Energy, 3CE, service offerings for municipal electric accounts. Welcome, Mr. Bailey and Ms. Watkins. Good afternoon, uh, County Board of Supervisors. Um, today, you'll be receiving a presentation from Ashley Watkins, our Division Chief for our Sustainability Office. Um, George Chapjin is um, available via Zoom, participating remotely. We also have a member of General Services, Skip Gray, here for any questions. So, Ashley, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Bailey and Ms. Watkins. Thanks for being here. 
Uh, thanks. Good to be here. Uh, Chair Hart, members of the board, uh, today, during today's presentation, we will provide some brief background on Community Choice Energy, or CCE, and Central Coast Community Energy, or 3CE. Uh, we'll provide options for board consideration regarding 3CE service options, specifically for county municipal electric accounts. Uh, so that will not include county electric uh, accounts that are outside of 3CE's territory and are located in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, those accounts would be served by the city of Santa Barbara's CCE program. So we'll have to come back with you with information on um, those, ac those accounts, excuse me. Um, and also, uh, it does uh, it does not include, any of the decisions today won't include um, residential or commercial accounts. So as you're probably well aware of by now, uh, CCE enables local governments to purchase or generate electricity on behalf of their communities. The incumbent utility continues to deliver energy, maintain lines, and bill customers. The county is now a member of 3CE, an existing CCE program, and 3CE will launch electric service territory uh, really quickly in January, this coming January, January 2021 in pg e territory, and then uh, in October 2021 for Southern California Edison territory. Both 3CE and sustainability staff have been conducting outreach to customers in pg e territory, letting them know about the change to electric service providers through newsletters, community meetings. 3CE is also doing quite a bit of uh, radio and TV advertising, and, as well as individual account outreach. Uh, and then finally, on our One Climate page, we have FAQs and uh, more information for customers to access on 3CE. So to achieve one of the key benefits of community choice energy, which is increased renewables and the subsequent carbon reductions that go along with that, 3CE has recently uh, revised its procurement strategy. So they are now set to um, move towards a goal of providing clean and renewable energy resources for 60% of their, uh, of their um, of their, uh, excuse me, uh, retail sales by 2025 and 100% of their retail sales by 2030. And that's pretty notable. You heard um, Mr. Killigrew talk about that when he was here a month or so ago. Uh, it's 15 years ahead of state uh, state goals for these type, state goals for um, renewables. So they're definitely moving aggressively. Uh, 3CE will meet these new goals by execute, executing long-term power purchase agreements uh, for new and clean renewable energy projects, and their board has also um, directed staff to explore um, the potential for local generation. When 3CE launches service territory in 2021, all customers, including the county, will have the opportunity to choose their service offering. 3CE offers two service offerings, 3C Choice and 3C Prime. Uh, at the time of enrollment, customers will be automatically enrolled in 3CE's default service offering, which is 3C Choice. But they do have the opportunity to uh, opt up to 3C Prime or stay with the incumbent utility. So uh, when for 3CE, for 3C Choice, when uh, 3CE launches in January. 3C Choice will be somewhere between 35 to 40 percent renewables at launch, at launch, but that will incrementally move up over time as they've set these new goals to ultimately be 100 percent renewables by 2030. Uh, 3C Choice offers a bit of a discount, um, 2 percent, and um, for customers who want to be 100% renewable at launch, 3CE offers 3C Prime, um, which is slightly more expensive than 3C Choice at about eight tenths of a penny more. Uh, and for an average residential customer, um, that would maybe be an additional 
$23 to $84, depending on, on where they're located. It's kind of hard to, to provide averages for commercial because um, they just range so, so widely, but that gives you a little bit of idea of scale. So based on the service offerings provided by 3CE, we have three options for the board to consider today for its municipal electric accounts located within 3CE's service territory. Option one would be to default county uh, municipal electric accounts to 3C choice. Uh, 3C choice would be the lowest cost option. Uh, it, as I said, it provides roughly a 2% discount from PG&E rates, and then 3CE would meet uh, Edison rates. If the county were to default its municipal accounts to 3C choice, it would still have the ability to opt up to 3C prime at any time, so we're not locked into 3C choice. With this option, uh, we might not see you know, really large emission reductions immediately, but over time, uh, as 3CE ramps up its renewable portfolio and starts moving towards its goals, um, we would ultimately, by 2030, um, reduce emissions associated with buildings located uh, within 3CE's territory that are county-owned sites. Uh, option two would be to enroll county municipal electric accounts into 3C Prime, the 100% renewable energy uh, offering. Um, this option would not necessarily, or it, it would not um, speed up 3CE's progress towards their goals. Our load just isn't enough to, to push that even, and even quicker. Um, but it would signal the county's commitment to clean energy. Opting up to 3C Prime would, would also effectively obviate emissions associated with county uh, sites. But the trade-off with that is that you wouldn't really see a real material, um, a, a, a real material emissions reduction or direct benefit. Um, and what, by me, what I mean by that is um, 3CE would likely purchase renewable energy credits, which are just environmental attributes, uh, and so they wouldn't, that, that wouldn't really be driving any new uh, renewable energy projects. I would also note that this option um, does result in increased costs, um, roughly $77,000 annually. Um, we did pull out sites that are currently served by uh, solar as well as some proposed sites up at Betaravia that aren't online. Um, and, you know, again, it doesn't include county accounts located within the city of Santa Barbara. Um, the costs associated with 3C Prime, opting up to 3C Prime, would flow down to departments. And so departments that are largely funded from outside sources would likely be able to recoup those costs through um, their indirect rate that they charge outside funding sources. So we don't think they would see a large, um, you know, a large increase. Those who would be affected would be potentially those that are mostly general funded. Um, and then finally, option three, uh, which is to enroll county municipal electric accounts into 3C Choice, which is the default offering, um, but to also direct staff to return to the board during fiscal year 21-22 budget process um, with a budget expansion request to allocate some funds towards a renewable, renewable energy or battery projects at county-owned sites. So this would also um, you know, signal the county's commitment to clean energy. It would help us achieve some emission reductions. And it would also help us meet some of the goals that we set out in the strategic energy plan that you adopted, um, that your board adopted in 2019, including stimulating some local renewable energy development, increasing reliability at county-owned sites. Uh, General Services has several renewable energy and battery projects under consideration, and those, those projects require, would, would require funding. Um, Foster Road is one they're looking at, Emergency Operations Center. Uh, so there's, there's several potential projects that, that Skip can speak to if it, there's more information needed. 
And then finally, I just wanted to mention that you know this, this information is based on current rates. Um, rates are obviously subject to change. Uh, 3CE has discussed moving to a cost of service rate model where they really look at the cost associated with uh, serving each customer type. And so there could be some changes going forward associated with that. Um, it could benefit some customers. It may result in increased costs for others. But um, just wanted to make sure that uh, the board was aware of that. In closing, we ask that the board uh, receive and file this update on community choice energy and provide staff with direction regarding um, the following options. Option one being enroll county municipal electric accounts in 3C choice. Option two being enroll county municipal electric accounts in 3C prime. And option three being enroll county accounts in 3C choice and direct staff to return to the board during budget hearings. I have a lot of three C's, threes and C's in my <laughs> life right now. <laughs> You did a remarkable job of keeping them all straight. How many? How many times did I get it wrong? Did I? Did I? I don't know. I have. <laughs> yeah, I think I have it was three C Ren too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not even to talk about the California Conservation or Coastal Commission <laughs> or Conservation Corps. Um, thank you for that presentation. Any questions for staff? Supervisor Hartman. I just had a comment. Um, this can't go by unnoticed. This is a blue ribbon day. We have been working towards this day for at least four years. And to finally get to this point where our citizens, our residents can actually be enrolled at least now in January in North County, PG&E territory in uh, much cleaner energy, and if they want fully renew clean energy, that is extraordinary. So I just thank you to our sustainability staff and to our uh, all the county departments who've been working on this, and uh, to formerly Monterey Bay Clean Power, now Community Choice Central Coast Community Energy <laughs> Central Coast. Yeah, there's a lot of C's, um, but because uh, they've been extraordinary. We, we really had to look at very many different options and do analyses, and we finally landed with, uh, I think, the, the CCE that is the most uh, financially stable and highly rated, and, and so it's really a service to our residents, and I'm so glad that we're able to deliver it. 60% um, renewable by 25, 100% by 2030, um, and that's 15 years ahead of the state goals. Just want to emphasize what you've already said. It's, it's really extraordinary, and thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hartman. Well said. And I don't believe we have any public comments, so clearly the community is satisfied, too, and pleased that we have gotten to this place. Um, and no controversy. Amazing. Um, Supervisor? I can wait for public comment. There is none. So we're, we're to that point, so Supervisor Williams. <laughs> well, um, it's been an honor representing the board on um, the uh, 3CE uh, policy board, as well as the uh, executive board. And as I've, uh, I think, told you, there has been a quite uh, a revolution there this year in terms of trying to, uh, I think, really uh, substantively address the previous criticisms of community choice aggregation. Um, and so the, the conclusion is we, we want to stop you know, buying symbolic um, attributes and use that money more than anything else to um, uh, expand our renewable resources under contract, preferably under long-term contract, or um, you know, owned by uh, 3CE directly, which is another option. Um, so given that revolution, I, you know, I would be happy with um, uh, option two, but uh, because I still think it's, it's valuable, especially if we're able to um, reform what those, that money is used for in the long run. But, in the, but, but I think that staff could accomplish more GHG savings um, by option three. Um, which is to enroll in uh, 3C uh, choice and then uh, come back with a budget expansion request to use those monies and maybe a little bit more uh, for a, a uh, 
significant energy efficiency, renewable energy or battery project. Um, you know, uh, I still, you know, think that individuals um, should uh, enroll uh, in 3C Prime because I think we will make it more substantive over time. Um, uh, uh, you know, or follow our example and pocket the savings and, and put solar on your rooftop, um, you know, or a, a battery uh, in your garage. Would you like to make a motion? I'll make a motion well, for option three. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. And then you also have to come. I do. Although I'll, I'll wait for North County. Supervisors, well, Adam or Levanino? Yeah, I'm, I'm, so so what you're suggesting, okay, let me get this straight. So you're suggesting we pay more, so we, we enroll in Prime, or you're saying enroll in Choice and spend the money later? Yes. Okay, so really what we're Option talking three. about is spending money. Okay, but we're talking about spending money that we don't have necessarily. There's no real cost savings because... Um, it's just basically a cost avoidance is what we're talking about, not a cost savings. So I would feel better. Um, I, I don't understand why we wouldn't just do 3C choice. And then when budget time comes, if there's money to carve out of the budget for projects, that's great. But we can't say, well, we have $77,000 in the bank at budget time because we didn't spend money on this. I mean, otherwise, we could say, you know, the sheriff could come back and say, I want, um, you know, we were going to buy Mercedes Hummers for all of our de deputies, but we didn't. So now we have $3 million that we could spend on something else. So I don't really think that's a good budget practice. I kind of um, feel that's so what the I, sheriff I, does. I wouldn't be able to support that. <laughs> What's that? I kind of feel that's what the sheriff does. But, but that, I guess oh, well, that's that was probably the point. Um, I think you... I think we are agreeing, but I, I maybe I'm just not making it cl clear. Option three says that we'll come back during the budget process. Um, it's it's just I I think it deserves at least uh, some kind of commitment. Um, you know, I think honestly, I think there'd be a bunch of advocates here on a normal day. Um, uh, advocating that we do uh, 3C prime, um, but I'm just trying to convince all the environmental. I hear you, and to, to right, and as long as we're not making substantive, which is to to build a project. Okay, and as long as we're not committing to anything right now, so it does say option three is to return during the process with a budget expansion request. Um, I'm okay with that. Um, that puts us into 3C choice. And then if we do see savings, and we do see that in our budget picture, depending on what it looks like at budget time. So, I mean, that's a compromise I can live with. Uh, and I agree Mr. with- Mr. Chair. Oh, go ahead. Supervisor Adam. Yeah, I, I just think that you, this is so far outside our, 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 our scope of, of activity and, uh, uh, and I realize we're already down the road here and we're, we're choosing the plan, but I, I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Supervisor Adam. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, I will, I think I seconded it if we, I can't remember, but I option three I think is, I, I would support that. Uh, it's just giving us, uh, coming back at budget time with options, and I would have, at least at this point, a preference for battery projects to, to increase resilience, especially we've just been through the PSPS again, and I think um, I, I had the opportunity to listen in to the Econ, North County Econ Alliance Futures Forum, and uh, the speaker from Great Britain talked about the revolution that's occurring in storage and efficiency. So um, I'd like to have that specifically brought back, battery storage. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for those constructive comments. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? No. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? 
Aye. Motion passes four to one. Thank you. And that concludes item number five, which brings us to a break. Let's take a brief 10 minute break. Oh, no. Could I make one quick comment? Yes, please go uh, ahead. I just wanted to acknowledge Supervisor Williams, who's doing extraordinary service on, uh, on this executive board and has really influenced and shaped the policies according to what we like in Santa Barbara County. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Williams, for doing that extra work. All right, we'll take a break.
We'll reconvene the Board of Supervisors meeting for December 8th. And before we get to departmental item six, there was a leftover item, an announcement about a public forum covering enrollment in the Central Coast Community Energy, which was appropriate for the, the previous item. Um, and you can go to, where do you go to? Um, the Santa Barbara One Climate website. Santa Barbara County's One Climate website. Um, and or the Central Coast Community Energies Facebook page. And they'll have all the details about when this public forum is um, happening to learn more about how you can sign up for the Central Coast Community Energy Program and on what your choices are. Thank you, Supervisor Hartman, for sharing that. Um, which brings us to departmental item number six. Madam Clerk, would you please read that item into the record? Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number six is from the sheriff. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding the annual Truth Act report and community forum. Thank you. Um, sheriff Brown, I believe you are going to introduce this item. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Hart. I am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I uh, will present the item. I just wanted to, to start by uh, thanking the board, however, for the uh, Mercedes Humvees that you're going to be funding. Uh, uh, hey, thank you for maintaining your, your humor. And I just want you to know the deputies are going to love you for that. So. Um, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to be providing the information to you on our annual Truth Act Forum. Uh, as you know, beginning in January of 2018, the local government body of any county, city, or city and county in which a local law enforcement agency has provided ICE access to an individual during the last year is required to hold at least one community forum during the, the following year. Uh, a forum that is open to the public, that is in an accessible location, and with at least 30 days notice to provide information to the public about ICE's access to individuals and public comment. Can we have the next slide there, please? Thank you. Uh, there are three California uh, laws that um, uh, address the uh, immigration uh, status of inmates and the interaction between local law enforcement and federal authorities. The first is the Trust Act, uh, which was established on 2000, in 2013 by Governor Brown as AB4. Uh, went into effect uh, January the 1st of 2014. It prevents local law enforcement from detaining non-citizens pursuant to an immigration hold or a detainer beyond the time that they would have otherwise been released for criminal custody. Second was the Truth Act, which uh, came into, uh, into law uh, September the 28th of 2016, again, signed by Governor Brown. And that uh, Truth Act actually became effective January the 1st of 2017. Uh, it provides a know your rights information uh, requirement for undocumented immigrants that Immigration and Customs Enforcement wants to speak to uh, while they're in custody. It also requires that local law enforcement disclose ICE access to undocumented persons who are in local custody in four different ways. And then in many ways, the, the final uh, piece of legislation, uh, which is the uh, Values Act, uh, which came into being as uh, AB 54 and was signed into law, uh, really supersedes a, a number of those in some ways. Uh, at least in terms of procedurally. Um, you can go to the next slide. The, I wanna make it clear that um, pursuant to our policy, the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office does not conduct any immigration enforcement whatsoever. Our policy is a comprehensive document that directs the actions of custody deputies and records personnel as it relates to the compliance with the Truth Act. And our policy outlines what forms must be provided to inmates, under what circumstances, and how ICE may interview uh, inmates in our jail, and how ICE access 
uh, requests are to be handled under the law. ICE access refers to an inmate being uh, made available to ICE for the purpose of civil immigration enforcement, including when an individual is stopped with or without their consent, arrested, detained, or otherwise held under the control of the local law enforcement agency. And it includes all of the following. Number one, responding to an ICE hold, notification or transfer request. Number two, providing notification to ICE in advance of the public that an individual is being or will be released at a certain date and time through data sharing or otherwise. Uh, number three, providing ICE non-publicly available information regarding release dates, home addresses, or work addresses, whether through computer databases, jail logs, or otherwise. Number four, allowing ICE to interview an individual in the jail. Number five, providing ICE information regarding dates and times of probation or parole check-ins. Next slide, please. This next slide shows what the uh, ICE notification process is. Yeah, one more slide, if you could. The uh, process uh, begins when an individual is booked into jail. Following the booking of that person in jail, they are fingerprinted to confirm their identity and to ensure that the person does not have any active wants or warrants that we were previously not aware of. Those fingerprint checks are made through the Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice, and as a result of that, ICE uh, receives notification of those fingerprint checks following their electronic submission. If ICE is interested in obtaining information regarding a person in our custody, they will notify our custody bureau via uh, fax of the information that they are requesting. Custody record staff will manually research the inmate's criminal history and current charges to determine if there are any allowable exceptions that will allow us to share the person's release date with ICE. If there are noted exceptions that do allow that, custody records will distribute written notification to the inmate advising them that the, they qualify for information sharing in accordance with the TRUTH Act and that the inmate's record will be flagged into the jail management system. If there are no noted exceptions, then the request is filed in the inmate's record and no response is given to ICE uh, on the request. Once an inmate is sentenced or a release date is known, ICE is then notified via email. Uh, on 2000, from 2002, I'm sorry, from 2018 to 2019, you go to the next slide we saw an 8% increase in the number of requests from ICE from 414 to 448. However, we saw a dramatic decrease of 61% in the number of inmates that ICE uh, actually came to the jail for and rearrested in 2019. It was just 38 uh, inmates compared to 98 inmates uh, in the preceding year. And I think it's important to note that the total number of inmates who were picked up by ICE, the 38, that number constitutes less than 1% of the overall releases that occurred uh, in the jail during 2019. The next slide, actually the next two slides, show um, a list, and this is per the board's request last time, we only um, highlighted a few, and this time there were, there were only 38, so we were able to get all of them on two pages. This basically shows a list of the qualifying, uh, the current charges, qualifying charges, and so forth for the list of offenders um, and the dates that ICE uh, came and rearrested those offenders at the jail uh, in 2019. There were 38 such uh, arrests made, and the majority of those, uh, as you can see from the second column, the majority of those inmates were habitual offenders. Uh, three of them had been in our custody 
uh, our custody, the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office custody, over 20 different times. Uh, one of them had been in our custody 28 times, one of them 23, and one of them 21. Eight more of them had been in custody between 10 and 20 times. 12 were in our custody between five and 10 times, and eight were in our custody between three and five times. Uh, 22 of the 38 inmates were in custody for violent felonies, including spousal abuse, assault with a deadly weapon, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and lewd acts with a child. 13 of the inmates were in custody for other serious felonies, that included stalking, sales and possession of narcotics, gang participation, felony driving under the influence, felony evading arrest, and felony hit and run. And the remainder of the inmates were in our custody for other misdemeanor crimes that included misdemeanor spousal abuse and other types of battery. Uh, that that will conclude the presentation, but in summary and conclusion, I will, I will just again reiterate that 2019 saw a dramatic decline in the number of uh, inmates that were turned over to ICE uh, at the jail, and I suspect that we will see a, similar, uh, a similarly low number uh, in, 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 in the, in the, by the end of this calendar year as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Sheriff Brown. Are there questions for the sheriff? I've got one, Lavanino. Supervisor Lavanino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Sheriff, on the, if you can go back to that that list where you detailed out the 38 individuals and how many times they'd been through our system, I'm curious for those that you know 10 times or more. Um, so, so how does that how how can that even happen? I mean, so if somebody somebody commits a crime they're in there you contact ice let's say on the 14th time have they been deported and then they come back and then commit another crime and they come back in our jail or they just get released ice doesn't want them and they commit another crime and come back to our jail uh supervisor Lavignino to the chair um it's important to realize that we don't um we don't notify ice uh, of, of anything other than pursuant to their request on a particular individual. In other words, when that fingerprinting process occurs, those fingerprints are run through the federal system. The ICE organization and other federal agencies get notification that these people have been arrested and are in jail. They review the names, run the names, I'm sure, through their databases and make a determination as to whether or not they want to uh, pick up that person, whether that's for um, a criminal violation through ICE or whether it's through another, another agency. And they then send us what they call a detainer, and that's a little bit of a misnomer as a result of some, some court uh, decisions uh, with, with respect to the constitutionality of us holding someone on that or actually detaining someone on that beyond the uh, time that they're uh, in jail for the cr whatever criminal charges that are underlying and that they're here for locally. But they would make a notification to us that there's a person in custody that they would like to be notified of, of uh, if, when that person is released so that they can at least have the option of coming and picking that person up. And those those requests or those detainers as they as they in their parlance those detainers are reviewed and if they meet the criteria for sb 54 then we will uh, place them in their file we'll notify the inmate and then we'll make the notification but we don't make a notification since we're not running individual uh, people in the jail for their immigration status we don't make anything any type of, of uh, notification unilaterally, uh, you know, ourselves. It's, it's always a notification that is in response to um, an ICE request. So I guess my disconnect that I'm having is, you know, when I talk to a lot of people about this issue, 
Um, they're very concerned that there are individuals that are committing, you know, minor infractions or somehow committing a misdemeanor, uh, a nonviolent misdemeanor. They're ending up in our jail. They're being then deported. As opposed to when I read this report, it looks like that the 38 people that actually did eventually get picked up by ICE were, you know, folks that had significant charges with um, some of them, you know, violent um, charges against them. So how do you, I mean, is this something, how do you, how do you, how do, how do I learn how to figure out what, <laughs> what's the right story here? I, I understand wh where you're coming from. I think it's important to realize that, again, remember, we're talking about 2019. And even in 2019, which was pre the pre-COVID era, um, our jail was predominantly filled with people who had committed felony crimes and not misdemeanor crimes. So the notion that we're turning a lot of people over to ICE for minor violations is just not true because those people are not in our jail to begin with any longer. The reality is that we, we really incarcerate, uh, and it's gotten even, even, uh, even more pro pronounced in the, in the COVID era. If, if you look at our population, well, as of Monday, I believe it was, when, when I last looked at the numbers, 95% of the people who are in our jail are in for felony charges and only 5% for misdemeanor charges. And typically those ones that are in for misdemeanors are for very serious misdemeanors. So there are, there really are, nobody is in jail for petty theft alone. Nobody is in jail for possession of uh, marijuana. Nobody is in possession, uh, you know, f uh, uh, for minor type crimes that typically have uh, shoplifting and things that have been, uh, you know, mentioned in the past. And typically it's because uh, we are utilizing other means in the criminal justice system to ad adjudicate those particular crimes when they're brought to the attention of the system. And so it's just a, uh, a sign of the times, really, in terms of the, the level of uh, seriousness of someone who's in, in, our, in our jail. And again, remember, we're talking about these numbers being before COVID. As, I, as we look prospectively, currently and prospectively, we're going to see, no doubt, um, a, a continued boiling down of this population into a more serious jail population, if you will. Supervisor Williams. Well, I'd love to see that list again. And, and I guess the, one of the requests that I would have is, my understanding correct is that w the reason why it's these 38 and not 440 something or whatever is because they only showed up for these 38, is that correct? Because a detainer was requested, was requested for the other? Yeah, 108. Uh, you know, they, they gave us 448, is it what it's 448 requests. We went through those requests and uh, not, on this, not on this slide, but we determined that 108 of those requests met the criteria of the Values Act. Got it. Um, and so 108 of those 448 were placed into the file and we notified ICE when those people were scheduled to be released and they only actually picked up 38 of those 108. So, so my first request is just maybe to provide the same kind of list for all 108, um, just so that we know, you know which ones you're willing to you know, hand or notify ICE of. Um, uh, and then the other one is just so that people can see consistent information between you guys and the AG. What, what can we do to fix, or what can you do or request with the AG to fix the fact that the AG is publishing numbers that are inconsistent with the numbers that you just gave? I, I'm not familiar. Uh, uh, Supervisor, uh, with what you're saying is inconsistent. What numbers are you saying? Uh, well, they the isn't isn't the the typical amount um, published on on uh, their website. 
and their website said zero percent. Um, so uh, you talking about the state attorney general or yeah, the, the, the state attorney, attorney general. And isn't it their uh, website? There is a statewide uh, part of the. Uh, I think one of the elements of the legislation was to have a statewide um, uh, percentage published. So it, it may not be your fault, but I just wanted to get, try to get at the bottom of why. I'm, the, I'm at a loss to. Uh, I, I, I'm not aware of, of of any numbers that the the state has published, and. Typically, the state wouldn't get the numbers. Uh, you know, we get we we develop the numbers based on the number of ICE detainer requests that we get, which are sent directly to our agency. Uh, vet them, and then when those ones that are vetted are released, make those notifications. And then, as you see in this case, ICE ended up actually coming and arresting people in about a third of those cases. Are there other questions for the sheriff? All right, we'll go to public comment now and um, we'll close additional public commenters because I think we already have about 15 and you have three minutes to speak. Yes, Chair Hart and members of the board, thank you. We have 14 requests to speak on this item, and we are going to begin with Dylan Griffith to be followed by Claudia Lopez. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dylan Gravis. I'm a community member here in Santa Barbara. I've been a resident for the last six and a half years and would like to do so um, in the future moving forward. I am getting feedback. I'm trying to figure out why that is. We'll see how this goes. Um, okay, so uh, to the sheriff's office real quick, first off, um, to claim that we, quote, know it's true that the sheriff's office does not or that the Sheriff's Office does work that is progressive, innovative, responsive, and professional um, is an explicit erasure of every single black and brown voice, experience, livelihood, and humanity that has boldly shared their story. Community members are literally telling you that, that in that in their experience, that is not true. It's unacceptable that someone in a position of power, such as the Sheriff's Office, goes intentionally out of the way to not only uphold but evolve modes of white supremacy in doing so. You've refuted people's lived experiences. No one, especially not a white person, when it comes to experiences under violent systems of racism through modes of law enforcement, has the right to not only invalidate, but attempt to erase the realities of BIPOC members of our community. You do not own these lovely people. Your erasure of their reality is yet another example of how law enforcement actions do not reflect healthy relationships with many local community members, as you so claim. Last week, you not only refuted people's lived experiences, you refuted quantitative data that was published by your employer, the county, and partner law enforcement institutions themselves. And we got receipts on all that. On today's more specific topic, your actions here are yet again not aligned with your claimed values. Racism isn't only what a person or system says or does, it's also what is not said or done that is harmful and violent against our black and brown siblings. Deflecting responsibility or saying you didn't intentionally do something like hand off more people to ICE in uh, counties many times our size is a willful neglect and dismissal of your job duties. Please uphold your values by stopping all ICE notifications and transfers, stop separating people from their families, loved ones, and their community. We are playing catch up here in Santa Barbara County compared to so many other California counties. We should do more than just keep up with the pace of other counties. Why can't Santa Barbara County be a place that other counties try to model? Why can't we set the tone for what love, caring, freedom, safety, and healthy community looks like? Supervisors and the sheriff, I ask you to be courageous and lead with love. There's so much fear and danger in our community that love may seem impractical at times. I'm asking you to dismantle what you think is practical and ask yourself if this is what love looks like in practice. Is what we have in place a loving community? I stand in firm solidarity with community leaders at cause in demanding that the sheriff's office be transparent and accountable to the attorney general, as was mentioned by uh, Supervisor Williams, that has not been done. In addition, that transparency and accountability needs to be held within the community as well. 
Um, you should not require ICE notifications. You should not conflate notifications and transfers. You should not hold people longer to wait for ICE and not intentionally punish people twice because they are immigrants. Your active engagement with ICE decreases community safety, which is the antithesis of your very job. Please ask yourself if this is what love and compassion looks like in practice. Thank you. We will now go to Claudia Lopez to be followed by Barbara Parmet. Hello. Hi. My name is uh, Claudia Lopez. I'm here from Santa Barbara, South County. I'm calling in because I'm very concerned as other uh, community members are concerned. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, perfect. I'm concerned as other community members are concerned about, you know, hearing that Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office is working with ICE and separating families. I'm particularly concerned that we're in a global pandemic and that we've seen a lot of, um, I mean, what I've seen from the data, which is honestly not great. You know, we, we're not very great at, at collecting the numbers that we don't want to collect. But what we do know is that there is a lot of, um, a lot of infection in, in our carceral system. Um, and that we are often sentencing people to death by having them enter that carceral system. It's very concerning to me to hear that our, there are even 38 people who are being um, handed over to ICE. Um, I strongly believe that people are not the worst thing that they've ever done and that it is an indictment of our systems as a whole that there are people who are being reincarcerated 28 times without intervention from a social systems that could maybe help. Um, I've had a long history of working with different communities in our, within Santa Barbara County, um, specifically with people experiencing homelessness. And um, it, it, you'll hear my voice shaking, and that's because I've seen the way that our carceral system doesn't always and by doesn't always, I'm being kind by saying that to you. I'm being diplomatic. But our carceral system doesn't help a lot of people get to a better place. It keeps a lot of people down. It pushes them underwater when they are already there. Um, our communities are beautiful. Our communities, as the previous caller said, deserve love. Um, we deserve a just... We deserve a just community. We deserve just communities that have pathways forward that aren't incarceration, that aren't being given over to systems that are increasingly, increasingly um, uncomfortable to watch like ICE. Uh, I stand with cause as well um, in their asks, and I really do hope that you hear as supervisors. Um, a lot of the work that you have done over the last several years, I've, I've taken to heart. I've, I've seen how Santa Barbara is growing. Please continue that. Um, please continue in that direction. Um, as the previous caller said, let's be one of the model communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. We will now go to Barbara Parnett to be followed by Landon Rannick. I don't think we can hear you somehow.
Do we have somebody else in, online? Yes, Chair Hart, members of the board, my apologies for the delay. We are trying to get Barbara Parnett on the line. I believe we lost her in transition. All right, so we'll just go to the next person and the next catch up to her. Thank you. We will now go to Landon Rank to be followed by Frank Rodriguez. Go ahead, Landon. Hello, my name is Landon Rank, um, Sheriff Brown, members of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to, to speak today. Um, I was born and raised in Santa Barbara County. Um, I, uh, this is my home. I uh, currently live and work in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm also a member of a uh, faith community in Santa Barbara. I have been my whole life. Uh, I'm currently involved with the Interfaith Sanctuary Alliance of Santa Barbara as well, which is a group uh, working to stand in solidarity with our immigrant neighbors locally. Um, I do greatly appreciate the opportunity to keep uh, this particular issue in front of our community. Um, I'm grateful that we have these Truth Act forums. Um, I want to share that I, I have good friends and neighbors who are genuinely afraid of local law enforcement. Um, they're afraid of the repercussions that any sort of interaction with law enforcement could have because of potential connections with ICE. Um, and I think in a year like 2020, where we already see uh, greatly eroded trust with local law enforcement, I guess my question is why would we not take any opportunity and every step we can to try to regain, rebuild trust? Um, we need for law enforcement to be an effective system in our community. And if that's going to happen, there has to be uh, a better way to be able to build that trust with communities of color and community, immigrant communities locally. Um, we've seen precedent uh, for this um, in Los Angeles County. Uh, the, which is the state's largest jail system. Um, they've halted all transfers to ICE. Um, and we, as a county, can do that. We, we should be able to move forward with a more humane policy like that in a way that, that really would create more of a sense that our, our, our law enforcement is separate from ICE. This is not something that's the same thing. Um, and, and, and with that, I think regardless of a qualifying charge, individuals just shouldn't be punished twice just because they're immigrants. Um, this is a part of that erosion of trust. Um, and, and during the pandemic as well, I just want to keep pointing out that uh, any detention center transfers put us all at risk. Um, this is a way that COVID spreads. We've seen this happening um, in detention centers across the country, uh, even within our state in the Adelanto Detention Center. Um, um, uh, just outbreaks happen through some of these uh, movements of people groups. Um, I do want to, uh, I, I'm grateful to uh, Supervisor Williams for bringing up the point about the Attorney General uh, reporting. I don't know where the breakdown was, but at the end of the day, we, we have to see the, the correct numbers reported there. Um, I, I, we, we have to be able to have that transparency, again, to be able to have trust in our law enforcement system. Without that, we don't, um, we, we, we aren't currently able to trust that our law enforcement system is upholding their end of the bargain with, uh, with legislation like SB 54. Um, and, and, and I want to reiterate what I think an earlier a public commenter said about we don't want to see ICE notifications conflated with transfers. These should not be treated as um, required for every person. Um, and, and we don't want to see deputies uh, being allowed to wait uh, extra time for ICE. This is a part of SB 54 that, they're, that if ICE doesn't show up, that, that they need to, that the person should be allowed to let. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Rank. We will now go to Frank Rodriguez, and we were able to connect back with Barbara Parmet, who will be next. Go ahead, Frank. Thank you. Hello, Chair Hart and Board of Supervisors. Um, my name is Frank Rodriguez, here with Cause and 805 Immigrant Coalition. Um, as we're hearing today, 
we must take advantage of the current call for greater transparency and accountability on our local law enforcement that this legislative body has needed to become. Um, through the, the pushing of the Truth Act, um, after the Trust Act, as I was presented by the chair, um, the Truth Act is about creating a forum in which we have transparency and accountability and how our local law enforcement is working with ICE and separating families from here from our community. Um, as was co conversed last week, um, we need more opportunity to really um, be able to, to hold accountable our local law enforcement and how we know the disproportionate um, effect, um, um, effect that they, they have in really targeting um, people of color, especially black and brown community. And when we look at the immigrant um, um, criminal justice system as well, the same thing happens, um, that folks, especially communities of color, are the ones that are disproportionately affected and are disproportionately the ones that are being deported or sent to the detention centers. Um, I really want to elevate um, one of the prior callers calling um, for our carceral system to really help people become better people and not get stuck in a system that we see that continually um, 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 is working to, to separate our families. Um, so like many communities, uh, my, community, my family was separated when one of my uncles um, entered um, the county jail. Um, they had been a few years after high school, um, but they were picked up, they were put in county jail, and then soon after they were deported uh, back to Mexico. Uh, these effects of instances that are our local instances, we feel that we should be able to fix those here locally. Um, our community um, should be working um, to really create a system where we're a criminal justice system that's really being just and equitable with our community members. Um, we really applaud the, the Board of Supervisors pushing for these meetings and to push to really have more information. Um, thank you, um, Supervisor Williams, for elevating um, the need to really have a list of all 108 um, 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 folks that ICE was given the information um, by the sheriff, not just the 38 that were picked up, um, because I think there's a broad brush really trying to criminalize communities of color and immigrant communities. And what we're calling for is more, more humane conversation and a really just conversation where we have the actual data um, to really re be able to really talk about it. But of course, we got this data uh, because it's presented in the PowerPoint last Friday. Um, but it's for, for data that is from the year prior. So we're, of course, every year we wait to the end of the year to have this conversation of the year prior. Um, and we're, and if we don't continue pushing, it's going to be forgotten. And we're not going to talk about this probably to the, till the end of next year again. So really trying to emphasize, like, how do we ensure that we have more accountability when we're not getting all the information in terms of, um, um what, how folks are being Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. We will now go to Barbara Parmet to be followed by Heather Rose. Thank you, members of the board. My name is Barbara Parmet. And the discrepancy between reported ICE transfers, which was zero, and actual ICE transfers, which were 98, by the Sheriff's Department in 2018 and sent to the California Attorney General is unlawful and unacceptable. Why is it that Sheriff Brown conducted 98 transfers to ICE when San Francisco and L.A. counties refused to participate in ICE transfers? And why is Sheriff Brown out of step with Santa Clara, Humboldt, Contra Costa, and San Joaquin counties? The California Values Act, SB 54, prohibits sharing personal information with ICE Yet Sheriff Brown authorizes publication of release dates which tell ICE who is in custody and when they will be released. When I entered the name Jose, for example, in the release form, personal information on 32 inmates came up with race, occupation, and date of birth provided by the Sheriff's Department. This is prohibited by SB 54, which states the Sheriff's Department may not use their resources 
on behalf of federal immigration enforcement agencies. ICE is creating fear in our community with the assistance of Sheriff Bill Brown. How is ICE obtaining the addresses of formerly incarcerated immigrants who have paid their debt? When people are picked up off the street near their home a week after being released from jail, it makes our neighborhoods less safe and keeps our community terrorized. If Sheriff Bill Brown considers this fair, impartial, and humane treatment, then I pray he is removed from office as soon as possible. Thank you. We will now go to Heather Rose to be followed by Felicity Donald. Hello, board members. My name is Dr. Heather Rose, and I served as a full-time professor at Santa Barbara City College for 10 years. Many students shared their experiences with me, and I would like to highlight one. This young person earned the top scholarship at SBCC, is now working on a PhD. They told me of the day, they told me of the day during high school that their father left for work in the morning and never came home. It took days of frantic phone calls and lawyers to learn that this father of four had been snatched by ICE when he left his house that morning. For months, this family was left without his income and were paying for lawyers and four-hour drives to the facility where he was being held. This man was in the process of straightening out the last details of his paperwork to be here legally. Can you imagine what it was like for these children trying to focus on academics and sports and creating their own future, simultaneously dealing with this stress? The point of this anecdote is that ICE is incredibly detrimental to the health of our community. And while the above example may not have involved a person otherwise interacting with our legal system, equal rights and respect must be extended to those interacting with the sheriff's office. Sheriff's office. It is incumbent upon the sheriff's office and our law enforcement to cooperate with ICE as little as possible. An imperative that the Board of Supervisors use all diligence and dig deeply in ensuring that the Sheriff's Office is abiding by the Truth Act with absolute accountability and transparency, and ideally we would stop all communication with ICE. Specifically, the Sheriff's Office should not require ICE notifications for every person, should not conflate ICE notifications and transfers, should not allow deputies to wait extra time for ICE pickups if they're running late, Individuals should not be punished again and again because of their immigration status. Our focus must be on treating all immigrants, regardless of how they arrived here, and whether or not they've had reason to be involved in law enforcement with absolute compassion. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Rose. We will now go to Felicity Donald to be followed by Zulema Alamon. Hello, I am speaking today as a member of the community to demand the board take immediate action on this issue. Um, the Sheriff's Office is not providing transparency and accountability to the Attorney General. We need an oversight system for the Sheriff's Office in compliance with recently passed Assembly Bill 1185. It should be clear to the board by now that this is a priority of the community. The sheriff insists that the cost for this is too high and that the county is paying $950,000 settlements for excessive use of force by sheriff's deputies. We deserve better. The sheriff's office should not be requiring ICE notifications for every person and conflating these notifications and transfers. They should not be allowing deputies to wait extra time if ICE is running late, and individuals should not be punished twice because they are immigrants. In addition, the spread of COVID through detention transfers puts all of us at risk and is disproportionately affecting black immigrants and other immigrants and refugees of color. This is not an effective way to address or stop harm in our communities. ISIS practices have proven to be inhumane, often without public transparency and in violation of Fourth Amendment rights. We should not be affiliated with an organization that has separated children from their parents, sterilized women without their consent, and received nearly 5,000 reports of sexual abuse from children within their detention centers. 
Santa Barbara's relationship with ICE has undermined public trust and damaged relationships between the community and local government entities, most especially law enforcement. And I speak this from experience. The Hispanic communities in this county are terrified of law enforcement, as other people have pointed out, even when they are legal citizens. They should not have to sacrifice their own safety because they are afraid of deportation and losing their housing. Santa Barbara County must do more to protect our immigrant communities, especially as a county that depends upon undocumented workers for the food we eat and many of the services we deem essential. It's past time to treat them as such. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donald. We will now go to Zulema Alamon to be followed by Rebecca Garcia. Uh, dear Chair and members of the board, my name is Sulema Leman and I've had the pleasure to work with immigrant and farm working families in Santa Maria since 2018. I was inclined to speak today to urge you and the Sheriff Department to stop all ICE notifications and transfers and put an end to the painful separations of our communities and families in our county. When I was a year and a half old, my father was arrested. After serving time for the crime he committed, he was once again taken away from our family by being deported. My mom was left in the U.S. with two children under six and a newborn baby, as well as the sole provider and caretaker of my family. Three children under five years old were left without a father. Those were the first memories I had of my father. My father served his time for what he did, and instead of being allowed to rejoin his life with us, he was once again taken away from us. My family's story is not a unique one, and it's one that is unfortunately shared and feared by immigrant families. Incarceration is already a traumatizing experience for families, and deportation furthers those wounds. We cannot leave families without their parents, their siblings, and in most cases, their full provider. This is especially true during a pandemic that is disproportionately affecting Black, Indigenous, and people of color in our county, including our state and country. It is a well-known fact that ICE detention centers are a high-risk area to contract COVID-19 due to not being able to socially distance and lack medical attention. Additionally, many immigrants in our communities know of this collaboration, and since our county has not taken a strong stance on our collaboration with ICE, many victims of crimes will not come forward to receive the aid they need. This is not just reporting to the police, but going to the community resources, such as clinics, advocacy centers, and much more. We must protect our most vulnerable communities to have a safe community. Many counties in our state, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Santa Clara, Humboldt, Contra Costa, and San Joaquin, have ended this collaboration with ICE, ensuring families stay together and that our community is taken care of. We need to do better for our community. We need to take care of our people. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Olimon. We will now go to Rebecca Garcia to be followed by Victoria Green. Good afternoon, my name is Rebecca Garcia and I'm here with Cause, but more importantly, I'm here as a daughter, cousin, sobrina, and friend of immigrants. Along my community, I demand that the Sheriff Department and the Board of Supervisors stop all ICE not notifications and transfers and put an end to the painful separations of our communities and families in Santa Barbara County. When local law enforcement agencies work with ICE, the result is a two-tiered system of justice. There is no justice in punishing immigrants and their families twice. We already know incarceration harms individuals, families, and communities beyond just the people incarcerated. The shared cooperation with ICE makes this even worse by permanently separating immigrants from their loved ones who depend on that person as a parent, partner, or other provider. Like all people, an immigrant who is released from jail deserves to restart their life with their communities and families instead of being threatened with deportation. We must recognize the need for Santa Barbara County to move forward and follow the lead of many counties across the state that are protecting their immigrant residents. The supervisors and sheriffs of Los Angeles counties with the state 
largest jail system have already ceased any and all transfer to, to ICE. How long must Santa Barbara County wait to implement a more humane policy that protects our communities? We have a duty to each other to create a more equitable society. Right now, the collaboration between, between ICE and the Sheriff Department disproportionately affects brown and black people in our community. Just as the nation has proclaimed loud and clear, I echo my community in declaring that black lives matter. There is no need for any further collaboration between the Sheriff Department and ICE. I urge you to listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. We will now go to Victoria Green to be followed by Angel Lopez. Good afternoon, Supervisors. This is Victoria Green. I am the Chair of the Board of Directors of the Santa Barbara County Immigrant Legal Defense Center. We provide free legal representation for county residents in deportation proceedings and representation in bond hearings for detained people. We also provide community education around due process rights. All these activities are in furtherance of keeping Santa Barbara County families together. Today we ask that the sheriff discontinue procedures that facilitate transfers to ICE and provide meaningful transparency um, into the sheriff's department's ICE cooperation. We hope that your board will bring pressure to bear on the sheriff to make these changes. With respect to facilitating transfers, in addition to the transfers alleged to be in compliance with state law, the sheriff's practice of posting release dates online makes anyone who's been jailed, whether charged or not, no matter how minor or grave any possible offense, or their, even their immigration status, a target of ICE. On the South Coast, as another has noted, this has resulted in ICE apprehending people at their homes shortly after release from jail. We ask that this online, online posting cease. As to transparency, um, why aren't transfer numbers reported to the state attorney general as required by law? I appreciate um, Supervisor Williams asking the sheriff about that practice. Why hasn't the sheriff mentioned their practice of disclosing all release dates and ICE's use of that information? Is other personal information being shared? It sounds like from what we're hearing, people's personal addresses, their home addresses, or their place of work is being shared, and that is facilitating ICE um, detaining people. The sheriff's PowerPoint, um, as was noted earlier, doesn't identify how many of ICE transfers requests are being honored through the sheriff's provision of release dates back to ICE. We heard today that that number for 2019 was 108. Um, really, we need more transparency in this. Um, we need to know what's really happening and who, what, what information is being provided to ICE. Um, without that, we can't tell that the law is being complied with. In closing, we implore the sheriff to end their direct and indirect coordination with ICE and hope that future truth reports will provide true transparency. Let's support all community members with fairness and compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Unfortunately, we were unable to connect with Angel Lopez, so we will go to Benito Camarillo to be followed by Yesenia Bees. Hello, uh, hello, um, board of supervisors and members. My name is Benito. I'm with MICOP, M-I-C-O-P. Um, thank you for holding this, uh, hosting this forum. What I would like to say is that, um, first of all, 
how does uh, the sheriff ensure that the mistake of detainees and the mistake of population are fully understand of their rights, you know, their true uh, act rights and SB 54 rights. I'm wondering, you know, out of all these cases and charges, how do you, you know, as the board of supervisors, are you even aware of the cultural, are you culturally competency and also the jails and the uh, sheriff's department to, you know, appropriately work with the with these cases, you know, I'm wondering um, if they are provided proper interpretation, mistake or in interpretation. Um, and number two, it's obvious and it's clear that it's not working. You know, we have uh, when I saw the uh, stats, we see that they are being sent over to the jail so many times, it's clear that it's not working. Um, you know, transferring them over to ICE is not working, right? So I don't think that's a solution. Um, I agree with my uh, members over here commenting that we, have, we should have provide other resources to them to be part of, you know, to come back to the community and, you know, uh, work with them to be responsible members, you know, and not sending them over to ICE when it's not working. Uh, num number three, you know, we're in COVID time. I don't think this is, you know, any, any something right to do to anybody. This, this is their human basic rights. Uh, let the ICE do their job, you know, let them work and find other ways to do their job. The sheriff, you should stop sending people over to ICE. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camarillo. We will now go to Yesenia Bias to be followed by Joanna Barrera. Board of members of the board, my name is Yesenia Bea. I'm calling on the county board members and sheriff office to stop this collaboration with ICE. We as a county do not have to participate in this inhumane act. Being that I work with many undocumented young adults, I have witnessed the fear and desperation of my leaders when something like this happens to their family members. Family separation should not be allowed, and I'm sure you know this hurts our community. Why does the sheriff office require ICE notifications for every person? Why is it that it's allowed for deputies to wait extra time for if ICE is running late? Come on, Santa Barbara County, we are better than this. Let's think of our people. Let's not punish individuals twice just because they are undocumented. They are humans too. Allow Santa Barbara County to keep up with its other counties in California, like Los Angeles or San Francisco, who ended ICE transfers and who are already protecting our immigrants. Please consider this and stop collaboration with ICE. Enough is enough. Let's keep families together. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And unfortunately, we are unable to get a hold of Joanna, so that was our final speaker. Thank you for everyone who commented. Um, the matter is back to the board. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, yes, I have uh, a couple of things to say. Um, the first is I thought there was, uh, the thing that surprises me is what we were told about people uh, being taken in 28, 23, 21 time. But for 2019, at the end of 2020, uh, is really stale. And I think last time we did this, we asked, couldn't we get it earlier in the year? And we, we still are getting it quite late. I don't know if there could be quarterly reports or whether we could ask for the next 2020 report in March. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask the sheriff about that. And I, I would like to hear the sheriff respond, if he would, um, to the policies that other counties have adopted. Um, <clears throat> ICE has many discredited policies and actions now, um, and so I'd like to understand exactly what our obligation is and, and how you're thinking about that. 
And I, I still don't understand, and if anybody could explain the AG and what we're supposed to report to them and, and what, what our records show, I don't understand that discrepancy. So those are my requests. Sheriff Brown. Thank you, Chair Hart uh, and Chair Hartman. Um, first of all, with respect to um, the number of people arrested and booked uh, repeatedly into the jail, I would I would agree with you that that is at, at some point along the line a failure of the system. Um, and when someone's booked into uh, into jail more than twenty times, uh, there's obviously a major league problem there. Uh, but it, it is our system, flawed as it may be, uh, that, you know, we don't see. Um, we see alternatives. We see cases dismissed. We see cases plea bargained. And, um, you know, everyone who, who commits offenses multiple times, um, unfortunately, doesn't end up either being rehabilitated or being incarcerated uh, at, for lengthy periods of time in the state prison system. And it, it is, however, I think indicative of it, that many people have, and certainly it's not exclusive to the immigrant community, but many people who are in that position are um, suffering from uh, co-occurring uh, substance abuse disorders and uh, uh, that, that perhaps drive, drive crime. And I think some of the things that we've done as a society have exacerbated that problem. Uh, Proposition 47, for example, where there essentially is now no more incentive for um, an offender to voluntarily go through the drug court and to uh, receive uh, substance abuse counseling and treatment and to not um, and, and to, to, to do that in lieu of, 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 a, uh, of a sentence of some kind. The second point, as far as transparency, um, I, would, I would again argue that we're being very transparent with you. We're, we're, we're living up to the law's requirement, which is to have this hearing. We're giving you that information. Uh, we gave you the information in a summary form last year, and you asked for it to see all of the, all of the people that were turned over. We did that. You've asked this time to see all of the people who were asked. We were, um, we had, you know, we were asked 400 and some. You asked us to turn over the, the information on the 108 that we determined were actually qualified to be turned over under the Trust Act to, um, to ICE. And we can certainly get that information for you. But to the third point, it does require a significant amount of staff time because we do not have um, a system or adequate staff to to analyze data and to pull data. We have a new jail management system, which has a lot of capability, but as I've mentioned to you repeatedly uh, and requested of you repeatedly during budget cycles in, in years gone by, we do not have an adequate support staff to crunch that data. And I guarantee you that the data that you're seeing here required a significant amount of staff time to pull and to formulate and to put into these, uh, these, these charts. And um, again, it's, it's, it's something that begs um, you know, the question, why is it that we don't have the staff resources to be able to do it? We're the only, we're the largest uh, department in comparison to the others in the criminal justice system um, and, and other agencies in the system and other agencies like behavioral wellness and social services, they have entire uh, divisions or, or units that are devoted to crunching this data and coming up with this data. And we would certainly like to do that and certainly have asked for that repeatedly, but we haven't been able to, to, uh, to get there quite yet. Um, with respect to um, other counties, I can't speak for other counties sheriffs as to what their rationale is for, for not cooperating at all with ICE, if in fact that is what they're doing. And I'm not sure that that is a complete case in, in some of the counties that you mentioned. Um, all I can tell you is that my staff and I have discussed this. We have evaluated it. 
And we have tried to strike a balance by uh, operating within what the law allows. And there were competing interests that were uh, addressed when SB 54 was put into law. There was, on the one hand, uh, advocates who said there shouldn't be any uh, cooperation at the federal level with local law enforcement in terms of uh, in terms of this. And then there were other uh, members of our community who think we're doing far too little in terms of cooperating and turning, um, essentially identifying and turning over people who have uh, come into this country illegally and who have committed criminal offenses against Americans and other undocumented people as well and have gone to jail. And as you have seen on this list, many of these people are not debutantes. These are people who have a lengthy track record of offending in our community in a variety of different ways. And as I've pointed out a number of times before, they offend predominantly against other people of color. The, the people who are the victims of these crimes are almost exclusively members of uh, the immigrant community. And it is to protect them that we are trying to achieve the balance that we believe we have achieved by, by doing what we're allowed to do under state law, by recognizing that we are not um, turning over to ICE people who've been picked up for a shoplifting offense or for uh, you know, a very, very minor type crime. We're talking about people who have committed offenses that are serious enough that they have been incarcerated in our, in our jail, which these days means that they've committed something that's, that's relatively serious, if not uh, absolutely certainly serious. And the other thing, you know, our callers today, I, I understand and recognize the passion I understand and recognize and commend the advocacy for people who are less fortunate, for people who the vast majority of whom that come to our, our community and are undocumented who want better lives for themselves, better lives for their families. And we have uh, done what we can do, the best that we can do to try to, uh, to understand and to work with communities of color and to do the best job that we can do to protect and serve everyone in our community, including people who are undocumented. And as difficult as it may be for some to understand, we have to look at how many crimes are prevented by cooperating with ICE to the extent that we can legally and turning over offenders who have committed serious offenses. And, and sadly, we, as in many other counties, have had some tragic cases that have occurred. One in particular where a person who arguably should have been uh, removed from the community and was not, and ultimately committed a murder, a brutal murder um, of a woman in Santa Maria. So I, I think you have to look at this from two different vantage points, from two different perspectives and recognize that what we're trying to do is achieve a balance uh, between those, those, uh, those different viewpoints. Recognizing that our community, although we heard from 20 some people today, our community is, is not in complete agreement in, in what was said today. There are many people in our community who would, who would argue very strongly uh, that, that we're not actually doing enough. So I, I think we're trying to strike the, the, the middle ground here and do, uh, do the best we can to, um, to uh, keep our community safe. Supervisor Williams. Well, I, I, um, I mean, I, I think that, that trust shouldn't just be an acronym. It should be something that we are continually striving for and, and that um, both uh, the board and the and the and law enforcement have to do all that they can to make sure that we um, both institutions, one institution uh, together, that we have the public's trust. And so, first of all, I want to 
thank uh, the sheriff's department um, for you know um, the you know the three hundred and odd ones that they did not um, uh, uh, hold for ICE because that is that is progress uh, and that does show that you are uh, attempting to um, uh, look at the criteria and I suppose uh, you know um, uh, make judgment calls based on the criteria um, and and I, I want to appreciate that and I know that's a, a hard a tough thing to do and I actually uh, am I would not have trust in the system if 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 your numbers were were zero because I understand that there are um, you know, shot callers or folks that um, you think are a true danger to society um, that uh, that you want to use whatever legal means that you have to protect society with. But I do think that our numbers should be lower um, uh, in order to get that um, trust. And so I, I implore you, number one, uh, to use that uh, discrimination, uh, you know, as uh, as as wisely as you can. And number one, number two, to to be more transparent about it. I mean, I do think it's, it was kind of bad that the the info didn't come out. You know, when the first staff report came out. You know, I mean, it this information should be accessible for the public to be able to ask questions. Uh, and to uh, question whether whether you're making the right call. I mean, uh, uh, th that's that's their job is to is to make sure that um, you're making the right call, right? Um, so, uh, so I I think what you got to fix whatever is going at communications with uh, the attorney general because the attorney general oversees you in theory, and they're they're reporting that you have. Zero, right? Um, and and so the the oh, the um, that's a problem. Um, uh, and I think the accessibility of information for cause and any uh, and uh, you know uh, and the Immigrant Legal Defense Center and anyone else that wants that information, you know, it, they're the public. Uh, we do the public's business. That information should be accessible to the public. Supervisor Adam. I'm going to uh, defer to uh, Supervisor Lavanino and then I'd like to go next. Okay, Supervisor Lavanino. All right, thank you. All right, so, um, you know, looking at this and looking at the legislation, I believe um, this report why we have this report is is so that you know the sheriff can show us shed a little bit light of who's being turned over to ice who's being deported and the fact that the data shows that only 38 individuals were turned over shows that that while that that's a tool that's at the sheriff's disposal it's 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 not one that um is used that often. Now I understand that he asked for more than what what you know I showed up for, but the reality is I don't think there's enough focus on the public speakers or ourselves of let's talk about the 38 individuals. I mean, how did we get to this place where um and I didn't hear anybody publicly speaking that defended the 38 individuals. And I hope not, because when we say it's a failure of the system or it's a failure of this, somebody's got to take some personal accountability at some point. That If you found yourself in jail 25 times, 15 times, you've got a problem. And it's not the sheriff's problem, and it's not the board of supervisors problem. It's that individual's problem. And yes, there has to be resources to be able to help that person. But in my 10 years here at the county, I could rattle off a hundred programs that are available for people. Um, so, you know, I stand with all those people who come to this country and believe me, my district, I'm sure has more than almost anybody else's that come to this country to work hard, follow the rules, 
and partake of the American dream. And that is the vast, vast, vast majority of individuals. But I'm not going to defend a very, very slim, small minority that preys on their neighbors and instills fear in the community. And that's the 38 people that we're talking about today. So I appreciate um, the data. I would like to see it sooner. I think doing it at the end of the year is probably not the, the, the best setup. Um, but I don't want to get lost in everything that we're doing wrong, the sheriff's doing wrong, ICE is doing wrong. When you've got these people identified, the, the, the actual charge that they're under and how many times they've been arrested to me was a huge eye opener. And I will work and help anybody that says, you know, that brings me a case where somebody's being um, deported illegally or on a minor charge or um, that a family's being broken up. But I'm not going to stand and defend somebody that's been through our system 10 times that continually preys on their community um, and has multiple felonies and, and, and we're not supposed to contact ICE and send them back. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Supervisor Adam. Thank you. I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the sheriff and his whole department for his efforts to protect our citizens. I mean, I'm not going to ask the sheriff to put that list back up, but, you know, I noticed a couple things that I, I wrote down here. Lewd acts with a child, terrorism, DUIs. And it's not like those things don't happen here, but, uh, you know, you have some people that are not supposed to be here who are committing those acts, and if we can get those people off the streets uh, and, and, and get them out of the country, frankly, um, I think that's just good public policy and good safety uh, efforts by the Sheriff's Department and, and ICE. And uh, I, I, I think most people, most people in my district are happy that, uh, that those things are happening and, and, and feel like the Sheriff's providing a great service. And, and I think it's unreasonable for immigrants to think that they can violate the law, uh, uh, violently break the law here and not be deported. I think that's just common sense. So, uh, you know, I, I just, I've been listening to this for several years and, and at the end of my tenure, I guess I'm getting a little frustrated because, uh, you know, you hear from the people who want to protect and, and defend the indefensible. Um, you know, who, who thinks lewd acts with a child is, is okay? Come on. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the information that the sheriff provided today and look forward to the additional information that Supervisor William asked for. Um, I'm interested also in knowing if the department shares personal information like home or work addresses with ICE and if that extends you know, to all of the people that, that um, the um, immigration uh, su supervisor. Yes, is that Sheriff Brown? It, it is, and uh, I, I can tell you uh, the answer to that question right now instead of- Well, thank you, please answer that, that'd be great. Provide, uh, contrary to what was, was said by, by several people uh, that called in, uh, we do not provide home addresses uh, on our website. We do not provide home addresses or work addresses to, to ICE. Uh, that information is not relayed, and we don't provide any additional information to ICE other than what is on our website and is available to anyone in our community to see who is in jail, and which is a tool for victims and for other members of the community to be able to, uh, and, and, and the irony that I see in some ways is that we're being criticized and saying, said that we're not being transparent but that is a level of transparency to show our community who's in jail and the charge that they're in jail for and when they're scheduled to be released so that victims of crime can be aware of that. And um, the, the other, there were a couple of other points that were inaccurate that were brought up and I just wanted to be able to 
to let you know that, uh, you know, there were obviously uh, a, a number of talking points that, that, that the callers had. And I think in many respects, they are misinformed uh, about what's happening here as well. So, it, it, you know, we don't hold people beyond their release time for ICE if they're running late, if they're, uh, you know, if they're not there yet. Uh, people are, you know, they're, they're informed when that person is going to be released. And if ICE gets there prior to that release, then they, they can pick that person up as they're legally entitled to do but we don't hold them beyond the time that they are held for the criminal charge for which they are in our facility. Um, so, and again, I, we'll be happy to get you the information on the 108, was it, uh, additional, uh, you know, total people that the 38 derived from. But, uh, you know, we were very transparent about telling you that number today. Um, it gets to the point where you know, a PowerPoint would go on for hours if we started showing, you know, charts with all these numbers of people. If that information is desired by you, uh, we'll be happy to, to compile it and provide it. It is going to take staff time to do, as I mentioned, but we will do that. Um, and again, I think that uh, all of this boils down to, you know, this, uh, these false narratives that, that the sheriff's office is somehow not transparent. We're incredibly transparent about what we do. And this hearing is an example of that. And the information that's been provided is an example of that. And as I said, we'll be happy to do the follow-up. And then lastly, I think there's some misunderstanding about the attorney general and what kind of information has been provided or not provided. The attorney general has done an inspections process on immigration facilities that are in the state. Uh, we don't have any of those in our community. Perhaps that's what this is being, um, you know, misunderstood as. We we have an ICE facility in our county, but we don't have any private facilities that hold people for ICE or that are up uh, on immigration charges. And perhaps that's what it is because I, we're, my staff and I are just mystified as to what it is that we are being accused of, of not reporting to the Attorney General or having uh, numbers that are in conflict with that. So uh, I would be happy to, to get that information from Supervisor Williams and from anyone else that would like to provide it. But I, I think that there's a chance that some other things are maybe being conflated here. Well, I think this underscores the value of these hearings and the reason for them in the state law is to provide more transparency and more opportunity for people to understand, you know, how the process works and what's, what's involved. So appreciate, you know, you providing this information, anything you can do to shorten the time lag between the end of the year when the numbers are summarized and the report that happens at the end of the year you know, a whole year later would be valuable. And, you know, I'd, I'd recommend that you sit down with folks who are in the um, immigrants' rights community and have conversations about these things because there was a tremendous amount of misinformation in the hearing today that now has been cleared up and will additional information that will come forward that will, will answer more questions. And the more information people have, the better their understanding of, of all the parts of this system and how they work together. So encourage that to happen. And, and thank you for your report today. Thank you for all the people who participated in the hearing today. Um, I don't believe there are any other comments from board members. If that is the case, then um, that would conclude this item. Um, and it concludes our day. So we are now adjourned to Tuesday, excuse me, Madam Clerk. Chair Hart, members of the board, if we can get a motion to approve staff recommendations oh, right. A you. through C on departmental item number six. So thank you moved. very much. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. And seconded. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adam? Aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. So now we are adjourned to December 15th, 2020. Thank you very much.